meeting, uh, its regularly scheduled meeting of June 7, 2018 is now in session. We would respectfully ask everyone in the audience to come to order, come to a quiet so the board can begin its proceedings. Additionally, we would respectfully ask everyone to silence your cell phones, silence your tablets, silence yourselves. As all of the people have uh, hearings before the board today, they get one bite at the apple. The board needs to hear what everybody has to say. So it's very respectful if you would in fact keep your electronics silent so that their presentations will not be interrupted. Thank you in advance for your help with that matter. For each of today's public hearings, the board will review correspondence that's been submitted both in support of and opposition to each of the cases. Additionally, the board will review correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies and even elected officials in some instances. In today's hearings, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record for each of these cases. At the conclusion of the staff's presentation, the appellant will have the opportunity to present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, anyone wishing to speak in support of the case at issue will have the opportunity to come forward and do so. For cases that have opposition, the completion of the appellant's presentation and others who have spoken in support uh, will then lead to the opponents having an opportunity to come up and speak as well. After the opponent closes out their presentation or presentations, the appellant would then have a period of time to come back and provide rebuttal testimony based upon what's been said in opposition. Under the Board of Zoning Appeals rules, an appellant has five minutes to make the desired presentation to the BZA if there is, in fact, no opposition. For contested cases, each side would have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Please note that each side will have 10 minutes. Not every warm body in the room will have 10 minutes. Otherwise, we would close out this meeting sometime in November. Should the appellant wish to provide some rebuttal testimony to any opposition that they've heard, then the appellant should reserve some portion of the originally allocated 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each of the hearings, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case before them. The board is vested with the power to do so under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17.40.180. All of the section numbers to which we refer today come from the Metro Zoning Code. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and took effect on January the 1st of 1998 with a significant number of amendments since then. I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record for each of the cases. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings, and this is important for our audience. Because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro Channel 3, it is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board come to the front of the, mo come to the, front of the room, sit at one of the microphones, introduce yourself by name and address, and then make the desired presentation. Nothing said other than in that scenario will be part of the record, will be part of the board's consideration, and would also be considered inappropriate. So we thank you in advance for your cooperation. If you wish to speak on the case you're here about today, you'll need to come forward and sit at the microphone to do so. The Metro Code requires four of our seven board members in order to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four, at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. Any case that fails to obtain four votes, or rather in the event that five or more members are present, which is the case today, and uh, the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, then that case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. This person went to the Metro Zoning Code. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing will be deemed denied by operation of law. First went to board rules, an aggrieved party may file an appeal to any decision by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Such an appeal would be filed by a writ of certiorari to the Chancery Court and within a 60-day window of the original hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party in limited circumstances may file a motion for rehearing within 60 days of that original hearing date, pursuant to the terms of the BZA Rules of Procedure. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit that's at issue, and you must do so within two years in order for the board's approval to remain valid. After that two-year window closes, you're at square one and have to start all over again. It should be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval or other board action could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BCA. With that, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I have three preliminary announcements before discussing a consent agenda. First, case number 2018-274 has been withdrawn by the appellant and thus will not be heard. Again, 274 withdrawn. Case 2018-221 has been deferred by the appellant. This is the property at 3304 Dickerson Pike. It will be heard at a later date. Again, that's case 221 deferred, will not be heard today. 
And finally, case number 2018-147 is a subject for a motion to defer that will be presented to the board here at the outset of the meeting in just a moment. Uh, again, 147, there is a request to defer. Now, our board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to today's hearings and identifies those cases for the Michael, appellants. Yes. Before we start with our consent agenda, I sure. want to start this meeting welcoming everyone back to the Sunny West Room. It's been a while yes. since we've been here. Uh, democracy has been at work in Nashville a lot lately. We've had lots of elections and early voting and we're always grateful to our friends at the um, Metro Nashville Public Schools for allowing us to use their space and the folks at the uh, Fulton Complex next door. Uh, but I wanted to talk, at, talk about, to congratulate two great Nashville public servants. And the first is our very own Bill Herbert, who was appointed by Mayor Briley to be our new head of codes. Um, we have had two zoning administrators in Metro Nashville government history. The first is Sonny West, who this room is named after. And the second, of course, has been Bill Herbert. We thought you'd last a little bit longer, but we want you to, uh, you'll be going upstairs and being the uh, codes administrator of It City or Crane City, I'm sure is even busier than being zone administrator. So you um, have given us good confidence. Even when we overturn your rulings, we've appreciated your work and um, guidance during this period of time and big shoes to fill and anything to add, Mr. Zoning Administrator. I guess you're here because we haven't hired someone yet, so. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. That was very moving. Um, did not anticipate that. Uh, caught me off guard. Um, thank you very much. Really appreciate everything. Yeah. And the second public servant I'd like to congratulate is Mayor Briley. Um, our mayor, of course, won the election uh, recently, and um, he is going to serve until the next election, which is next August. And so we congratulate him and uh, his guidance during a uh, transitional time of history of Metro government. And he has been a good steady hand for our city. And, um, and I know it's now in the middle of a budget, but uh, we appreciate his service to the city. It's actually his whole family's service and not just the elected officials. There's many people in the Briley family who have served the city well um, for many, many decades. So uh, I wanted to say that before we got started. Thanks, John Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As noted, our board utilizes a consent agenda wherein one of our board members reviews each of the cases that will be presented today and determines if there are any such cases where the appellants have met the criteria for their requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that the testimony in that case would not in fact alter the material facts, then the case is recommended for our consent agenda and thus for board approval. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended from today's docket and if anyone is here in opposition to any of the cases identified for the consent agenda, simply raise your hand and make sure we find you. The case will be removed from consent agenda and then just heard in its regular order. Board, if you'll bear with us, I believe there are a couple of late additions, maybe uh, 10 or 12 on the consent agenda for today. The first is case 2018-223, involving the property at 981 Murfreesboro Pike. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements. The parties have agreed to uh, comply with the planning department's recommendations for that case, so the case has been recommended for consent agenda. Anyone here in opposition to case number 223? Seeing none, the next case recommended is case 2018-225. The property at 6391 Pettis Road is the property in question. The request is for a special exception in an agriculturally zoned district to operate a kennel. Mr. Chairman, we would note here that representatives for the appellants have met with the council member and the neighbors as part of the requirements for a special exception case, and the groups have arrived at a list of specifically identified terms to be included with that approval. With those terms as part of the approval, this case has been recommended for consent agenda also. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 225? As a result, that case will be heard in its regular order. The next case from consent agenda is case number 2018-235. That case involves a property at 2304 Mary Street. There's a request for a variance from sidewalk requirements for a project that has received Barnes Fund uh, dollars from the Metropolitan Government. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 235? Seeing none, the next case recommended is 2018-245. 
that involves the property at 1128 Third Avenue South, a sidewalk variance request in the MUNA zoning district. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 245? Seeing none. The next case on the agenda is 20, or next case on the consent agenda as proposed is 2018-258. That case involves the property at 1215 McGavick Pike, a variance for maximum footprint for an accessory structure. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 258? Seeing none, the next case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-265, involving the property at 5765 Old Hickory Boulevard out in the Hermitage community. The parties have agreed, the appellant has agreed to meet with the planning, rec, uh, planning department's recommendations for this case. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 265? Seeing none, the next case identified for the proposed consent agenda is 2018-270, involving the property at 300 East Webster Street. East Webster Street. Is there any uh, request for a sidewalk variance? Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 270? Seeing none, that case also will be on the consent agenda. The next item identified for consent is 2018-279, involving the property at 877 West Hillwood Drive. It's a special exception request uh, for construction of a religious institution on an R-Zone property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 279? Seeing none. The next case identified for consent agenda is the very last item on your docket, case number 2018-282, involving the property at 1010 Gilmore Avenue in Council District 17. The request is for a variance from lot size requirements of less than 3% in this instance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 282? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, we have two items that were added a little bit late for the consent agenda based upon the party's decision to agree with the terms put forth by the planning department on their sidewalk variance cases. The first of which is case 2018-230. The property at issue is 4019 Maxwell Road in Council District 33. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 230? Seeing none, that item will be on consent agenda. And the last item, that was swept onto consent agenda at the last moment with the appellant having agreed to follow the uh, terms put forth by the planning department is case 2018-242 involving the property at 7 Garden Street in Council District 17. Again, a sidewalk variance. The appellant has agreed to meet the terms required by the planning department. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 242? Yeah. One in opposition. That case will be heard in its regular order. With that, Mr. Chairman, the proposed consent agenda, as whittled, will include cases 223, 235, 245, 258, 265, 270, 279, 282, and then the late added 230. With that, we would solicit a motion and vote from the board. Okay, those cases have been uh, properly moved to the, uh, from the consent agenda. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? John Michael, we have the volume. Does that help if you hit the green button? We'll work on that technical issue at the first break, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Apologies. We'll try our best to speak loudly. Okay. With that passage of the consent agenda, for all the members in the audience whose case was on the consent agenda, you're done. Uh, the case will not be heard. You have received the approval that you sought. You can see the codes department staff as early as Monday of next week in order to obtain or pursue the permit that you seek through this appeal. Uh, if you went over right now, they have no idea that you just got approved, so it's not going to help you any. We'll see you as early as Monday. Uh, for those who are here on cases that were not approved on consent agenda, were not deferred, and were not withdrawn, we'll take up those cases in just a moment. Before then, we like to use this opportunity at the outset of the meetings to recognize the elected officials who have joined us for today's meeting. I saw at least three council members here at the outset, and we'll want to recognize them now. Council Member Mina Johnson from Council District 23 is with us. Council Member Johnson. Now, Council A. Johnson, I think we have the, is this the largest, the longest Board of Zoning Appeals agenda in the history of Board of Zoning? So I know you all met till almost midnight. Hopefully we won't be here that long. 
Yes. Councilor Johnson, welcome to BCA. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm Mina Johnson, representing District 23. And thank you for the consent agenda. One of the special exception charge was on consent agenda. And I would like to state our community had met and the church uh, represented a great plan and follow every single condition. Uh, not only that, they also agreed to meet with the community before the construction and try to preserve mature trees and install uh, area appropriate landscaping. So community are very happy with that, uh, uh, your grant of the special exception. And today I am speaking on a case uh, 220, uh, which is a sidewalks variance. So this property is located in the corner of Brook Hollow Road and Robin Hill. So which is I'm sorry, Councilor Lady. I don't think we have a number 220. 280. 280, okay. Yes. 280. So Please continue. Yes. So that's the sidewalks. So uh, because of the newly uh, adopted uh, sidewalk regulation, uh, you uh, have been hearing lots of sidewalk variance requests. And when I sponsored this uh, sidewalks ordinance was our intent, or well, my intent was to ask uh, the uh, development community to contribute so we can accelerate sidewalks. But at the same time, uh, I was very, very careful not to punish regular homeowner because sometimes, especially in my neighborhood, uh, Hillwood, uh, Westmead, you know, that area, we do have old ranch style house and homeowner would love to stay in the area because we have lovely, you know, mature trees and uh, great location. So oftentimes uh, they do a renovation and addition. And sometimes they do like a total, uh, you know, demolish and then rebuild. So in this case, that's the case. Because uh, this homeowner uh, particularly uh, purchasing the old rundown house and try to rebuild uh, in that corner. And Brook Hollow happened to be Collector Street. That's why they are asked to either build sidewalks or contribute in the sidewalks in lieu of fee. And if this location is, uh, say, closer to a center, such as across from the Nashville West, or closer to a bus station uh, adjacent to, uh, will, be, will make sense to ask for in lieu of fee However, if you imagine my district, it's pretty much neighborhood. Uh, all the you know, houses uh, pre average one acre, some are plus. So for that uh, person to require to pay for the sidewalks, I believe it's about $170 per linear foot. And in this case, uh, this property owner might be required to build at least a minimum of 500 feet of sidewalks. That will add up to 85,000. And yes, that would be great, you know, if they can have spare 85,000 sitting on there somewhere, but a typical homeowner would not have that kind of money. So it would be, you know, well spent if that homeowner can uh, spend that money to build new house rather than contributing sidewalks. That will enhance our neighborhood. And not only that, um, this collector street in my district, uh, you know, first time uh, we became a council member, each council member had sidewalk uh, funding. So my first sidewalk is uh, Davidson Road connecting Hillwood High School to Harding Pike. So students will not have to walk on the ditch. That was three years ago. I'm still waiting for that sidewalk to be constructed. And finally, I believe this fall, first construction will start. For that pace, Brook Hollow, Yes, it is a collector street, but this space and this current uh, finance in the metro's condition, 
Brick Hollow will not see sidewalk at least 10 years if it's not 15 years. So, you know, asking homeowners to contribute to the in lieu of fee, I think under these circumstances may not be uh, fair and may not benefit the community either. So for that, I would like to ask you to grant uh, applicant appeal. And any questions I'm happy for to ask any questions. Johnson? Okay, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by the Council Member from District 6, Mr. Brett Withers. Councilman Withers. Very well. He'll be here with us for his various cases. We're also joined by the Council Member from District 16 in Boom and Woodbine, Council Member Mike Freeman. Councilman, wish to address the board? Very well. With that, we've concluded all presentations from Council Members. And Mr. Chairman, absent any other announcements from the board or on behalf of the board, we'll proceed with our first hearing. Let's go. Mr. Chairman, at the outset, we have a motion to defer. This is for case number 147. Council is present on behalf of the appellant, Ms. Eldridge. You have heard this case previously, originally on uh, May the 10th, 2018, at one of our meetings that took place over at the Metro School Board. Then the meeting, uh, the matter was back before you at our most recent May 17 meeting, wherein the matter was deferred. Some discussion was had with regard to the provisions of a 30-day window from the original hearing date to a final decision date. Uh, legal gave you good counsel on how best to manage that situation so you could be here today. This is a case, of course, as counsel will confirm, that still has an open piece of environmental court litigation, as the judge is still trying to find the appropriate date to pin for their specially set hearing. That's not counsel's fault or Metro's fault. That's just a matter of a referee trying to get something scheduled, as is often the case with our environmental court cases that have to be specially set. Toward that end, uh, counsel is here to seek, with his motion to defer, uh, another date for this particular case. It should be noted on behalf of staff, we don't oppose that. Just because there have been considerable wranglings with regard to this case and the various settings, we thought it was most appropriate to bring an actual motion to the board. With that, I'll hand over the microphone to Mr. McMullen on behalf of the appellant. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Austin McMullen, 1600 Division Street, on behalf of Mrs. Eldridge. Uh, we're asking the board to defer this matter to its next meeting. Um, the reason for that is that the permit that we are seeking was actually granted uh, under the new state law uh, back in late May. And, um, and so that, we thought, would resolve this appeal. Uh, however, I have been in contact with Metro Legal, and I understand from Metro Legal there may be some further consideration of whether that permit should have been granted under the new law. And so they may rescind the decision that they just made and take it back away from us. And if that were the case, then we would want to continue with our appeal. And in addition, as Mr. Michael said, there's also the pending legal uh, proceeding. And so we're just asking to continue this to your next meeting. Okay. I'll make Thank you. Deferred one meeting. Okay. There's been a motion to defer at one meeting. Is there a second? Could you consider just deferring it indefinitely for them to I'll, I'll change that motion to defer indefinitely until uh, so if, if it, you need another two weeks, you can just work with uh, John. Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Just, I would just need to discuss with Mr. Michael as far as when, if we needed to get back on the that agenda. Mean, that means if you want to come on next, come into in the next meeting, that's you fine. Talk to but them. if you need okay. to go later, that's fine too. You don't have to come back. Sure. Thank Motion's you. Motion's been made and I'll second. seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, it's in de deferred indefinitely. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, at the top of our printed docket is case number 2018-217. The public hearing is closed on this matter and will not be presented again today unless the board chooses to reopen the matter. However, the property at question was 1912 Truett Avenue in East Nashville, Council District Number 6. Um, you may recall this was both a rear setback uh, variance request as well as a sidewalk variance request on a corner lot at Truett and 20th. I'm just refreshing by running through the slides real quick for the benefit of the board. Because the board failed to obtain four votes with regard to a final vote on the sidewalk matter, this stayed open to today's date. The board will have the opportunity to cast a new vote based upon a new motion today. Board members who were not present at the May 17th meeting will have the opportunity to confirm whether or not they did review the case file and the video. If not, that's fine. If so, that's fine. Either way, only those who heard the case on May 17th are eligible to participate in the vote unless they have watched the video and reviewed the file since then. Mr. Chairman. John Michael, 
We had a motion where we approved the setback, is that correct? I believe that's correct. And then what's left for us is the uh, variance from the sidewalk. That's and correct. The motion was to grant the variance on 20th Street, but not on the short end, right? That's um, my best recollection, but that was the motion that actually the, failed. The, so the board yeah, gets to make a fresh motion. There was motion a motion to, to grant the variance on 20th Street, but not Truett, so that they would have to pay for the short side Truett. Right. And it was three to one, I think, okay. with the vote, right? So it's time to find out who reviewed. Ms. Sanford, I believe, was the one member of our board who is not present at the May 17 meeting who is present today. Uh, Ms. Sanford, I do not think you've had a chance to review this, but by any chance, have you had a chance to review this specific case? No. Therefore, as a result, Mr. Harper, Mr. Ewing, Mr. Taylor, Ms. Chapel, and Ms. Karpenek will be the five members eligible to vote on the matter today. But there were only four of us that were there for that hearing. Oh, five of Okay. Yeah, it was a three and with that, vote. the voting members on this here, uh, matter today will be Mr. Harper, Ms. Carpenter, Mr. Ewing, and Mr. Taylor. Okay. Do we have a motion? I mean, I, I'll move again that motion again just to see where it goes that the uh, that we grant a sidewalk variance on 20th, uh, but not on Truett. That the applicant can pay the lieu fee on Truett. Okay. The motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the I voted no. Oh, you voted no. Sorry, I didn't see the hands. As a result, unless there is a different motion. Okay. Um, the whole thing? Unless there's a different motion. Default is the whole thing. So, th so this is locked up in third. This one won't come back for the next hearing. Next. Is there another motion? Okay, John Michael. Uh, with no motion receiving four affirmative votes, uh, the matter will not be passed today, and because our next board meeting is not until the 21st, which will be after the 30-day window, the motion on that 30th, or rather the case on that 30th day will be deemed denied by operation of law, specifically with regard to the sidewalk variance that was sought. However, as noted by the chairman, the variance with regard to the rear setback was previously granted. With that, we'll go back to the top of the presentation in the next case on our regularly scheduled docket, which is case number 2018-113. Mr. Chairman, that involves the property at uh, 620 Huntington Ridge Drive in Council District Number 27. The request is an item A appeal having to do with the denial of a short-term rental permit based upon prior operation preceding the issuance of the permit. The appellant is William Massey. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 113? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Sir, please introduce yourself by name and address, and then you'll have five minutes to address the board. My name is William Massey at 620 Huntington Ridge Drive in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I applied for this permit, began the application process in November uh, of last year. November 9th is when I began. Uh, November 22nd is when I was approved. Um, excuse me. Um, so there must have been something that happened before you were approved. So tell so, us about that. So I am, Mr. A, Chairman. All apologies and apologies to Mr. Massey. I know you typically hear from staff first with yes. regard to short-term rental cases. With that, I believe Mr. Osborne is in a position to speak to this one. Apologies. We'll not tax any of the time against Mr. Massey and allow him to restart. Okay, Mr. Osborne, tell us why we're here. I imagine this is from the host compliance magical software that assists us and. Actually, it's not. It's not? Wow. No, sir. Okay. As you stated, the, he did apply for the permit on uh, November 22nd of 2017. We received a complaint about him operating without a permit uh, on January 25th of 2018, at which point the property was flagged. Um, there were about 27 reviews for the property at that time, and on that same day, he appealed um, the uh, denial of his permit. Um, the advertisement was removed on the 26th of February. And then, as far so, as I know, it stayed down. Okay, so we have a law that says if you want to operate a short term rental, you have to get a permit. Apparently, you did this 27 times before having a permit. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. Um, 
as I applied for the permit, the, the reason I started a short-term rental is because I actually lost my job in late October. I'm a first-time homeowner here in Nashville. I'm coming up on five years, and uh, I was looking for a way to, to keep my home. And, um, but there's a I, way to keep your home and legally get a permit. So I, when I applied for the permit, I assumed that it was a... Uh, uh, incorrectly, there was a formality that would take about a week um, after I got and approved. what led you to believe that? A week? Well, I'm just getting approved. Um, but after I got approved, I needed the fire marshal's um, approval all, as well. you're not approved until the fire marshal signs on it. Of course, my apologies. Um, I, I got her out within a few weeks. She told me I had the incorrect fire alarms. Um, looking into them. I found them on Amazon. They were back ordered. It took about a month for them to come in. I had her back out uh, in early January, um, and she told me that I needed one more. So again, I ordered that, um, and I think she approved me on the 28th. I understand that I was operating without a permit. Um, I was simply thinking about trying to keep my home and, and, and keep my family um, happy without having to put it on the market. I, I'd owned it for about a year. Um, I stepped a little bit outside of my uh, budget um, after losing the position, and I've been doing everything I can to keep it. Uh, my mother, I haven't borrowed money from my parents uh, since I was 18. My mother's given me a personal loan uh, to cover my mortgage. Um, I'm out working and trying to find work um, that can allow me to keep it. I, I understand your decision um, does not rest on this, but I ask you to take it into consideration that um, I think that, that I'm the type of person that a short-term rental is is geared towards somebody that welcomes a few people into their into their home and, and wants them to uh, enjoy their stay in this wonderful town. Um, and we've worked very hard to keep our guests happy. Again, I know that we had 27 uh, visitors in those three months. Um, and uh, I, I should have been more diligent and not have operated until I got the, the proper permit. Okay, questions for the applicant board members. This is your personal home? Yes, sir. And you stay there when, people, when your guests are there, or do you leave? Yes, sir. Any other questions? So why did you, op I mean, you said you, were, you needed the money, but you knew that there were laws. Absolutely, I did. Um, and in all honesty, I, I was getting close to having to um, you know, leave or foreclose. Um, and I was looking for an option while I was looking for work. I've started driving for Uber and Lyft in the meantime. I've applied for over a dozen positions I've gotten interviews for. So far, I haven't gotten anything. Uh, and I'm, uh, this additional income of anywhere from twelve to $1,500 a month is, is helping me keep afloat until I, can, uh, until I can find another position. Okay, anything else? We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. So let's get started because we have many short-term rental cases on our docket. As the author of the short-term rental ordinance, Councilor Berkeley Allen points out to me on many occasions, this law has been on the books for a while. It's been heavily reported in the newspaper. People should know about it. Um, this applicant says they did know about it, but they needed the money for to keep their house. So. As we know, because of his violation of the short-term ordinance, the city suspended his ability to operate for a year. And now we're considering to possibly lessen that punishment of a year. So, board members, what do you think? Sir, can I say one more no, thing? No, the public hearing is closed. Oh, apology. Does anyone have a motion? Um, yeah, you know, it, it's very empathetic that the, the single family, um, I get, and I, I get it. Um, but the one thing that we've done in, in thinking about is it a, a minor, medium, or severe case is kind of, um, respect for the rules, and I think this definitely is in that medium case um, because of the knowledge, and, and I'm, I'm empathetic, I understand the circumstances, 
but I think just based on uh, on the past rulings, I would make a motion that the zoning administrator did not err, and that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit uh, six months from the last rental, which was 226, February 26. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? second motion's been made and properly second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously, John Michael. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, during technical difficulties, we may need to take a five minute break. I apologize for that before we move into the next case, which will be case 2018-204 and 2018-205, okay. which we'll hear together and then vote upon separately. Very good, bye. Do we have 147? Oh, yay. Praise Jesus. Twenty eighteen dash two oh four. As I'll remind the board, cases two oh four and two oh five are the same parcel, HPR development. They are divided as two cases, so I'll present those as one case and just take separate votes on cases two oh four and two oh five after the collective presentation. The appellant will come forward at this time, staff will make its presentation. All right, Mr. Chairman, as noted, the property at issue here for cases 204 and 205 is 816 A and B Benton Avenue in Council District Number 17, like seemingly everything else these days. The aerial photograph shows the site of the previous residence. It was demolished in preparation for the new construction. The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout of those residential structures along Benton Avenue, consistent with a lot of the development we see in this particular area, uh, in between, I guess, south of Wedgwood and west of 8th. From my recent site visit, the current condition of the property there from the face, the view, and this is noteworthy as the requests are for sidewalk variances, the view of the existing sidewalk shows you what looks to be about a four, maybe five foot sidewalk, one foot planter strip as you go both uh, westbound in the upper left hand corner and back eastbound toward eighth in the lower right hand corner. Um, the appellant ha is making their request for a variance from the requirements. You see the planning department's recommendations in your case packet. I think this slide will probably give us the best indication of the case in question. For the appellant, if you'll just introduce yourself by name and address, uh, is there anyone here in opposition to cases number 204 and 205? There are opponents as a result, so you'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. If you want to save some portion of that time for rebuttal, save it out of this original 10 minutes. Um, periods of time where the board members ask questions are not taxed against the time allotted to either the appellants or the opponents. So with that, again, if you'll just introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Was the, uh, oh, Jose Vega, nice to meet everybody. And uh, w the question is that came up is the sidewalk and we really, uh, our position is just, we'll do whatever is recommended. Uh, I think there was some confusion that they w we might have, uh, they might have thought that we didn't want if to build a. If you'll do whatever, why are you here today? Oh, because they, there's a, uh, I guess somebody thinks that we don't want to keep the sidewalk the way it is, but we, we're fine with that. The but thing is, it needs to be to fixed. to build the new standards of sidewalks? <laughs> Well, that's the part that we want to talk about is that we will do either either or keep it that way and fix it and repair it because there's been some damage to the sidewalk or build it up to the new standards. But 
what we're trying to avoid is paying the in lieu of fee oh, because okay. you know we right. we'll do you know we'll either leave it like that and fix well, everything. Or let me ask you. So you're willing to update it to the new standards? Then? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, that of course does not require an appeal. As, as the appellant aptly stated, there had been some confusion originally as to whether this was an attempt to not just stay out of paying into the sidewalk fund, but also avoid building to the current standard, which as noted in the planning recommendation, is a five foot sidewalk and four foot planter strip on the exterior of the so sidewalk up to the road. Are you so willing to do that? For yes. this case and then the yes. next case? But yes, but at the same time, we're considerate of the neighbors because that there is no sidewalk in that neighborhood right. that's to the new standard. So, you know, we're, we're trying okay, to appease well, the neighbors too, you know. So well, speaking of the neighbors, and you'll have some time to come back, let's hear from the opposition and we'll figure out what's going on here. Okay. So go back in the audience and we'll hear what's going on here. Please identify yourself for the record, your name and address, and why you're in opposition. And does that opposition change when he says he's going to build it up to the current code? Okay. My name is Katie Feldhouse. I live at 2020 Beach Avenue, apartment A11 in Nashville 37204. I live within, this, within 600 feet of 816A and 816B Benton Avenue and would like to request denial of the variance from sidewalk requirements for the case 204 and 205. The sidewalk was in place before the property was purchased and should remain after the new structure is built. The sidewalk was, was in good working order before demolition began, but now it is broken. The home could have been demolished. Okay, so right, you know, he just said he, would, he was going to replace the sidewalk, and right now there's a two-foot grass strip. It's what exists on the property and on the whole street. The code requires them to have a four-foot grass strip with the same side, type of sidewalk, which he also said he would do. Right. So he, he, you are going to get a new sidewalk. So are there other areas where you're opposed? No. Sorry. I thought you had wanted to hear the opposition oh, no, no, no. and then uh, see I if just, I was okay uh, with it. Are you, are you yeah, okay, I'm okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank We're you. We're putting it back. Okay. okay. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you build the new sidewalk or... Yeah, if you build a new sidewalk, they're okay. Yeah. Is that fine? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. We're fine with that. So, I guess, it, I mean, but his argument is that if, if he builds it just exactly like it is, it's just better for the street because there's a two-foot grass strip, and that's and you wouldn't have that little jog. But if he, if he does that, he'd have to have a variance from us because planning would require him to pay. Yeah, and there's a pole, too. It looks like a utility pole. Now, now the pole is in the property the alley. of the... Uh, of the uh, of those apartments over there, it's actually okay. in that property over there. So um, you're willing to kind of maintain the si or repair the sidewalk the way it is, correct? And, and, and maybe even it looks like it probably needs a whole new sidewalk. That it, it does. It does. Would, would you it be really willing does. to build a whole new oh, sidewalk? Yeah. Yes. But yes. Just the way it's done right here. Correct. Okay. Correct. correct. Any questions? Well. John Michael? To be clear, if we're talking about building to the current standard, the appropriate action is for the appellant to withdraw the appeal. The board is required well, to make no action on right. this. He can go get his permit because he's talking about building to what the law requires well, at that point. I think it might be. Unless the board, of course, wants to take a motion and place a vote on the request okay, for the so you understand you do nothing. The new standards require a four foot grass strip right. and then a larger sidewalk, six feet. So. And you're okay with the four foot grass strip? Yes, the, the, what came up was that since it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's an established neighborhood, you know, it would upset a lot of people if, if we built a sidewalk that was wider. So we were trying to be just, I'm just trying to be considerate of the neighbors, you know, then I'm going to want to change. So really whatever they want, if they, if they want to, if they need it to be up to new code standard, we'll do that or leave it like that and just repair it and fix it. We're fine. We're just... We just now want to pay the lieu of fees since we're willing to do either either one. Okay, we're okay let's hear that. from our lawyer. Okay, if you are inclined to, um, Mr. Michael's right, if he's going to build to the current standards, then nothing is required, no action is required by the board. However, what I'm hearing him say is that he would, he, he would like consideration about building it as it is currently, which would require a variance right, from this board. So I just wanted to Can I sure. hear the person from opposition please come forward again? And I want to ask you a very specific question again. I'm sorry. So, he has said he would build a brand new sidewalk just like that one, or 
build a wider sidewalk with a bigger gas strip? Which is your preference? What is required by code? What is required by codes is the four foot strip and then the wider sidewalk. But as you understand, it will not connect the same way as this does. So this is probably a two foot grass strip, maybe. And so the grass strip would be four feet and then the sidewalk would be behind there. So if you're running or walking down the street, you're gonna go. Right, I think building it back to how it was when they found it. Just like, like this, but a brand do. new sidewalk. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Please come back. Just for the benefit of our record, Mr. Chairman, the opposition overtly is in support of the variant sought by the uh, <laughs> appellant for both cases number 204 and 205. As a result, we'll only need five minutes for full presentation from the she, appellant in this case, and we would solicit a motion from the board. Are you saying she's for it before she was against it? <laughs> Ah, uh, my political people there, they know. Okay, so uh, you're willing to build the sidewalk, yes. a brand new sidewalk, and yes. then improve whatever the kind of yes. grass strip area is there. Okay, any questions for the applicant? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll move that we approve the sidewalk variance request on the condition that the applicant build an entirely new sidewalk uh, for the length of the property uh, same it, with the same, same dimensions. Same dimensions and same grass strip as currently exists on the street. Okay. Uh, it's immediate two neighbors. A second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Stay there. John Michael. Can we take that vote again on case number 205? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on case motion. 205, I'll make the same motion. Do I need to state that motion? It could be. That we, uh, approve the variance of the sidewalk, provided that the entire length of the sidewalk be, uh, existing sidewalk be removed and replaced with the same dimensions as uh, exist uh, currently and that are in line with the two immediate neighbors and the rest of the street. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Nope. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Okay. Thank Thanks you. for being a good neighbor. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-222. This is an item A appeal, a traditional item A appeal from Jody Roberts, the appellant on behalf of JMR Investments, LLC, the owner of the subject property, which is located at 24-7 Stiver Street over in Council District Number 2. The challenge is to the zoning staff's determination of duplex eligibility in the R10 zoning district. Specifically, and you'll hear from staff on this point, uh, although R10 is a zoning district that potentially allows duplex construction, and although the 10,000 foot uh, square foot minimum is met with this particular piece of property, the creation of the lot posed a problem which caused the zoning staff to determine that it was not in fact um, duplex eligible. Um, specifically, in this particular case, the eligibility for duplex pursuant to the to zoning code requires that the duplex lots have to be created within certain time frames, namely by a deed and not by plat uh, prior to 1964. However, this was post-1964, the creation of the Metropolitan Government, and it was created in 1976 and under a deed. 1976 deed is not a legal formation of the lot for purposes of confirming duplex eligibility. Um, it could be done by a plat prior to 84, but a plat created in 02 in this case uh, did not get them over the hump. I know that's a lot of detail, but in this unique instance, a case that we haven't seen many of in the last few years, uh, this is a scenario that is unique in terms of the creation of the lot actually being the basis by which the property is deemed not duplex eligible. I think you'll find from sh some short notes from our zoning examiner, Mr. Thermopolis, in your case packet that kind of explains that in a nice uh, bullet point synopsis for you. With that, that's staff's take on this on the item A case. Uh, if you want further clarification from the director of codes, he is present and can give some clarification with regard to the general law relating to this item. However, Mr. Roberts is present and will have the opportunity to make his presentation. Is there anyone in the audience who's here in opposition to case number 222? Anyone in the audience opposed to case number 222? The person who I talked to earlier who was opposed to case number 222, are you still here and still in opposition? With that, the unopposed uh, appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Good okay. luck to introduce yourself Let's by name go. and address. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jody Roberts, uh, 2407 Stiver Street, Nashville, Tennessee, 37218. Um, this property parcel. Uh, oh, there we sorry. Go. There we go. Uh, it's zoned R10. It's uh, 0.39 acres. Um, as John just stated, uh, it meets the requirements for R10. 
it needs to be a minimum of 10,000 square feet to have duplex eligibility. My lot is 17,000 square feet. Um, so it's a big lot and it easy, easily meets the size requirements. Um, so why is the I'll, zoning administrator wrong in his interpretation of this? Well, it, the plat was created, I think in 2002. Mm -hmm. So if it's been, if there's something that's been messed with, then it kicks out the duplex eligibility. And so what I did is I met with my councilman and did they give y'all these? Okay, I met with my councilman, DaCosta Hastings, mm -hmm. and I shared with him, you know, this lot and the parcel and everything. He goes, Jody, I, I see no problem with it. He yeah. goes, you, you meet the size requirements. Yeah. There's we, we have a letter from him dated May 30th saying, I'm ready to express my support for the above reference case, a duplex eligibility for Striver Street. So he's in total support. Yeah, he, he, he goes, and plus it's a street, unfortunately. It's kind of on the back side. And in his words, he said, Jody, it needs some TLC back there. He goes, you're starting to see development up on the hill. And you can see here, um, if you'll turn to the 3219 A and B Lincoln Street, that is an attached duplex. And the frontage on that one is just 50 feet. My road frontage is 78 feet. So on my concept plan, I'm gonna be able, if I'm granted this, I'll be able to build a duplex detached, 32 feet wide each. And they're gonna be traditional, just nice houses. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I get it, I appreciate it, but for whatever reason, your property's not zoned for a duplex. And the zoning administrator said, your property's not duplex eligible. And so the way you've appealed this case is by saying he's wrong. And everything you've said about the, the lot says, well, it makes sense that in a lot of yeah, lots sir. that size in our city, you can have two pieces, I mean, two homes, but you haven't said why the zoning administrator is wrong, which makes me wonder if this is the right avenue to get the, yeah. you know, for to get a duplex on your property because it sounds like, based on what I know, the zoning administrator is not wrong, and yet your property is one that could be developed because it's big enough, but right. the, the current zoning doesn't allow it. So I don't, I don't know what, unless you tell me why he's wrong, I don't know what relief we can give right. you today. So I'm saying. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that, let me ask the zoning yeah. administrator for clarification. If we, okay. <laughs> the director of code. <laughs> um, so the property is zoned R10, which uh, allows a duplex with conditions. And um, Mr. Roberts is, is caught between two technical requirements for a duplex. The first one is that um, this property was created by deed, at least initially, and not by plat. So to be created by deed, it would have had to have been created before 1964. That's the date when our planning commission came in and when things were required to be platted. This property was created in 1976 by deed, which means that it was illegally created, if, if you will. So they went back and tried to fix that, and the way you fix that is by platting the property. And so they platted it in 2002. However, there's yet another requirement of the zoning code that says that if you're gonna have a duplex, that it must have been platted prior to 1984. This one was platted in two, 2002. So it's stuck yeah. between two technical kind of requirements, but the property seems to have enough lot area. It's also zoned appropriately for a duplex. Um, I hope that you read into this that this is a just some, some technical requirements that are under the code. It's got enough lot area, the zoning is appropriate. I'm, it, it, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so not to ask you to agree with legal jargon, jargon but is this a no harm, no foul? I mean, had it been done properly, it, well, clearly would have been eligible. So if... If, if it had been initially created um, prior to 1964, there would not be a problem, but it wasn't. 
if it if it had been created by Platt before 1984, yeah. it wouldn't be a problem. But it was. But it wasn't. So they're just they're technical re requirements. For me, the big issue is it's zoned appropriately for a duplex. It's got enough lot area. Um, so there you go. Okay. Yeah. And and obviously anything I, else to add? Yeah, I mean obviously I didn't own the lot back then, and right. and I think he shared pretty straightforward. If it would have been done properly, then it, okay. Yeah, okay. Questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Uh, no, sir. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. So, um, you heard from the zoning administrator who was very clear about kind of what this is and, of course, the applicant. So, there's no one in opposition. The council person has given his full and enthusiastic support for this. Anyone have a motion? Well, I'm not sure what the motion would be. I mean, it's, we still have the issue of everybody's in agreement, but we we are still in the position that we have to say the extenuating circumstances. Okay, so given the extenuating circumstances of this case, I move. Well, I will move due to the extenuating circumstance, extraordinary and extenuating circumstance of this case, that the zoning administrator uh, did err, and uh, that the uh, appeal be granted. Okay. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Pass? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're good. Thank you very much. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is number 2018-224, Brent Mellers, the appellant and owner of the property at 306 Radnor Street in Council District number 16. The request is an item A appeal involving the denial of a short-term rental permit based upon uh, advertising and occupancy, uh, advertising and occupancy in excess of legal restrictions. Um, the property shown here from the aerial map and here from the face of the property from the assessor's website. As noted, is in Council District Number 16, the Woodbine area. Uh, Mr. Osborne from the Code staff has the case with regard to the short-term rental issues and can present first, as Mr. Miller is represented by Council. Is anyone here in opposition to Case Number 224? Seeing no one. No, we have. Someone. Oh, sorry, there is. There you are. Thank you. The uh, appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentations after staff makes its presentation. Okay, Mr. Osborne, tell us about this and um, how'd you hear about it? Uh, any non-permit violations and anything else we should need to know about? So this one actually did have a permit, um, but there were some issues that we came across in November uh, 27, 2017. We got received a complaint for excess occupancy bedrooms and not displaying permit information. Um, when I re-inspected that uh, on January 5th, it was still in violation, so I had to issue a warrant, which I didn't get service on. And how, did you, you, how did you know they were still in violation? Was it they were advertising? Or yes, sir. They were, they were advertising over occupancy in bedrooms. Um, how many were they advertising for? Initially, I think it was five bedrooms and 22 people. 22? Okay. Stack them. So the advertisement wasn't compliant until about March 19th. And so you said you went there to see if they complied, and why didn't they comply? Or what? Um, my, under my understanding is that it was sent to an address that he doesn't receive mail at. Okay. Which was, we sent it to where the property assessor shows that he should receive mail. Sure. He's since updated that information. Okay. Um, so the Airbnb ad complied on March 19th, and then it looks like VRBO complied on about April 8th. Um, he How did many times had it been rented over, you, I mean, you look at reviews, I mean, did it say, hey, I bought my group of 20 friends here, and we had a great time in Nashville? I, I didn't check that for this, but I can if, if you want while they're, they're okay. discussing. Well, I'm just kind of um, curious. So we did receive numerous complaints through this. Um, How many? At least seven through the hotline. How many? Seven. Seven? Seven. Okay. Um, we've also had some issues with parking on the grass at the property that other inspectors have, have taken that worked in property standards. Um, on In October, January, and February, um, due to the excess occupancy, the permit was revoked on March 26th of 2018. And, um, okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? 
Is there something open in the environmental court? I see a couple of warrants in our paperwork. No, we had to go through and reissue the warrant because there was an alias, but okay. we didn't get service on it. So it is. It has been closed. And is that case closed? Yes, ma'am. And how was that resolved? Um, I believe that it was court costs involved with that. I'm sorry. Just court costs involved with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please identify yourself for the record, name and address. And good afternoon, Council Attorney David Whalen, representing Brent Miller. This is Mr. Miller, uh, and he owns the property at 306 Radnor Street. Uh, from my understanding of this, the original issues were operating without a permit and then being over the occupancy. Uh, as the uh, codes inspector said, there actually was a permit. Uh, Mr. Miller did a significant rehabilitation of that property and expected during the first three month window to be able to have the fire marshal come out and be finished. They didn't finish construction. Uh, the next round, he did get a permit, but for whatever reason, the first lack of permitting was what stood out on his individual file. So when he was operating with a valid permit, it showed that he did not have one, although greater look. Well, wait a minute, we just heard from Mr. Osborne that the case was occupied, not necessarily not having a permit, but too many people, well, 22 people. Yes, sir. And, and Five bedrooms. When we start this, uh, sir, we had two issues on a complaint to my client, and the first was operated without a permit. He, he did acknowledge that was resolved. Okay. I'll move on. I apologize. So uh, let's talk about 22 people. And so that's not even close to the maximum occupancy. I agree, sir. And um, when Mr. Miller was noticed that he was advertising for over the occupancy, uh, the majority or significant portion of his business comes from the Airbnb website. He immediately, after speaking with Mr. Osborne, corrected that. He had not had any, so he was in compliance as far as how he was renting the property. Uh, how do we know? According the, to Mr. Osborne, he was still advertising up until March. Well, on the VB or the VRBO website, um, apparently still had an ad there that he didn't receive rentals from and just did not realize I still have an ad out there. And when he's speaking with Mr. Osborne, am I in compliance? Mr. Osborne pointed out, no, you still have this ad up. He immediately took that down as well. So he, he made significant efforts to get himself in compliance. Significant efforts is just pulling down your listing that we're not renting to, to anyone above the required 12 occupancy. So does, does, is this his personal home or is this a type two? Type two. And then after the permit was revoked, I'm sorry. After the permit was revoked on uh, March 26, was it uh, rented after that as a short term rental? So he was given notice on March 6th for a re revocation date of April 10th. Uh, he did not rent it as a short-term rental and refunded any reservations that were uh, that were made after that period of time. How many did he cancel? Um, from and what I don't I've think it's refunding. I don't think. Well, he took paid. deposits for those, so he refunded those portions. Uh, and so, how many were that? I would say, from what I've seen of the June calendar, I don't know about May, but I would say at least. Do you recall exactly? It was, it was like 14 or 15. 14 or 15 reservations he returned. Okay. There have been complaints about parking. He since added additional parking to solve that challenge. Um, and I think Mr. Osborne would, would probably submit that he has spent a significant amount of time talking to Mr. Miller and he has endeavored to comply and to do the things that were asked of him. Um, not realizing he still had an add up for over occupancy rental is certainly not a defense. Uh, it would just be asking for forgiveness from this body and allowing him to reinstate his permit. He had a current permit issued from March to March 2018 to 2019. That was what was revoked uh, on so, April 10th. So Mr. Miller, how many other short term permits do you have with the city of Nashville? I think I have five additional. You have five. I would think if you have six total, is that correct? Yes, sir. I think you would be an expert on the rules and regulations of our recently, two years ago, plus pass short-term rental law, right? Why are you here? All my other ones are significantly smaller, so they never, it never came into question. When I built the bigger one, 
I truly didn't know there was a limit. And my other ones were small, so that there was a question. Did I, you fill out the application yourself when you got a short-term permit? Uh, for yes. the five others? Yes, sir. And you didn't read the website that had the rules about what you're supposed to do? Sir, I would have never blatantly broke the, I mean, I knew I would be caught if I did. I would have never blatantly broke the rules. I, I didn't know that was a rule. And as soon as I found out it wasn't, I changed it. It's I on the website. I wasn't trying to get away so you, with anything. You have six short-term rentals. I cannot believe you don't know the law. I, I promise you I didn't. I'm, and, sir, and regardless, I, I don't think there are any complaints involving him actually being able to rent it for that amount of people. It was a technical violation in that he advertised That's a it. violation of the law. Yes, sir. You might call it technical. It's a violation of the law. And we've had people lose their short-term permit because they rented or listed too many people. Do you have anything else to add, Counselor? No, sir. Uh, well, correction. Just briefly that um, I would hope we would get some support from Mr. Osborne that and clearing up any of these it's issues. It's not his job to support anybody. I, I it's understand. to give us information about violations of this law. Yes, sir. Um, that Mr. Miller has worked diligently to, at any point during this process, ensure that he's in compliance and, and follow the rules and would ask forgiveness for advertising improperly. Um, that, that, that's all. Questions, board members? You will have rebuttal time because there's opposition, so you'll have seven minutes and 12 seconds come back. So yes, we're going to hear from the opposition, and then you'll get to respond. Opposition now, please come forward for this case. State your name, your address, and why you're opposed to this particular case. My name is Michael Hall. I live at 309 Radnor Street, which is directly across the street from this property. I have filed numerous complaints. I have photographs on my phone right now of two stretch limos that were taking up the two properties, the 306 and 304. The entire length of both of those properties were covered up with stretch limos. The March 26th date. Who owns 304? Uh, just an, uh, it's just another an person. Okay. Yes. I'm just making a point that there are buses out in front of our property. The, the ads that the gentleman over here pointed out on VRBO, which I took screenshots of and sent to codes numerous times, uh, the words, the wording that was used was event space, quote, this is an event space. And the blatant disregard for law is obvious that even you, Mr. Ewing, were pointing out. You own six different, you own six short-term rentals, you should know what the law is, and you don't. So you, you either are ignorant to the law or you have disregarded the law. And this is the problem that we, that I have with this property, is okay. that it's just Let's constant. It's been a constant struggle with, I have, I had, there was a, uh, WSMV Channel 4 came out and actually did a story on this property in regards to short-term rental uh, problem properties. And this was the property that was highlighted in that news article that aired Why a couple they, of months ago. What was the issue that they concentrated on that was a, as you said, problem? What you've pointed out, advertising for 22 people. I have photographs of of parties of 13 that were in there in April, parties of 20 plus. There was a, a um, review on VRBO that cleared, that stated, it was, was on January the 20th, I believe, it was in January, and it stated that our party of 20 had a great time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Osborne, the um, applicant uh, the opposition says that this was advertised as an event space. Do you have any knowledge or reference to that being listed in any review or listing? Um, I know at the time on March 5th, which the advertisement I'm looking at confirms that review he just stated, um, it does have a, a clause in there for parties for more than 25 people. There's an extra $200 fee. Read that to me again. <laughs> Thank you. For Sorry. parties... <laughs> For more than 25 people, there's an extra $200 fee. Mm hmm. 
Parties and events allowed. Parties, read that again. Parties slash events allowed. Parties slash events allowed. That does not sound like a short-term rental to me. No, sir. Okay, so. Party, uh, this is this was the problem. I don't have a problem with short-term rentals. You don't. I so really don't. Okay. If I have a problem with event spaces in my neighborhood. Okay. I have a, I have, that's where the issue yep. is. Questions of the opposition? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's Thank hear you from time. the applicant and their lawyer again. Counselor, you heard what your client has listed. Yes. How do you care to respond to that? He's fixed it. Uh, the neighbor doesn't well, have so a problem. It's more than just fixing it. He owns six short-term rentals. I've never heard of anybody listing something like that and saying parties over 25 or next year $200. He should know what he has and what he doesn't have. He doesn't have a license to have parties over the limit, which is well under 25, as you know. And he doesn't have a license to run this as an event space. I, I agree, Councilor. So why should we even talk about reducing this penalty? When Mr. Miller was first cited, at the moment he was cited, he's endeavored to correct his deficiency, his problem. Um, one of the other complaints not mentioned today was people parked on the grass. He fixed that problem. He poured more parking to, to provide us place to not disrupt activities in the neighborhood. Uh, he is has not since done that. Uh, he doesn't advertise that way anymore. He recognizes that was an error and has endeavored to comply to fit this short-term or type two rental in a neighborhood without causing ripples or, or, or discord. Okay. And, uh, and he merely submits for forgiveness that this occurred, he's fixed it, he will endeavor and to not ever have it occur again, but shows a pattern of attempting to not cause issues with the property. Okay, board members, questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? No, sir. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Just have a question for um, uh, whomever can answer. This is just a. Um, this is not a. This is a reinstate or deny the permit case. It's not a case where we would assess a time penalty. Is that right? This was a revoked permit, uh, rather than merely a denial of a new application. So um, it's a yes-no question on the revocation. Whether the zoning administrator erred in rev revoking the permit. Okay, so discussion. So as I said during this case, this isn't just a regular one. I have this one short-term rental permit and I'm really new to all this and I just don't know. This person has six and this person said that they applied themselves for the other five they obviously didn't read our laws. And to me, this is not a, this should not be a party house. It's being billed as an event space and even allowing over 25 people. So I think the zoning administrator was correct. Well, and, uh, you know, it, there, there are two issues, and I think that, that we don't have to address the second issue because in most of these item A, it's, you know, are they guilty or are they not guilty? And if, they're, they're guilty, then the zoning administrator didn't err, then what happens? And in most cases, we have some leeway over whether or not there was, you know, a, a, what the penalty should be. But in this case, the question is, did the zoning administrator err or not err? And if the zoning administrator did not err, then uh, the, the permit is revoked and they can, I guess, I presume apply for a permit at whatever time the law allows them to reapply for a permit. And so, you know, I, I haven't seen anything that says the zoning administrator uh, erred. I mean, I, I, have, I have empathy yes, for the, 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 the person you wanting to fix a, a wrong, but I think there's clear evidence of misbehavior before that. So while I, I, I do empathize with, uh, with the applicant, I also heard very strongly from the opposition that no, there's clear evidence that, that the zoning administrator didn't err and just, they rented a lot more people and did it quite a bit. And 
So I don't know that what are y'all's thoughts on that? Does anyone have a motion? Sure, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err and that the permit remain revoked. Is that a proper motion? Okay, that's a proper motion. I'll second it. Any um, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case of the board's consideration is 2018 225. This involves the property at 6391 Pettis Road, way down at the farthest edge of Council District Number 31, Councilman Bednay's district. It's an AR 2A zone district. Uh, Nora L. Shayer, the appellant, and Charlie Warden, the owner of the property, they're seeking a special exception in this agriculturally zoned district in order to operate a kennel. The aerial photograph here, highlighted in red, shows the subject property as it backs up to a thoroughly wooded area. The uh, plan submitted to give some idea of the proposed layout for the structures associated with the dog kennel vis-a-vis -vis the other homeowners nearby on adjacent lots. Face the property from Pettis Road, of course, doesn't give us much indication to the rear portion of the lot, but at least shows us where we are. And then the aerial photograph shows the proximity of the nearest neighbors and the structures that could be used for the project. Uh, there are opponents to the case present today. The appellant is represented by counsel. So with case number 225, the appellants will have 10 minutes. John to Michael, before we get started, can you kind of give us the rules of having a kennel and how the code deals with kennels versus other kind of uses? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it's only about what? once a year that we see one of these cases. Naturally, we have two on today's docket, which is consistent with everything else about today's docket. Uh, section 17.16.175 is the operative section. It has to do with certain special exception commercial uses. In this case, it's uh, Section A, the very first one, that talks about kennels and stables, and it outlines 10 criteria that are in play involving uh, the setbacks that's required, namely that um, any building where the animals are housed would have to be um, no closer than 200 feet, um, and no kennel run closer than 100 feet from any existing residence other than the one owned or occupied by the owner and operator of the kennel. Uh, building temperature controls, cage controls, the runs for the animals, the stalls. This is more if it, in fact, is a, um, a stable rather than a kennel, again, for riding ring and trail rides, similar in that regard. Gates and locks, such as are required for these properties, the watering of the animals required, and then the tenth item had to do with on-site waste collection. As noted in the initial announcement, as this case had been considered as a possibility for consent agenda, the uh, appellants, having gone through their neighborhood meeting and worked with the district council member, had agreed upon a list of terms for, uh, by which others would be in support of the case. Those terms included, um, in particular, a focus on item number 10, the on-site waste collection. We'll let the appellant through counsel explain their take on that. But again, this operative section of law is 17.16.175 section A. Of the 10 criteria, the ones that most frequently come up in these discussions about kennels, Mr. Chairman, are number one, the setback from residential structures, and number 10, the on-site waste collection for obvious reasons concerning to any neighboring property owners. Uh, the other you know, two through nine don't seem to come up as often in these discussions. Uh, I hope that's a good overview for the board as you launch into the case. Yes, it is. Thank you. With that, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Of course, if you wish to utilize some of that time for rebuttal, save it out of these 10 minutes. Just introduce yourselves by name and address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jason Holloman, 4800 Charlotte Avenue. Council here today for the applicants, uh, Charlie Warden and his wife, Kim. Uh, and you're... Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I prepared a brief that I believe was distributed yes, to you. We have it. Thank okay. you. Okay. And um, as you can see, the, the facility is constructed, and in terms of the setback requirements and the all of the facility requirements are met. Um, this is a fully heated and cooled facility. It does have appropriate cages. It has a stable water system. Uh, it has the runs as contemplated here. Um, and I will note in the picture that you see above you, um, obviously that's the warden's house there in front on the same piece of property. And then to my left, your right, uh, those folks, uh, their house is the nearest and that's the one reflected in the brief is 280 feet door to door there. and. Um, and they are in support of this. Um, now, it's my understanding that it's the folks to the other side and then um, folks that own the wooded land uh, behind it that I understand is anticipated for development that are here 
today in opposition. Uh, as uh, John Michael referenced, uh, we have worked with the local council person. Uh, we've had a community meeting where we brought together close to a dozen neighbors, I think. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, this is not a, a densely populated area, so a, a dozen folks at a community meeting. I felt like was a was a strong showing. We talked through um, what the plan was, and the concern primarily centered around, as you can imagine, dog barking. And um, so, what we did to try to ameliorate that concern, uh, Mr. Warden is agreeable to to provide further sound insulation in the facility there, um, and. And so that's why we asked for a term of six months. Uh, he believes that with additional infrastructure, he can uh, resolve sound concerns inside the building. Um, and that gives him the opportunity to sort of work through that process and see if he can do it. Uh, the other two conditions were simply that the, um, that the permit be exclusive to him, that it be non-transferable, which is a condition I think you often place on these types of requests. Uh, and then the third was just related to waste collection. This is a septic system uh, out, out in the county, and um, he uh, is certainly agreeable to have off-site to his benefit, not to fill up his septic system as well. So he's agreeable to those three conditions. And with those three conditions, we previously believed that we had um, you know, harmony there in the neighborhood, but I believe we have some folks that are concerned here today. So why does it take six months to come up with a solution to the dog barking? Well, I don't think it's going to take six months to come up with a solution. I think it may take a couple of months to get it, get it installed, uh, and then just give a period of time for the neighbors to determine, you know, if it's working. And uh, I mean, usually I see requests like this on a year or two year uh, type permit or, or open ended. I mean, I think some of the kennel permits that I looked at are open ended, um, but the six months just seemed like a reasonable time period it for is, them to is work it through. it currently, ha tell me, I'm sorry if I, it's probably in here, ha does it, is there a current permit that's expiring? Or there, is there's, there's not. Mr. Wooden had constructed this. It's, it's agricultural property, um, and at the time he wasn't aware he needed this permit. Okay. and then. So built, built the, the barn that turned into the kennel that turned okay, into as, this and right. as mentioned at the top of the case there's opposition is there any questions before we hear from the opposition no okay okay do you have anything else to add before you'll be able to come i'd back? just like to rebut if there is yes okay Thank okay you. and please identify yourself for the records i'm charlie warden i'm the owner of 603091 pettis road Okay. And I'm his wife, Kim Warden. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Opposition, please come forward and um, please state why you're opposed to this. And even speak on the, the, the lawyer for the kennel owners thought that they had an agreement, basically, of all those things. Is there anything in addition to those that would be acceptable or are you just against this? So please, let's get started. My name is Mark Sharp. I reside at 6387 Pettis Road, Antioch, Tennessee, uh, with my wife and uh, daughter <clears throat> next door to uh, the appellant and the Waggy Tails Pet Care Center, which is currently in operation. Um, we have a very good relationship with our neighbors. We've lived next door to them for 12 years. We've been there 20 years and built the house uh, just to the east, uh, which is just to the right with the, the swimming pool um, in the current picture that's on uh, above. However, we are opposed to the continued operation of the kennel next door. We've communicated this to the appellant and to his counsel directly, as well as to Councilman Bedney and this board. Uh, I sent a, a brief email on May the 15th uh, inquiring about the letter that I had received from the BZA, as well as the council's letter that came in early May. Uh, and I had some questions asked, but I was not contacted by um, anyone from the, the BZA or the uh, zoning group. I further sent a second email on June the 3rd, uh, this Sunday, and copied the board on a communication that I had sent on the same day to uh, uh, the appellant and uh, counsel who just spoke. Um, additionally, my wife and I met one-on-one uh, -on -one with the appellant at his home on May the 23rd, that evening after work, uh, and then we attended the community uh, meeting as it was described um, at the home of the appellant with, actually, uh, in fact, it was five other property owners on, on Pettis Road, not a dozen as the uh, council mentioned, um, including the, the appellant. There were uh, six 
sorry, seven property owners, the appellant, and six other neighbors, including myself. Um, there were two members that joined that were customers of the kennel that spoke on behalf of the kennel. Uh, however, I'm not considering their input because they actually are patrons of the, of the kennel, um, but they were there and present. Uh, prior to the BZA letter that came, as well as council uh, letter from uh, Mr. Holloman, and the May 24th meeting uh, that took place at the appellant's home, I understood the kennel was going to be closed or relocated uh, and had conversation as such uh, with the appellant at different times. Um, as such, I'd just like to state that under Metro's Title 8.12 miscellaneous animal control regulations, in Section 8.12.010, it states, keeping of animals that disturb the peace a, it is unlawful for any person to keep any animal, dog, bird, or fowl, which by causing frequent or loud continued noise disturbs the comfort, comfort or repose of any person in the vicinity. B, violation of this section shall be declared to be public nuisance, which violation may be enjoined by any court of competent jurisdiction. There's some references, I guess, to some ordinances that were uh, dated. So I'd like to restate I'm opposed on the grounds that the noise abatement uh, as proposed in the permit and sound and desolation uh, of the kennel itself and was discussed at the meeting on the 24th, which I attended, cannot in fact resolve or muffle the outdoor play area and constant barking that we hear inside and outside of our home. The long-term effects of living next door to a kennel are negative, primarily stress, lack of sleep and rest, and the barking is counter to our desire to live in a peaceful neighborhood. My research of kennels in operation within Davidson County via Google search, while not scientific, could not find kennels operating in a residential area other than the appellant's Waggy Tails Pet Care Center. The ones that I did find were in commercial areas located on major thoroughfares, such as um, near interstates and major thoroughfares like uh, um, Knowlesville Road and um, uh, other major thoroughfares as such. Further, my house is not for sale, but I argue that it would be difficult to market and sell the house at a market price next door to a kennel. This is not a small kennel or operation. It advertises a 7,000 foot outdoor play area, uh, which is immediately to the rear of the uh, black roof area of the actual kennel. So it's fenced in. There's a very large play area where the dogs are allowed to run and play. Uh, and having boarded 70 dogs over the most recent Memorial Day weekend, and turning uh, business away per my conversation with the appellant on May the 23rd um, at his home. Uh, lastly, although with a special exception, a kennel or stable could be permitted in the AR2A area, it's my understanding and reading of uh, chapter 17 that an animal boarding facility is not permitted in AR2A. It's only permitted in what's called a downtown zone or DTC area as I understand the code. So I submit that although the permit is for a kennel, it is in fact an animal boarding facility because dogs are boarded overnight and they're allowed to be dropped off at all day, days and nights. And uh, we're subject to just the, the noise at all the hours of the day and night and weekends as well because there's no limit to the operation or the quantity of the, the dogs that may be boarded. So it's simply my desire to see that it move to a more suitable location and, and not be next door. Thank you. you said you've lived there next door for 20 years. I, I've lived in the, my house for 20 years and 12 years uh, next door to the appellant. Okay, now, so he, what does he currently operate? You I'm, called it a kennel. Is this a kennel? Uh, it's advertised as Waggy Tails Pet Care Center. What is that? It's a dog kennel with do they training. Board, do they board overnight? Yes. Okay. And so how long has that building with a black roof been there? I don't know, four years maybe? I, I'm just guessing, I don't okay. know exactly. But that's where the animals go? Uh, when they're indoors, and then outdoors in the, the like backyard fenced in. So how long is area. it, how long is, is the, has it only been four years then they, since they've been doing the dog kennel, dog care? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't know the date that it was actually well, built, you know, about, but it's, you it's said roughly, approximately, yes. approximately yeah. yeah. It hadn't been 12, it hadn't been since they moved. No, 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 no. And then I guess the only... And, and I might say, this is very difficult for me to be here because I love my neighbors next door. They're good people. Um, they're good, honest people and they work hard. 
and, and we've had very amicable discussions about it. It's just, I just think it's been so successful that it needs to go somewhere else, that's all. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's fine. And, um, you know, it, it, you know the, I guess I'll ask you and then the, and the other folks when they have a chance to talk. Um, the, the applicant has, has asked for, a, you know, a six month uh, operating um, permit and in, in order to give them time to remedy some of the issues that you have, you know, that you've stated specifically noise, um, why, why would that be unreasonable to, to give them a chance to ease the noise sure. and then I, and say, yeah, we'll come back and six months later you can say it wasn't any better, so we can say, oh, sorry. Okay, so again, I'm not an expert on the zoning, but what I've been able to find and read on my own time is that any permit that is granted could very well be granted again and extended again and again and again. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the crack in the dike uh, occurs as soon as this permit is, is approved. So again, it, it's, it's, I mean, imagine 70 dogs next door, indoors and outdoors. And, and I was at the meeting and I even agreed, you know, yeah, I was willing to accept putting sound insulation to fix the issues with, within the kennel. And, and the neighbor that was there, um, the Morris family just to the west, that was their primary concern, according to my notes. They wanted sound insulation. The dog run in the, the backyard areas directly connected to my property to the east. So I, I'm more sensitive to the outdoor dogs and noise and, and you know boisterousness and play that 70 dogs can do. Um, Further, I can hear the dogs in the kennel, and I do think sound abatement would work, but honestly, long term, I will sell my house. I will move, and I don't want to deal with trying to have a you know open house at Sunday from two to four with 35 dogs barking in the backyard. I'll never be able to sell the house. That's my main concern. So you say you can hear the dogs even when they're inside? Yes, sir, I can. I can hear the dogs in any part of my home, whether it's the point that's whatever, 250 or whatever feet away from the kennel or on the very front of the house. I mean, your house isn't just right up to the property line. It looks like a pretty sturdy, nicely constructed brick house. That's correct. And so you get here still all t times of day or is it? Uh, yes, sir. Night? Night, too. I mean, it's not technical, but I even, this is, sounds crazy. I, I went mm -hmm. so far as to order order a decibel meter from Amazon and recorded the decibels just sitting on my back patio, and they go from an ambient 45, 50 to about 62 to 63, and then come back down every bark, every bark. And a plane flew, a Southwest Airlines plane flew overhead, it was about 68, and that was directly overhead. So again, it's not scientific, it's just, and, and, and I love and respect the appellants. I really mean that sincerely because they're good people. But I can enjoy just the general nature of sitting out and having a barbecue or going and swimming in the pool with the dog barking constantly outdoors. It's, it's just a real issue. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that. Well, I have a question for Mr. Sharp quickly if I could. And thank you for being here and thank you for the uh tenor of your statements. We appreciate hearing from neighbors in a very respectful way. If you, is there a period of time you can say that it became a problem? If this has been in operation for four years, is it a size issue? That is, was there a time when they started having more dogs? We discussed this at the meeting. I can't say specifically. I know, I'm, again, I'm Mr. Morris, I guess, it's isn't here, but he, he cited like six months. So it seems like within the last six months. I mean, when I started recording things just for my own satisfaction and my wife's satisfaction. You know, Christmas morning when I woke up, I could hear it. Thanksgiving morning when I woke up, I could hear the dogs barking. Okay. Um, different events where I was just outdoors trying to relax and got annoyed with it, I started to record it. And I've never said anything to the appellant because they're good neighbors and I never wanted to cause a problem or an issue, but when the letter came from the BZA and from the lawyer, I thought, well, I thought this was going to go away. Um, my wife at one time got a text from Charlie, and I think the, the context of the text said that peace is coming back to Orchard Lane, which there used to be an orchard on the property where my home was built many, many years ago. And that was like, you know, before New Year's or around that time frame. So 
I hope and pray that it goes to a commercial area or an industrial area or a zone that just isn't right next door to me um, because it is his livelihood and I respect that. And he's very good at it, very good, and has very positive ratings. If you look at his website and the ratings, they're all fantastic. And it's because Charlie's a great guy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's hear from you. Just a note to the two opponents. I can't see the time, but you might be, you might have to divide. So it's four time. minutes. Sure. Yeah, and four that's minutes. combined, so. I got okay. you. Uh, my name is Trey Hill, and I own property at 6397 Pettus Road. Uh, that's just to the north and west of this property. It's about 49 acres that my family owns. Uh, if you zoom in right here, you're looking at the homes that are AR2A. Uh, this neighborhood is very much an emerging residential neighborhood. There's ST plan, SP plans just to the north and just to the south who have recently been passed. The noise that the neighbors hear when the dogs are outside travels quite far. I'm very, I'm also concerned that there is a development planned on our property that has been approved by Metro Council just behind this property, which is, is our property. So this would negatively affect that, uh, that planning and it also would probably change the uh, direction of that planning. Uh, so, our concern is the abatement planned for the, the shed where the dogs are housed will not be enough because it will not satisfy the noise when the dogs are outside. I, d I just don't see a solution to this where we can have residen residential area in this area, in this neighborhood, as well as the dogs outside. And as far as the temporary permit, time to resolve this issue is not, a, not really an issue for me personally, uh, I do believe on the Sharps' behalf, you know, they've done everything they can. It's kind of like enough is enough here. And uh, we're very concerned that, as you, he said, a permit will just lead on to further litigation and possibly approval of a, of a permanent permit. Uh, my name is Forrest Cook. Uh, I live at 6611 Burkett Road, co-owner of the property trace, talking about 6397 Pettus Road. Um, I have a list of notes here, and I'm glad they covered all my points, so I don't have a whole lot to say. Uh, uh, just a couple of small points. Uh, the traffic right in this area is pretty horrendous right now. Uh, you've got a lot of traffic going in and out of the kennel, which uh, wouldn't be there if that wasn't there, so it's not helping. Uh, a, a bad situation. It's interesting, uh, Mark's talking about being neighbors. I actually went to uh, uh, elementary and junior high school with Charlie. We've been friends, so uh, uh, he's a good guy. This has nothing to do with some kind of personal vendetta. But uh, there's going to be a lot of people moving in. Our, in these properties will develop through the years. And uh, this, this kennel will be, an, a permanent kennel will be an obstacle to that development. And uh, I, I just think it's not fair to to the current neighbors or what the neighbors are becoming down the pipe. Okay, okay thank you. Questions for the opposition? So, I, generally, uh, somebody asked earlier about is is there a lesser intensity that that might be acceptable if if there were a limitation attached to the permit that you know x number of dogs at any given time or hours of drop off or any, is there anything that, that I, I, I'm just going to say Mark y'all can say something different when the dogs are outside from what, uh, and Mark could probably just say this better than I can when they're outside the noise whether you got a small number of dogs or a large number of dogs is pretty intrusive so I don't know if that's a fair statement or not Mark I mean to me it's an impossible question to really answer and, and be very definitive I'm a dog owner I have a dog okay um but it's basically a house dog. I take it out on a leash. It's never outside without a leash because I don't have a fence in my area. And my dog will bark because she hears the barking, you know, next door and it just adds to it. So the, the codes don't restrict. I mean, I notice in the, in the, in the codes, you know, if it's, a, if it's a stable and it talks about 10 or more horses, five acres, and then there's different restrictions in terms of it's not 200 feet to a residence, it's 200 feet to a property line and, and 100 feet to a property line, but there's no reference to the quantity of dogs to be housed. So whether it's 70 or 100 or seven, the, the fact of the matter is 
Noise is noise, and it's constant, and it's stressful. And it can be at 5 a.m., it can be at 5 p.m., it can be at 2 p.m. You can't determine when the noise is gonna start or stop. And just, I think, frankly, it's just not fair. And So you, you mentioned one thing stood out, that Christmas and Thanksgiving, people go on vacations, I'm sure that's when they're just totally full, right? And you heard a lot of barking yes. during that time. So and Memorial Day weekend. And I was away for a good part of Memorial Day, but I came home on uh, both uh, uh, Sunday of Memorial Day and Monday of Memorial Day. So, so, so this has been an operation. So I want to ask John Michael something. Um, the opposition says that they've been operating some sort of dog facility, I'll call it, for four years. What's going on there? Don't have the permitting history in front of me on that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, so I'm not able to speak to it in an informed manner. But they don't have a current permit of? That's part of what I'm getting to, is okay. I don't have that information. I'll ask our lawyer. So is there a, a dog facility permit that doesn't include overnight boarding that they could have been operating under for the last four years? Um, I'm not aware of one. I was looking, uh, I was, um, Looking at the question, I think there was a statement made um, by the opposition that there was a difference between a kennel um, and um, I couldn't catch the other one. Animal boarding facility. Animal boarding facility. So I, I did look up kennel and it does, con uh, and I think the difference, distinction that he was trying to make was that in a kennel you're, you're not supposed to be able to board. You have to be, in other words, you have to be an animal boarding facility in order to board. So I did look up that definition mm -hmm. and found that kennel does consist of boarding as well. Yeah, that's what my understanding so, was. But I thought that there was something that you could have animals on property, it's not a kennel, but if you do the overnight, which most people want, mm -hmm. you know, it's like grooming is probably different than boarding. I'd be happy to research that for you, but I don't have that information. I mean, I think it's me. the definition of boarding. Is boarding overnight or is boarding just from eight in the morning or six in the morning until six at night? I think most Mr. Chairman, that definition does not exist in the zoning code which is why it wasn't read into the record at the beginning of the case. Okay. So it's sure. up to the board's interpretation. The but important thing to note here, Mr. Chairman, with a little more information that you were seeking a moment ago is while there is not an open environmental court case or anything along those lines involving this property, whatever the operation is, was the subject of a request for service to our codes enforcement uh, division at the Metro Codes Department, uh, which means if uh, it was treated as with the BZA appeal having been filed, if a special exception is granted, that it would necessitate it would not necessitate codes proceeding with Metro Legal to environmental court on the matter. However, in the event that the operation were to continue and a special exception was not granted by the BZA, then that request for service would tick up and become a um, environmental court case. May I ask a question? Um, mm -hmm. That that makes me wonder if there is a permit for any of this kind of activity at all? Apparently yeah. there is not, and that okay. was the basis for the RFS. And that was the basis, okay. That is speculative, but okay. that is a reasonable deduction. Okay. Any other words from the opposition? Uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what to call the gentleman in the tie on to the left. But that was John Michael. John Michael, he, he referenced at the beginning when he introduced this particular case that there's another case that's being put before the BZA. On today's agenda. On one. today's agenda. I guess my point is that's not in a residential AR2A district. It's on, uh, I think it's on 8th Avenue, and it's just converting some business to another business, which is a kennel to me, which is not comparison to a residential area. And okay. I, I just appreciate if, if Metro could show me where there is another kennel in an AR2A residential area operating under a special exception permit. I'm not aware of one. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We're gonna hear from the applicant again and their lawyer. Please come forward and Mr. Holloman, the first question you will get as you are anticipating is, what is your client doing and has your client been operating a kennel for four years without a permit? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Warden began this actually as a dog rescue, a personal dog rescue, and he began to take in more and more dogs over time, and it and it frankly just grew from there. That was the initial. So when did it become a kennel? I, I don't. I have to ask my client that. When did well, you start? We, we, um, and a kennel would be something that you take dogs for money and board them overnight. When did it become a kennel? It, uh, when did we file for our business? Uh, uh, we spent about a year uh, constructing the, the uh, property. I think it and was. And then about three years we've been in operation. And why didn't you have a permit? Well, we didn't think we needed a permit for 
a commercial kennel because at the time we weren't doing that. We were just rescuing dogs and then we, it built on to where some of these people that knew us wanted to start keeping their dogs. And that's well, when you were taking money. Yes, yes. And it just grew and grew. Did you have a building permit when you built this we did. building? We did. And so it didn't And occur. Metro actually called me up and he said, uh, they asked me, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm rescuing dogs. At the time, that's what I was doing. When was this? This was like June of 15. Okay, and so when did you, when did you first start taking money for boarding dogs? Um, I would say it was probably toward the end of 15. So, and how many, you, it's like, and where did you come up with the number 70? It's the magic number well, that you didn't have. Well, you know, problem. sometimes it feels like 70. Um, it might feel like 200 to some of your neighbors. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I don't really like to talk about against anybody, but since I'm being called out, I'm going to do the same. They were very nice to you, by yeah, the way. Yeah, they were, and I'm fixing to be nice. Uh, in our conversations were with Mark, he said, you know, Charlie, you know, I'm all for you. I really am. Because uh, I had to close another business, and it's had medical issues concerning that, but Mark says, listen, by the time they start developing behind you, it's going to be three years. Don't worry about anything. We're fine. He said, I don't hear anything, but my wife does. And so we continued on. So not only that, we started discounting uh, daycare and boarding to uh, animal owners to give them a better price so that they could afford to board with us or use us for daycare. We take on a lot of uh, dogs that have issues that can't go to other kennels. Um, and and don't that's, you think those are the more misbehaved dogs that would be hard to actually keep from barking for your neighbors? Uh, actually, there are ways uh, to, um, see the kennel is not soundproofed at all. Obviously. It's actually a speaker. Okay, so uh, that's why we're here. We're, we're trying to do the right thing. We um, um, basically, when things started getting loud, you know, I live closer than anybody. I hear it more than anybody. But you're making money off of that. That's true, but I'm also an advocate for the dogs, and there's no other place around that does what I do in that area. Uh, that's why we're so busy. So. Uh, you, your lawyer mentioned that you needed six months to come up with some system to reduce the noise. What is that and why do you need six months? Well, the uh, inside of the kennel can be remedied very easily. Uh, it's not cheap, but I can do that. The outside also concerns and how would you remedy that? Well, we would get uh, sound engineers with their meters taking readings. Uh, acoustic but that doesn't signal. remedy it. That just shows you where the problem is. Well, once it gets below a certain decibel is what I'm trying to get at. You put in acoustic ceilings. You uh, soundproof the walls. Uh, and take actual readings of what's going on. Did we improve it or not? My concern as well is the outside. I don't have that answer, but I'm willing to find it. But um, So you have 50 or 75, 70 dogs outside. They're going to make noise and bark at each other. No, I can't, I can't keep 50 dogs outside. We don't have how, that much room. How many? Well, we usually have probably five in five different runs. So about 20 at the most. 20 dogs, that's pretty loud, right? Outside, they can. Some bark, some don't. And in this case, if one barks, it's too many, and I get that. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add to um, the conditions that are enumerated for having kennels, and I will point out, um, you know, this is AR2, it is agricultural. There are, there are pretty wide latitude for animals in general when you look at the allowed uses. Um, you know, farm uses are obviously allowed here that have a lot of livestock. Uh, that's all still permitted in AR2A district. Um, and there is no express reference to sound as a condition in this particular use. Um, but there is a requirement 
meant that the area where the dogs are kept to be 200 feet away from the nearest residence. Uh, my assumption would be when, the, when these conditions were drafted and the council members and the planning commission were deciding uh, what would be an appropriate buffer to protect against sound in intrusion, that's how the 200 feet came to be. And I just referenced that to say um, that the house that is nearest, which is the one to my left, is 280 feet, so it's almost 150% of what that sound buffer is required to be under the code. Um, the other house that we've talked about is further away, and um, I understand that the folks want to develop their property and add more residences to the rear, but Mr. Warden's property goes about an acre beyond uh, that building there, so it's going to be far more than the 200-foot buffer requirement for whatever new residences get constructed in there. Um, but again, that's why we've asked for the six months um, to try to come in and add that infrastructure, um, do some testing, see what those decibels are. I mean, we have we have noise ordinances here in Davidson County, um, and I, you know it's not expressly in this ordinance, but I think that it would be relevant evidence when we come back on a renewal. And of course, I, I would take issue with the idea that that this is a foot in the door because I think we can look at it. Time's again. up. Okay. I, I do have a question. Um, you know, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at the special exception rules, and one of the the general rules is kind of integrity of the adjacent area. You know, where it says, um, you know, approval of a permit will not adversely affect the other property in the area to the extent that it will impair the reasonable long-term use of those properties. And the opposition, that's that's their primary point, was that it's it's going to devalue their property and adversely affect their property. And, you know, I, I, I know you'd commented that the specifics on a, on a kennel, which I think, or a, I think it's kennel or stable, which are listed later, that, that you'll meet those. I have no doubt that, that you will. Yes. Uh, but it, it, you know, it seems to me that, you know, the, the proposal we asked the opposition was, you know, six months to, to give it a try, but it also seems like that would involve a lot of expense and, and to me, I'm, I'm wondering why we wouldn't have, a, given the opposition and, and the extent and, and the, I think, reasonably compelling case that there might be damage to their property, that we wouldn't give you time to go uh, talk to an expert to, to come back with a specific proposal to say, well, you know, if we foam the, you know, if, if I foam this, if I, are, are you basically well, I'm, I'm saying just, I'm, that I'm this asking, needs to be deferred? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm asking them because, I mean, to me, the two options are, well, there, there are three options that I see. We, we deny the, the request based on the testimony from, that we've heard today, or we grant the six months request that they're uh, requesting, which means that they will go out and spend money and give it a try, and then six months later, we may have the same case where the, the neighbors say they can still hear it, and you're back to square one, or you really do some research and get a plan and do it pretty quickly, like maybe a month, uh, and come back and, and say, this is what we're willing to do and here's what the expert says it'll do. And uh, all because, you know, the, the, you know, the planning, the, the zoning does allow a kennel. It doesn't give you the absolute right to have a kennel, but it says you could have a kennel if we agree. So I don't know, that's, that, I'm just, I mean, I, I hear you saying you're going to do a lot of things, but I don't hear specifics, and I hear the neighbors saying, and I heard some specifics, but you just said you didn't know how you were going to address the outdoor space, which the adjacent neighbor has the biggest problem with. So I'm just, that's all I'm wondering is if it makes sense to go and talk to some folks about how you really can accomplish that. And I'll, and I'll say, so in, in terms of the outdoor space, some of that may be just measuring the sound to demonstrate to the board whether the, what the level of audibility is. Well, your neighbor has had that and basically has a very solid, solidly brick house, which isn't right up on the property line, and he says he could hear barking inside his house. And I'll, and I'll say that the decibel levels he identified were not noise ordinance violation decibel levels. But you're asking for a special exception. Well, and, and that, I mean, and, 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 that, and that argument may be later, but, but clearly it, right. it might be, it might not be noise ordinance uh, levels, but it might be determined by the board to 
be levels that adversely affect the property. Th so that's that, correct. That's correct. So and, and that's why, again, that's why we ask for the six months um, to, to have the opportunity to put that kind of plan in place. Um, I think the concern, I, I don't, Mr. Taylor, I, I, I don't necessarily oppose the idea of coming back with the plan. I, I have a little bit of fear that that may still be somewhat theoretical. Um, and, and Mr. Warden will incur an expense to go in and do the soundproofing now, come up with an overall plan, and let you determine if it's appropriate in six months. But I think that's a risk he's been willing to take. Um, and I, The risk he's been willing to take is operating a kennel without a permit for three years, Counselor. Well, I understand that. Um, Do you understand that? Uh, fully. And, okay. and when you talk about him having this extra expense, he has been operating a kennel for three years without a permit from this government. Right. I, under, I understand that. And all I'm saying in terms of the soundproofing is that I, I think it would be better for him to be able to come with concrete evidence to demonstrate that as opposed to simply a theoretical plan. That's all that I was saying. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, I, and I get that, and, we, and it may be for discussion. I just, and, uh, and my thinking is it's a much more expensive uh, proposition, um, and I might want to get the plan before I implemented it and then be told no, uh, potentially. Um, or, you know, so it, 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 again, it's, it's totally up to your client, but that was just my thinking, and it's not my necessarily decision in that regard to make, but. Okay, board I have members. a question I'd like Questions. to ask the owner, is if you should put soundproofing in the kennel itself, will you, or do you, have dogs outside at night? No. They're only outside during the day. Right. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, I haven't, I'll admit, I, I don't know that I'm familiar with all the terms of the uh, agreement that you uh, I thought you had reached or had reached with other neighbors, but uh, on on balance, are you are you willing to commit to you know certain hours of operation drop off, not operation, but drop off and pick up for, to address traffic concerns or uh, a, a limitation on the number of, of animals? I'll have to say first of all, I hadn't heard traffic until today. I'm sure think that there's actually a significant volume, but if, if you ask us to demonstrate that, I think it, we It is something that, that often comes up uh, with daycare, uh, not to compare anyone's children to anyone's dogs, <laughs> uh, but it can that, be that, is a common, that is a common thing that people will agree to. You know, we'll yeah. start, we'll only have drop off from starting at 7 a.m. and no pickup after 6 p.m. or something like that. Right. Are those things you're willing to consider? I know I'm out of time, but could I say something? Sure. My husband used all my talk time. Um, but, uh, and the Sharps, we are very, we've had a great relationship with, with our neighbors, um, no problem. And that's why we were really, un, uh, you know, kind of unsure what, what was going on other than the fact that all of a sudden, I mean, they have told Charlie in the past that we have no problem with the noise. We don't, it's not a problem. And we said, well, we're mindful of that and we want to make sure that it's not. And, and so, you know, and I might add that, you know, we've always, they have no, ha, never had any problem using our facility. They've used, okay. So, I mean, we understand that y'all have all gotten along really well, but now there is a problem and we're trying to address that. Right, I understand that. And we are not in opposition to even mo relocating the kennel if that be the case, if we need to do that. In the future, we just, that we need some time to do that. And so that six month, I think maybe might be why we asked hopefully for six months. We're not in opposition to moving if we have to. And if that's what we need to do, we just need okay. to do some, have some time. Okay. Any more questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. I'll start. This is, this, they have been running a kennel for three years without a permit. And, you know, now they're here trying to get a permit. The neighbors don't like the noise. I'm not sure how they were able to go three years without getting noticed, but, you know, now people know. 
And so I think that th that fact alone makes this case very difficult to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, you operate three years without a permit, you got the benefit, but you know, clearly, you know, there not there weren't complaints that that sparked the you know code saying, well, there's not a permit. You know, so I mean, there's a you know, I get it. Um, I mean, I, I, I asked the applicant. I, I tend to believe that, um, you know, giving them a month to come up with a plan. They come up with a plan. If the if if it if the neighbors if what you know, basically, they, they've said they would relocate if that if that's necessary. If this board um, feels that way, um, I, I, we haven't asked the neighbors if, uh, you know, if if a, a, a very short window of a permit. Uh, in order to give them time to relocate would be acceptable, but I think that's something that we could ask uh, as you know when they present a more comprehensive plan. But I think, uh, to me, giving you, know, you what, what you learn at a hearing like this is you you get kind of get full information. You know where all your neighbors stand. You know where where everything is. And and to me, it seems fair to allow the applicant to go back, regroup, uh, make a, either a more comprehensive plan uh, to us to address the specific concerns that the neighbors addressed, which I think are legitimate. Uh, or to develop a plan to, to, to relocate and ask for uh, a variance for that amount of time. Uh, the only problem with that is the lawyer for the applicant implied that a month was not long enough and six months was the... No, I'm, ta uh, I'm talking about a month to defer to develop a, a comprehensive plan to address the noise. Um, just to... Right. I mean, not, they, they see, I mean, you could admit all of that would be a proposal, not really soundproofing anything or doing anything. So I'm not sure. I mean, I could probably, I don't own a kennel. I could probably come up with 10 things that you could do to remedy it right now, but I'm not sure why they need a month even. What do others think? Uh, I, well, I would be willing to, uh, to offer uh, a variance with a two a two month variance to allow them uh, to come back and well in that meantime to negotiate with the neighbors as as they have done with the other neighbors and they thought they had had reached an uh, an agreeable position uh, to to have this conversation and, and to say this is what we're going to do and. We can hear from them again at the end of that two months if the opposition still thinks it's not possible or they don't they don't believe them or whatever. There's there's two months to plan the exit or I mean everybody will know in two months where the parties are and what's negotiable. Uh, I mean I you know I don't feel like that just I, I feel like giving six months might be might be a bit much <clears throat> and a lot of money will get spent and we could still vote it down and it, I don't know that that would be a good thing for anybody so that, that's that's kind of where I sit on all this and it would also allow we, we could also put uh, conditions on that two month to, to say there's a limited number of dogs in this period you know it gives them a chance to abide by that there's still dogs people can still see if the improvements are or if anything changes and they can make money to, to pay for these changes. Well, and, and I think you and I are kind of on the same page. I was saying deferral instead of the actual special exception, uh, just because of you know the neighbor's point of well, you know, if, if you grant it, then it's assumed that they've met the criteria and and that type of thing. And so, to me, I I, I wouldn't mind a deferral of some length. I, I, I just ask you know the legal counsel said that, you know it, it, us deferring it would. Uh, basically, keep it out of environmental court for that period of time, so so that they, you know, if they're if they are well, they, we know that they're operating without a permit, so they basically can continue to do that until we're not really giving them permission, but they're not going to uh, have the consequence for that until they come back to us. Is that fair? That, that, that is, but I, as a former prosecutor, I probably said it slightly different in that <laughs> that that we would probably want to prosecute probably rather than delay the, the prosecution. So it, to the extent that it keeps it out of environmental court, 
it delays prosecution, it delert, delays compliance. Why would a deferment by this board keep it out of environmental court when Be they've operated without a permit for three years? Because the attorney that was reviewing the matter for the Coast Department has specifically, apparently, as noted by the Coast Department, has specifically recommended that it not come to court until it came to this board first. If they got relief here at this board, then but they would not. But a deferment is not relief yet. Well, th that's, that's true, too. I guess from a legal standpoint, there would be nothing that would prevent it. But given the logic that the um, that the attorney that was reviewing the case had employed, that they wanted something done at this this board, either up or down, I guess is what was contemplated um, at the time that they had reviewed the initial case, that's what they had taken into consideration. So if you defer it, and if that logic still applies, then they would not have gotten relief from this board, and they perhaps would not be comfortable moving forward. So of course, if, I'm not the prosecutor. If, so. if, we, if we give a special exemption with, with any uh, expiration date, uh, when they would essentially be coming back to renew, mm -hmm. right? So where, where are we on, on notice and things like that? I mean, you know, I, I just said two months, but like essentially, there would have to be notice for that two months, would there not? Because we're not really continuing the case. If you gave a special exception permit today and conditioned it on two months so that they would have to come back and, and uh, reapply at the expiration of that two months, for that two months, as far as the environmental court case is concerned, they are in compliance with the law. Well, uh, okay, I, I'm, I know I'm down with that. I, I just mean okay. as far as notification for their yeah, office. that becomes kind of a staff item for us. The next if they filed an application tomorrow down at our offices, it would get them on the first meeting in August, which of course would be approximately two months out from today's hearing date. So two months is not really a problem. They're going to know instantly if, in fact, that is the motion that's that's made and passed by the board today that they want to come back at the end of two months. So they'll come right on down but, but less and make the application. Would not allow them to get on a docket. If we um, said 90 absent, days. Correct, unless the board treated it as some sort of a convoluted granting of a short special exception period and a mandatory return on XYZ date. I, I guess that, but uh, otherwise the matter would need to be properly noticed um, as a new case for a new special exception so that there's not an interruption of service between the two months granted in your scenario and whatever might come next. Does the board mind if I ask counsel for the applicant a question? Uh, Councillor, how long would they need to relocate? Well, they don't have uh, a site to relocate to at this time, so it's a little bit dependent. But in terms of, I, I think physical relocating is not that difficult. The issue is going to be identifying and securing another site. Yes, sir. But how long? I mean, have they looked already at relocating? They, they have looked, and, um, and they've looked at a couple of different sites because that was one of the alternatives that we discussed, um, and those were not successful. So I, I don't know. Do you, do you have other places currently? <clears throat> Not at this time, but we, uh, you know, we, we constantly are looking, trying to bring you to, you know, make everybody happy. Yeah, I think separate and apart from this process, he's considering that. Um, well, it's just hard without an identified site to know how, you know. I'm it, just wanting to discuss with the board the idea that we give them a deadline. Uh, if we were, well, let me, let me talk to the board. So I'm wondering if we grant the special exception for six months and tell them, you know, it's not good, you either move in six months or you work this out with the neighbors, come to us with what your terms are going to be with the understanding that you, that I, I just feel like that gives the neighbors some knowledge that either it's going to be corrected if it can be, or they've got to be gone, they got to shut down in that period of time, at least at that location. Uh, and I'll ask our, does that work? I mean, is that something we can do? I know we can't, or do we have the authority to say you have a six month special exception, period? Absolutely, you, um, under your general standards, uh, under 1716-140, uh, subsection J, it says, um, notwithstanding a finding by the Board of Zoning Appeals that a special exception application satisfies the minimum development standards of this article, the Board may restrict the hours of operation, establish permit expiration dates, require extraordinary setbacks, and impose other reasonable conditions as necessary to pr protect the pu public health, safety, and welfare. So certainly you can. And the other thing we could do as far as their permit is to require soundproofing and require limiting outdoor runs to certain hours and a certain number of dogs. 
definitely. Um, but what I'm thinking, but what I would think is, rather than require the soundproofing, you know, I'm trying to come to a place where they're not having to spend the additional funds, yet the neighbors know there is a foreseeable end to their problem. So either they soundproof and correct all of the problems, or they go 100% toward leaving the facility. And so I, rather than require, they must, in order to come in for a but renewal, they must have soundproofed and done all I mean, of those I things. I could be wrong, but the testimony that I heard today, I didn't hear that they were going to do 100% either one of those. I, man. Okay. That they, you just heard, they yeah, have Yeah, I think they what they want now the is to come back and say, we've and then, discovered some, here's some things we could do, and well, we don't know how much it'll cost. I mean, we, we can still grant a six months special exception and say, limited, you know, we'll give them the hours and you have to soundproof the building. And when you come back in six months, if you reapply for this, you know, it, if they move, they move. Right. It's done. But when they come back in six months, they will have had to renegotiate this with right. the other neighbors. And at that point we can decide. We're on record as to where we stand on this, how we're leaning. I don't think it's, it's a big throw of the dice for them. And I don't think soundproofing the building not unsympathetic, but it's not a huge expense. It's it's insulation. And you're asking for a special exception once again. Yeah. And we have to and look if, at and impact if they wanna, on if they the neighboring they properties. Move, if they think that they can move or that's what they're going to have to do, and it, or if they think the insulation is prohibitive, then they got to get serious about moving. I mean, I think that's I, reasonable. If you're gonna, if we're gonna do that, I, I would I would prefer a much shorter time frame, like three. I mean, if you if you say, you know, to come back and reevaluate whether or not you keep it or not. I think, I'm, it, I think it's more I'm of a, open on a the, two, on the time. You know, that's the two month was fine uh, to come up with a plan. Uh, I think you know if you're going to soundproof it uh, in three, you come back in three months and it's clear it's still a problem. Then you got you know maybe if if the neighbors and, and, and we all agree, then maybe you get a couple more months to to be able to move. But then that way, six truly six months from now, we're not saying well they need another three to move or whatever. I, I don't think that's fair to the to the neighbors. Um, but given the fact that, you know, the, the neighbors have put up with it for a long, long time, um, you know, they have good points. I, I agree with your point that they do need a clear end date uh, to whether it's truly fixed or the kennels relocated. Well, I, I think the window is two months to six months. It's six months is plenty, is, is, is the, is as far as I'm willing to ask the neighbors to put up with it. Mm -hmm. And I think two, two months is, is about as close as we can get functionally and legally to, to uh, make the process happen. Yeah, that was, that was good. Yeah, three or six is, is we're, we're right there. So, so we have a motion. So I'll, I'll move that we grant a special exception uh, that expires uh, in three months uh, from today uh, with the condition that the uh, sound insulation be installed in the building and uh, that the, uh, I'm gonna put a, parenthetical question mark when I say this and you cannot, that the uh, the dogs are only allowed outside uh, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and that uh, drop off and pick up by your customers be the same hour, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I will second that. Can, can we add that there are no more than 10 dogs outside at a time? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that amendment if you will. That's half of what he's saying. Yes, okay. yes I will accept okay. that amendment. That's, and that's dogs outside, not dogs on the facility. Right. No, I mean, yes. Right. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Right. And just, I, th I think it's clear, but and I think we all agree that this is uh, an effort to uh, allow this situation to resolve itself and has, is to me, my vote is with great respect for the, the points that the opposition made and is not any implication that this would uh, be acceptable going forward without, uh, without input uh, from the neighbors on the impact on the property. Okay, anything else from our counselor? No, sir. 
Okay. So, <laughs> so does this, not that it's relevant to us, but, you know, environmental <laughs> court, will they still look into this or Metro Legal? They will after the expiration of the six months. So, when, I'm sorry, of the three months. So, assuming that this uh, motion passes and they have a three month permit, environmental court will, won't review again until after this three month period. So, what I'm asking is they're just going to. No, do nothing about the three years this place operated without a permit? I, I guess technically we probably could go back and try to get maybe back fees, but I think the court would not be uh, favorable to us in trying to, to do it in that manner. They would look at uh, primarily environmental court is an in, uh, enforcement court for purposes of compliance. Okay. It's to bring properties into compliance currently with the law rather than try to seek some type of punitive um, okay. damage. Gotcha. So, and, yeah. and, and before we uh, officially vote and discu uh, discussion is over, I, I really hope both sides will get together and talk about this and uh, take good notes and keep the timeline so that when we're back here in six months, we're not arguing. Three months. I'm sorry, three months. Three months. When okay. the installation was installed, oh, good, we heard dogs, blah, blah, blah. Good advice. Okay. Any other questions before we vote? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be brought to the board is 2018-227. Okay. John, break. Which we will take up after a break. Uh, we'll reconvene in about five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. 27 yeah. More 27 more cases. And Mr. Chairman, as we're reconvening, we're going to note the next case to be called, as noted before the break, is 2018-227. If we could ask everyone to return to order, yes. feel free to take a seat if you wish. Don't feel obligated. Um, however, after case number 227, Mr. Chairman, at the request of board members, we will move down to case number 2018-267, which involves a property at 315 Interstate Drive. Because of the real... Uh, possibility, in fact, maybe likelihood that we lose quorum at some time tonight with our inordinately long docket, our record-setting docket. Um, we want to make sure that a couple of these cases that are actual zoning cases we get to hear. And we'll obviously do our best to get to every single case on the docket, question time, and the uh, entertainment immediately thereafter at tonight's meeting. However, we do want to make sure we get through the substantive zoning cases, if at all possible. So with that, a reminder to our audience here in attendance, if we lose quorum, meaning there are fewer than four board members present, the meeting ends by operation of law immediately. All cases that have not been heard at that point would be heard at the next BZA meeting, which is scheduled to take place on June the 21st. However, we will continue with our fast break approach to these cases so that we can hear all of them as humanly possible. With that, we'll jump in with case number 2018-227, Mr. Chairman, which involves a property located at 1506 Dallas Avenue, Council District number 18. Christina Smith is the appellant and owner of that property. It's a short-term rental case involving uh, denial, or rather, a failure to obtain the legally required permit before operation. We'll pull up a couple of photographs, and um, if the appellant would introduce self by name and address, please. Well, we're going to hear from Mr. Osborne first. Mr. Osborne, tell us about this case, how you heard about it. Uh, is there any non-permit violations and anything else we need to know? All right, so we found out about this one through host compliance. We sent a letter on March 4th um, on or around... April 9th to April 12th, it was removed. Looks like it's been operating since January 2017. Um, and it looks like there are about 45 reviews. One thing of note is it looks, appears to be using the garage, which isn't permitted to be used for living space. Okay, anything else to add? Um, it looks like this weekend is blocked, but other than that, it was a 30 day rental before that. Um, blocked uh, meaning rented? Potentially. We'll find out. Okay. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record, name and address, and um, we'll get started. Christy Smith, 1506 Dallas Avenue, mm -hmm. and owner of the property. Okay. Sole owner. Um, so let's just start with a weekend. Sure. So is this weekend being rented? No. I'm not really sure why it would show that. Okay. So My no. neighbor across the street does Airbnb, and she actually asked me to stay there since it's CMA Fest. And I said, sure, there's nobody in it. So <laughs> I'm not sure why I would show that. On, You're welcome to call her, Anna Forkham. She's okay. right across the street. Right. But you're not renting it. She's just a guest of your, your guest. She's one of my best friends. Okay. So, yeah, she's not paying me. She might cook. Okay, so 
Did you not know that we had an ordinance related to Sherman? I mean, how, how did we end up in this situation? Yes, right. So, no, I didn't. I received a letter. I Because I own the property, I wasn't aware that I had to get a special permit. I assumed that that was for people who, you know, didn't live on the property. There were people from, let's say, Seattle who had 20 Airbnbs here. Okay. You know, this is not my full-time career path. And... So how'd you, how'd you, you got a letter from Mr. I got Hoffman. a letter, um, I've got the timeline. So March 4th, I received the letter, uh, well, it was dated. I actually was in Israel and I returned late and um, actually opened my mail March 14th and discovered the letter. So immediately on the 15th, I actually reached out to um, a gentleman named Robert. Uh, I called and left a message with him and then also called Matt McBroom, left a message, um, did not hear back. Apparently they um, it had, a lot of calls coming in too. Called okay. again on the 20th. Um, so when you got the letter, did you cancel all your future? Yeah, well see, I, when I got the letter, I didn't, I was trying to reach out to somebody to find the process of what I needed to do. You know, what? what's okay. the process? How do I need to do this? And then after I actually spoke with Robert and talked to um, Mr. Herbert, I immediately got off the website. We got off the website and canceled the remaining people on the- And how many was that? Um, probably eight or nine, maybe. Okay. I mean, it's it's booked a lot. Sure. So. Okay. Questions of the board? No. Okay. Anything else to add? We're going to close public hearing discussion. Mr. Chairman, I believe we may have opposition present. Do we? We do. Oh, okay. We'll come, the opposition will come forward. Please introduce yourself by name and address. And Ms. Smith, if we could invite you to join the yes. audience oh, during the opposition's sure. commentary. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And speak into that microphone. That one will work. Thank you. Name and address and why you're in opposition. My name is Donald Donnelly. I live at 263 Belmont Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And my, I am within the 600 feet. And I do not know this young lady. Mm -hmm. she seems like a very nice young lady. but. Um, this is a neighborhood that over the years has faced many challenges. Mm -hmm. And the major concern for people in that neighborhood is try to preserve it as a residential area. And in simple terms, short-term rental to me is just another name for a motel. Uh, it's only differences in scale. It's no different than an extended stay facility that's advertised nationwide, except it doesn't have a sign. I think this photograph says it all. Uh, I don't know where you would park the cars. If you go down, I went down Dallas today to come to this meeting. Uh, there was a, a single spot within two blocks of this that wasn't occupied by parked cars. Um, that's the demand level. There's a meeting scheduled next week at Christ the King about concerns about trying to prevent traffic from ruining our neighborhood. Um, traffic generation for a typical single family home is about 10 trips per day. That's average ADT. Um, if you put 10 occupants in there with 10 vehicles, you're going to run a traffic level of approximately on average 200 trips. Uh, so that, um, I have a BRB next door to me. Um, the police have been there four times in the last three months due to noise. They have seven trash cans that cannot contain all the trash in it. Uh, it's not paying commercial property tax. So you and I and every member of this board and everyone in this audience is subsidizing their profit at our expense. Um, I think I've heard this board this afternoon discuss what I think is one of the most basic tenets of American democracy. Um, John Stuart Mill said it, your rights end where mine begin. And for neighborhoods like this, we do not need to have mass ARBs loading more traffic, creating additional costs to the public uh, which will ultimately cause this neighborhood to come to be commercial, not residential. Uh, and I, I respectfully ask that 
We stop it and we stop it now. Okay. Any questions for the opposition? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to hit rebuttal time. You could come back forward and respond to anything you heard. Sure, I understand as a neighbor, um, obviously where he's coming from, uh, the neighbors all are actually close to adjacent to a lot of our properties, our Airbnb. This neighborhood is, um, one of the reasons I moved there is because of the kind of eclectic nature of the neighborhood and the idea that people are free thinkers and open-minded in the neighborhood. And that withstanding, um, I feel like um, I respect him, but that also impedes upon my right to use my property in the way legally, um, which I'm trying to do, to uh, use my property as I see fit. I actually don't have any, I don't rent out my home. That is where I'm a single mom and I have two kids, and my 13 and 15 year old and I and our dogs reside there. The only property that's actually ever um, entered by the uh, folks that rent, and they're 99% of the time, um, married couples or they're, you know, a family who has a child at Belmont or Vanderbilt and they're, you know, we get a lot of those that come in to visit, the kids playing basketball. They, they're looking over an alternative to $550 at the Omni or $350 at the Hampton Inn. And they're looking for something local. They like the local feel. And I give them an opportunity to have a, a home-like stay and I, I'm very clear about the, my family living on residence. We don't have parties. I don't do bachelor, bachelorette. It is literally like you, you know, you and your significant other coming and spending the night. So I, I am not the problem. And I understand that many of these cases you hear are, but that is not me and I'm doing it respectfully okay. and trying to do it legally. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna close the public hearing. So discussion. I mean, th this feels like on the minor side um, in terms of, you know, not knowing and immediately stopping. Uh, it was, you know, there was an issue raised about uh, the garage or whether, whether or not it, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it's illegal use, but that'll, that's not, that, yeah, that's not our issue. It'll, it, that'll come out in the permitting process if that's the issue and uh, if that is indeed the issue. So, um, you know. Give us a motion. Um, I'll move the zoning administrator uh, did not err and that the applicant be allowed to um, apply for a permit until um, say two months after the last, uh, after the, the, the date that the, uh, the ad came down, which was April 9th. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I will second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? I just wanted to say to the opposition who took the time to come down here that um, the Board of Zoning Appeals cannot, um, I mean, STRP permits are allowed and we're only allowed to give a time penalty to someone who operated without a permit. We cannot really take away a permit and not allow um, Airbnbs to operate. That's not in our jurisdiction. Right, and the other thing, I used to live in District 18, the uh, Berkeley Island, the council aide from District 18, is the author of our short-term rental permit. And um, when I think of District 18, I think of the great kind of fighters for the neighborhoods of people like Fannie Mae Dees and Stuart Clifton and Betty Nixon. And there's just a great feel to the neighborhood. So thank you for coming and saying all that. So any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. So you can John. apply for a permit. Um, you night, but uh, you don't have a permit until you get the permit. So sure, John. and I've already taken care of the issue with the garage. I went immediately down and good. took care of that. Very um, good. Thanks. Thank you. John Thank you. Michael, let's um, take this next case as you were. Mr. Chairman, as noted, we're going to jump ahead to 2018-267 before returning to our regular docket. Forgive me as I peck through to try to get to item number 267. The appellant on that case is Mr. Matt Lackey on behalf of uh, Ray Dial and B.B. Patel, the owners of the property located at 315 Interstate Drive. This is in Council District number six, although that last little portion of six that comes across the interstate um, 
here in the downtown area. The request is for a special exception from sky plane encroachment in a core frame CF zoning district. Our members know there's not that much uh, CF zone property left in Nashville, let alone in downtown in particular, the only place it had ever been. But in this case, the request is for the special exception. Our zoning code requires a special exception rather than a variance in the event that there is a need for um, deviation from the bulk standards in 17.12.020, specifically table C, which is where you get into sky plane and um, height restrictions at the setback or at the boundary of a property. The um, zoning map here shows that it is in fact CF zone property right along Interstate Drive before you get onto those interstate ramps. The aerial photograph shows the property in I think pretty close to its current condition, face of the property here. From the area you get a sense of the proximity again to an existing hotel just to the north and the interstate system there to the immediate east. Um, the elevations, I think, submitted here give a good, clear indication of the limited portion of the building that would, in fact, get into the sky plane that's in question, shown by the diagonal line here put in place by the engineers. Um, the parties are represented both by legal counsel, Mr. White, and by the engineer, Mr. Lackey, who is the filing appellant on behalf of the owners. There is opposition present as well. As a result, both sides will have five minutes to make the desired presentations. Gentlemen, if you'll just introduce five yourselves by name address. Ten. I'm sorry, 10, ten I, forgive me for misspeaking. 10 minutes, please introduce yourselves accordingly. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. I represent the applicant in this case. To my left uh, is Matt Lackey of Reagan Smith. Uh, I'd like to ask for two minutes uh, for rebuttal at the tail end. Sure. Basically, uh, we are asking, as the staff has commented, about uh, a special exception for a sky plane encroachment. You've seen the elevation on top of you. The, uh, engineer Matt Lackey can address the de minimis application that's in front of you. Basically, we can go much higher than this without any approval necessary at all. This is for uh, an avoidance of the wedding cake appearance, if you will, across the face of the building. The engineer can address it. I think it's less than 3% of what the face is. Uh, but again, it's not the height of the building. It's this sky plane variance across the front. The law is relatively clear in this area that uh, if you meet the conditions, it's to be granted. Uh, and I'll mention at the front end, the general conditions that this board normally considers are, does it create any adverse impact on adjoining neighbors? Uh, and under the general vision, does it affect adjacent property owners' health, safety, and welfare? Uh, currently, my client owns the four-story hotel, which is right next door. They've been in operation there for, I think, 30 years uh, before the stadium was actually built. Um, but I would mention at the front end, I wanted to give appreciation to Councilman Brett Withers. Uh, we have started in this process in March of this year and probably four or five conversations with him directly. The engineers are Reagan Smith, who are directly across the interstate. They're totally conversant with the property and the project. Uh, Matt Lackey's been that contact from the very beginning. With respect to the approval process, I want to address that uh, it's the province of the BZA to grant the special exception. Uh, these special exception uses, as you know, legally are recognized by law. That is, special exceptions are items that the law says are recognized and preferred. You meet the conditions, which I've generally just read to you. Uh, but they're not variances. We're not talking about narrow, shallow topography conditions that you'll find under the Tennessee Code. Uh, these are items that the legislative body have said should be favorably looked at. With respect to the process, after discussing this on several occasions uh, with the councilman, as you're aware, your local rules require a notice to neighborhood uh, residents. We doubled that distance. Uh, instead of the 600, we went to 1,200 feet. And by coordination with the councilman, because that's what your rules require, this meeting was scheduled at May 30 here at the site at the councilman's request. The councilman's here. He can confirm what I'm telling to you. Uh, we had three people that showed up at the meeting. One was somebody who lived on the other side of town that just thought it was an interesting conversation, so their life must be very boring. Uh, number two, there was somebody that lived in the neighborhood who was there and said they were totally supportive. There was an individual, uh, Quinton, from the Sports Authority who came to the meeting because the property where the uh, stadium is right now doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the Sports Authority, not the, uh, the uh, football team. They came there, uh, several questions were raised. At the end of the meeting, that individual said he didn't see any problems with this. If there were, we might hear from him. We never heard anything. 
Uh, and again, the councilman's here that I think will confirm all this. And the councilman sent in a letter uh, seeking uh, the board's approval of this process, which was sent down, I think, Wednesday. But if it's not read by you already, it's there. Uh, with respect to what took place, I was in a hearing this morning. I got back to my office at uh, 11.30 or so, and I had a, a voice message from one of the attorneys for the Titans that said they had a concern about what we were proposing and they wanted to have a seat at the table as to what this building might look like. And I said, this is the first I've heard of this, but I will reach out to my clients. So I reached out to the owner of the property, Ray Nael, who's done a number of projects in town. I called Matt Lackey. We had absolutely no problem with assuring them that uh, although we'd initially met with MDHA because they've got to approve the elevations and design, that we had several more visits to make over there. We had absolutely no problem in committing to sit down with whoever from uh, the Titans, it wouldn't be a lawyer's issue, but they could have whoever they wanted to meet at Reagan Smith, talk it through. We had no reason why we couldn't make that commitment, and we did. And so I made that commitment, and basically the conversation was, didn't know if they would have any issue. They just wanted to make sure what was taking place. And I said, this was our first notice. We're on consent today. We'd love to say on consent, but we are opposed to a deferral because after that meeting on the 30th, we contacted the architects in Louisville and put them on full speed ahead to move forward. We'd heard nothing. They've been doing that for a week. We've since submitted initially to MDHA. MDHA was receptive, but said we had more meetings. We're willing to do that. We're willing to make that commitment. We don't want to defer. I'm making the public commitment that I'm asking the board to approve this today. We meet the conditions and that we clearly, clearly would meet with representatives from the Titans without any reserve whatsoever. We'd like to move forward. Brett, Matt. Uh, Matt Lackey, Reagan Smith, um, civil engineer for this project. Um, I just wanted to point out that Ray Dial, the uh, developer, has been a pillar of this community and invest, invested in this um, the community for about 30 years. He owns the Quality Inn that's immediately adjacent to Clarion. And uh, he's very focused on bringing a value-based, um, a more affordable product than the ones that are in the downtown core. And uh, it's been a focus. And this is a, the first project of a redevelopment within this area that's between the, um, the river and Interstate 24. We think it could be a spark for uh, future redevelopment. And this project is essentially a 206-room hotel proposed at 11 stories, um, 231 parking spaces, more than exceeds the, the code minimum required. And uh, as Mr. White mentioned, um, you know, from a design team, we just really don't want to stair-step the building. We could um, do that and basically raise the back part of the building an, an additional two floors, 23 feet, still be within um, and not have to s seek a skyplane uh, special exception. But, you know, it's actually more like 2% of the building by volume is extending over that skyplane. And... Um, we are seeking no variances nor any other special exceptions. The rest of the project will be to code. And um, as Mr. White mentioned, we, we met with MDHA. We received some feedback. Our architect is implementing those changes, but they had no uh, concerns with the sky plane encroachment. And or okay, any questions for the applicant? And we're over part. And, and, like I said, we are over part in terms of uh, sure. Okay. Okay, before we hear from the opposition, I want John Michael to kind of give us a brief education on the sky plane and that dotted diagonal line is basically under codes, the area that they're allowed to build in. So the little, and Mr. White mentioned the kind of wedding cake, which is basically stepping back and then going up and stepping back and then going up. So John Michael, tell us about sky plane and why the, we're here. The concept, Mr. Chairman, is you can only build so tall up at that setback line. Here at the left side of this picture, which would be the street side, Interstate Drive street side, you can only build so tall. Mr. Lackey's rendering here shows uh, how high that would be if you followed the appropriate um, slope height control plane, which in the core frame zoning district is one and a half to one. So that's the, the uh, representation you see there with that angle dotted line. So if you wish to go beyond that height at the setback line, that's what triggers the need for an exception. Normally we would think of these as variance cases. However, under the applicable table 1720 or 1712 020 uh, C, note six, since uh, 
anything in the urban zoning overlay district, which of course this is deep in downtown, via special exception uh, to the Board of Zoning Appeals under its parameters. And you've already heard some of the operative language. Anytime you hear about special exceptions, you hear the language about shall not create an adverse impact on adjacent properties nor detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. The general provisions uh, 17, 16, 150 of special exceptions, uh, among other things, highlights the importance of integrity to, integrity to adjacent areas with no compromise to the public health, safety, and welfare uh, in the area, nor adverse effect on other property in the area. Um, so that's how it gets to the board. The sky plane concern is one we don't run into as often. Typically, we just see height variances on projects. However, here, they're well within their height restrictions, except up to the street portion there. I think, as Mr. Lackey noted, it is approximately 2% by volume of the actual building that is in that which would otherwise be protected in the sky plane area. So okay. that's an overview, and I hope that helps. Thank you. Let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward, state your name, address for the record, and why you're opposed to this. Chairman, my name is Steve Underwood. I'm president and chief executive officer of Tennessee Titans and Nissan Stadium. I am accompanied by a council. I live at 1533 Fifth Avenue North here in Nashville. Uh, we originally asked Mr. White through our council for a deferral for a couple of weeks so that we could evaluate uh, the impact that this building was going to have on what is one of Nashville's premier public works uh, and our home. Um, he declined to give us the deferral, um, and I think until we have an opportunity, we got no notice <laughs> of the original hearing, uh, and uh, at least our organization wasn't provided with any. That is the home of the Titans. Everyone knows it. We never got a letter from anyone. Got no advance notice of anything. Uh, we would like the opportunity to evaluate it. I'm not sure that there's anything that poses any sort of adverse impact to us or to the 300 events that we host every year at the stadium, including and the 3 the million CMA people music who will go through that building. There could be uh, adverse consequences uh, from a security standpoint. We are heavily invested at our building in security. Building an 11-story building within a few hundred feet of our building and our parking lots could pose hazards. I don't know. <laughs> we have experts we could consult, and I think we could do that in a, in a big hurry. We are good neighbors to the people who are around us. We've always been. We don't have anything against the folks that want to build the hotel. We just want to, to have an opportunity to have enough time to take a look at it and make sure there's nothing wrong with it. And we appreciate your consideration of a deferral. Okay, we have the Sports Authority. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Monica Faulknesson. I live at 8241 Rossi Road. I am the Executive Director of the Metro Sports Authority, the property owners. Um, the Titans lease the property from us, and we have enjoyed a very, very good relationship with them over the last 20 years. And so I'm also here um, requesting a deferral so that we have ample time to, um, to evaluate. I also did not receive a notice. Um, my staff, Quentin Herring, did attend the meeting. We found out about the meeting the night before from the councilman, and so I was unable to attend, but he did He did come, but we just didn't have sufficient notice. Okay. Well, I guess you, but since the, I mean, but he knew at, at the meeting what was being proposed, and that's been at least a little bit of time, so has anybody talked about or looked at what was proposed since the meeting? So after after the meeting, I spoke with Quentin the next morning. I also spoke with our attorney, Margaret Darby, and then also um, have had some conversations or emails with the Titans, and they also wanted to explore and get additional information, um, and that's that's where we are now. Yeah, my, I mean, I guess a question, I guess, to whoever wants to, I mean, you, I'm not to put you on the spot, whoever wants to answer, but I mean, you know, the, the planning department you know, had recommended approval and, you know, it, it, again, that as long as MDHA had approved the design, which I think their uh, council had said they would be more than happy to have, you know, input from you and the neighbors, whoever uh, had offered that. But so I guess to me, it, it, do you need time to evaluate the impact of this 3% variance? I mean, it sounds like the concern is the hotel, the construction, what's going to happen, but yet all we're trying to evaluate today is the impact of the 3% extra massing and 
I'm not sure how, you know, help me understand why it's important to delay the decision over that little segment when the concerns seem to be about other aspects of the project. I think the answer to your question is we don't know because we haven't had time to evaluate. Just as you want time to evaluate things and the planning department wants time to evaluate things, we would like to have had some time to evaluate things. There was no reason why these people couldn't send us a letter saying, hey, we're gonna build an 11 story building a few hundred feet from you. Do you, are you okay with that? I don't know why we never got that. We wouldn't be, you wouldn't be asking that question and I wouldn't be answering it if we had gotten some notice. Other questions for the opposition? I actually have a few things that sure. I'd like to say too <laughs> as well. Um, good afternoon, my name is Erica Garrison. I'm here uh, as the legal counsel for the Titans and I wanted to say that we res we respect and appreciate Mr. White and his you know client and their presentation and we absolutely want to work with him and kind of move forward to try to see if we could build consensus and, and support this project but we simply do request the two week deferral. Um, we think that two weeks will give us ample time potentially to review the standards under 17.12 and the standards under 17.16.140 to determine whether or not they have satisfied those standards. As we look at the application, we have concerns with regards to the traffic impact in the general standards and the integrity of the adjacent area. If you look at the language in terms of the integrity of the adjacent area, it specifically says it will not adversely in affect other property in the area to the extent it will impair the reasonable long-term use of those properties. And we would be concerned, you know, as the Titans have had a great and long relationship with the city, we would be concerned that we make sure that this doesn't impact their long-term use of the property so, and so the traffic as well. It, so help me understand, because you're asking for a deferral, and, and, it's, uh, and, and I think it may be a fair request, but at the same time, uh, how would you go about evaluating, because, you know, I mean, as they've testified, they can build in the right side triangle much higher and much denser and actually probably had make a much bigger project without ever coming to us, you know, or even having to inform you that that's what they're gonna do because they have a right by code to do it. So how would you go about evaluating the ma how the, the impact of the mass? I mean, again, you, you talked about adverse impact in terms of, of size and traffic, but this is about massing. This isn't about traffic. And, and so this is about massing in a way that Again, they, they've said we would prefer to have it this way, but you know, we could just go up two more stories and put it in that triangle and you know, maybe it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's just a whole different design, but I guess that's. Well, and, and respectfully, I understand that. However, the standards for the special exception, there are general standards that they have to satisfy in addition to the impact on the pedestrian environment and the light and the air. There are general standards in Title 17.16.140, and so I, w I would, advocate that as we're looking at this particular special exception, even though it is a 2% increase, you still have to answer those questions in the affirmative and they bear the burden of proof for that. And I've yet to see that in the application in terms but of whether or not that standard can be satisfied. I'm gonna ask our not attorney- asking for any variances other than the Scott plane. Yeah, and let me ask our attorney if you don't mind. I think those are um, special um, conditions uh, regarding use, not regarding um, height you know, sky plane encroachment. Well, it, it, the table that references this, references this as a special exception doesn't make a distinction. So I think you still have to meet the general standards that you would normally have to meet for any special exception as um, authorized under your, your code. Um, does that answer your question? I, I think, well, I, me, I, I see let, why. Let me ask another one. the question as to why this is a special exception. Let, yeah, let me ask you another variance, one. If they, built, if they built within that triangle, would it be still a special exception to build that hotel? No, not under the code. Okay, that's, you know. And the rules require notice to the landowner, and that occurred, right? I'll have to That's correct. That. We received the certified, the letters that went out to property owners. Um, uh, family that lives in an apartment in Antioch would not get notice of sure. a case like this. The conglomerate that owned it would get notice of a case like this. But that came to the sports authority, correct? That's why that gentleman attended the meeting? He attended the meeting because he was informed about it from the councilman. Oh, I see. He, but he was on notice, so eight or nine days ago for that meeting. He attended the meeting, but we did not receive a letter. 
So I mean, the sports authority owns the property? Yes, sir. And, and it's leased and the to the Tennessee Titans. Titans. <laughs> okay. That's correct. Any other questions for the and, opposition? Well, I'm just, you know, what discussions have been had absent the request for a deferral? I mean, have you sat down and talked about how this is going to impact the Titans, assuming that, you know, we're, we're, we're a party here? I'll let you answer that. We've had internal discussions about it, but those have revolved around hiring experts to evaluate the application and see what impact it has on us. There has been a weekend and three business days since the original hearing, of which we have received no notice. And I believe your facilities directors need to review it as well. Yes, we, we, we have a staff of experts of our own, but I would prefer that they hire outside consultants, particularly for the security requirements. Uh, we have a 30-year uh, Nashville police lieutenant on staff, but I doubt that he has that kind of uh, particularized expertise with respect to the height of buildings around areas of mass gathering. But there are people who are experts about that. And if we get the deferral, we're going to have them do an evaluation. And two weeks is sufficient? Oh, yes, I think so. I don't, we're not interested in holding them up any longer than is necessary. But it is something new for us. Um, we didn't have any forewarning. Um, I'm not sure why we didn't have any, but that's uh, neither here nor there at this point. I mean, I don't think you're entitled to, I mean, you're not the owner, so I don't think you're entitled to notice. I'm more concerned why the owner didn't have uh, notice, uh, but there was certainly knowledge at some point. So that, that answers my question. Any other questions for the opposition? Do you have anything else to add? No. Okay, thank you. We're gonna hear from the applicant. This is rebuttal time, so you are here to This should be a fairly easy rebuttal. Respond to what you just heard. I'll be, I'll be very brief. First of all, when we first started with the councilman in March, there was publicity uh, by the Nashville scene. There was publicity, it was front page, some of the publications about what our request was. The councilman's here. The councilman contacted the sports authority because he knew people there and he wanted to make sure they knew they were aware of the meeting. We also contacted them, period. It may not have been in a written format, but they got it. They attended the meeting. The comment at the meeting was, as I said, we don't see any reason why there'd be a problem. If so, we would let you know. We never heard anything until an hour before this meeting today. With respect to the impact, 98% of that building can be built. It's not a zone change, period. 98% just like it is. And so we're trying to do something more aesthetically pleasing and we're making every commitment we'll sit down with them uh, without any reservation. And at the end of the day, I also want to comment that we've said that repeatedly from 12 o'clock until now, we can still continue to say it. Uh, with respect to the requirements, as I said, it's not height. We can go, they're talking about the height, what it looks like, pedestrian. We can go two stories higher. We can add more rooms without even being here. We're trying to do the right thing aesthetically. Uh, and the MDHA makes the final decision. So they clearly have got a presence in this city. They can be there. If we didn't want them there, they would be there. But we're asking them to be there. With respect to the arguments about massing and traffic and everything, that's just totally illusory. When we can go two stories higher, have more rooms, we've been there for 30 years, same owners. So I respectfully ask that it be approved today with the total commitment by us to sit down with any experts they've got before we get any final approval at MDHA. Mr. White, can I just ask you, just as a practical matter, is construction underway? Construction has not started. Construction has not started. What we did was, as I said, after the May 30 meeting with the green light on, the Louisville architects had been aggressively after us. We've been delaying them since March. We contacted them the next day and said go, and they started churning immediately, and that's where we are. And I'm not, I'm very, I build with Legos. So if you were to start construction tomorrow and we had a two week deferral, would you be even close to the point where the special exception came into play if we wanted to wait two weeks? I can't honestly answer, no, I can't say that. I can just say that, as you know, a lot of you are professionally trained in those areas. You don't want to turn an architect loose and say, and by the way, we don't know what we're doing about the sky plane at the top. You just don't do things like that. But again, 
But so, technically, you don't know what you're doing with the sky plane until we approve it, if we do approve it. That's that's correct. And, and I am an architect, so. Yes. I, I, I was speaking to your profession. As I said, we're, we're basically at a point where we can do 98% of this without anybody's approval, and at the end of the day, higher, less pedestrian impact, et cetera. So, again, there's no reason why we shouldn't move forward today in light of the fact that MDHA has got to approve the final design, which we're going to do. So I urge it to approve it today. There's no ill feelings here. I'm sorry they felt like they were left out of the mix, but we contacted the sports authority and they were at the meeting and we, so we moved forward in good faith. At the beginning, you mentioned that you, you doubled the size of the notice uh, area that you sent out. Who who did receive the notice for the, the address of the stadium? Well, I can't speak to who received it. I can speak to... We well, to whom was it mailed? The 21 or 22 people that were in the 1,200 foot radius. I don't have that list in front of me. Mr. But Harper, staff assists with the preparation of the mailing lists. We have a simple tool that's been put together by the planning mapping division, and that tool allows us to mark 1,200 foot radius, all properties within that radius, owners of that property, and there's your Excel spreadsheet, just like that. So, so those are the ones that would have been mail, mailed right? notices. That's right. So, and the property owner is? The, it's Sports actually authority. mailed by Metro. It's brought back to Metro and sent by mail, not certified mail. We, we, br we bring the mail postmarked back to Metro. Metro mails it. We do not. We, we made the request <clears throat> in light of the councilman's concern of how few people are really impacted by this. We asked the councilman, how far should we go out? He said, double the area. We went beyond that. We came and sat down here with John Michael, got a map out and said, go beyond that area. And they did. We gave them the notices. They sent them out. How so, about your, uh, uh -huh. well, so you you can't say that the sports authority did receive notice, but via mail. No appellant before the board today can say who received what mail was sent. Only that the mail was prepared and sent. Can someone tell me that there was a letter addressed to the sports authority? That is information that is available to us in staff's offices if we needed to stop the hearing and go back and fetch documents from staff's offices I mean, with regard whole, to that question. The whole, the whole opposition is based on we didn't get notice, and why can't anybody answer if they were noticed or not? They were clearly informed because they were I'm, at the I'm meeting. asking about the, the required mailing that is required on all these cases. Can someone show to me? To answer your question, we can answer that. We will stop. We will go to another office and produce the mailing list to determine whether or not that was prepared. So we can't answer that. Mr. White, you all prepared this list of people that got notice, right? No, you? we took it from the staff. Okay. We sat down with the staff. Of note, Mr. Chairman, and to Mr. Harper's question, there is the red sign issue as well. The sign stood on the property for a minimum of 21 days next door to what has been repeatedly described as the home of the Titans today. Thanks. And the councilman can testify from the very beginning. He told us the sports authority was a critical entity. He knew who they were. He was going to reach out to them, and he did. He'll testify to that. The sign went up, we any took other? the mailing list at beyond the normal distance at the direction of the councilman, went beyond what he asked. Okay. Uh, but as you know, it gets mailed out by the staff. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I do want to make the last comment. Oh, see. Okay. Absolutely, totally no downside to the Titans organization by this board acting on a special exception understanding that MDHA has got to approve the very design issue they're talking about. That's the only thing they're talking about is design. They can't talk about masking, they can't talk about traffic, pedestrian friendly. It's only that 2% up there, and they've got a seat at the table. So I respect the Titans, they're a great asset to the city, but I think the board should clearly approve this, uh, and I'll make the commitment again. We'll okay. meet with them repeatedly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Board members. Um, how about the council person? Oh, yeah. do you wanna speak again? I haven't spoken on this one yet, but, okay. I, but I will yes. for a little bit. Um, I'm, for the viewing audience, I'm uh, Councilmember Britt Withers, Representative District 6, which does include this property. Um, I was uh, notified about this uh, potential opportunity uh, several months ago, actually by Mr. Charles Starks from the Convention Center, uh, Music City Center, um, and have had uh, periodic 
conversations with Ms. Falknetson from the Sports Authority. Um, so I, I hope that it's been on the radar screen, certainly for the Sports Authority, even though the um, actual details of the plan may not have been known or the uh, community meeting. I, I know I have had um, made efforts to conduct outreach um, myself, um, I'm a little perplexed as to why we got to this point today, and and it's really unfortunate to me that the Titans feel as though that they weren't notified. I'm, I've worked really hard to have the opposite outcome of that, uh, and have been a big advocate for having them uh, be um, consulted even prior to our community meeting, which took place um, May 30th last week. So um, I, I do apologize that despite uh, efforts of a lot of folks and a lot of different um, means that that, that that they don't feel like they were properly notified. Um, what I would say is that uh, we did have a community meeting about a week ago. Um, even within my larger District 6 uh, community, which is often averse to development sometimes, um, this item has not generated any constituent calls or emails. Um, I made an announcement about the community meeting during my council announcements period, and it's been on social media and things like that. This is not within a typical neighborhood group, um, which are on the other side of the interstate, which is one of the reasons why I asked to increase the notice mailing distance. So for me, it's really, I mean, unfortunate that the, that the Titans don't feel that they were notified, and I want to make sure that we uh, rectify that uh, going forward. However, with this, this project, the architect really can't begin a lot of work uh, to continue this project until they know what this, whether the sky plane is granted. And so for that reason, you know, hearing that I, I'm not hearing objections that would be, um, that would really be changed uh, if, if, if the sky plane variants were not granted for whatever reason, a taller building could still be built. So in terms of the other conditions that are referenced, I'm just not finding that those factors would be uh, mitigated. And in fact, if, if there is a, a concern about building a tall building somewhat close to the stadium, although albeit at a distance, um, the, the property owners could build an even taller building within that uh, area anyway. So I feel that's a, I understand that concern, but it's, at the same time, it's a little bit of a moot point. Um, and I do feel as though um, if, if a deferral happened that we would come back in uh, two weeks uh, and be before y'all again, really still talking about a de minimis uh, change to the um, building massing, and I'm not sure what would change about that specifically. So I would be in favor of moving forward today. However, now that we are uh, all in communication, uh, I will make sure that the Titans uh, do have an opportunity to speak with the architect, uh, particularly as they would move forward uh, for their final discussion period with the MDHA Design Review Committee for the East Bank Redevelopment District. I will also commit to making sure that those are, that those conversations take place. However, um, the architect team, the master architect team is, is waiting on a decision um, for the sky plane variance as to how the building will be shaped. Uh, and for that reason, I, I'm in favor of going ahead and moving it forward today. Okay, any questions for Councilman Withers? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, board members, the red flag has been thrown. This is under review, as they say in the NFL. So, what do we think? Well, while I appreciate what the Titans do for our city, very much so, um, we do understand clearly that the Sports Authority owns that property, and if any owner is going to get notice, it would be the Sports Authority. And by Councilman Withers stating that he announced this at his public announcement time, to me, that is notice, and that this is not something that was done in the dark. So I don't really see a reason for us to have a continuance or a deferral. So you want to, oh. No, I mean, and, you know, the, in, in general, if someone asks for, you know, a, a deferral, it's not an unreasonable request. And, and I do, um, I do understand that, but, you know, Sky plane variances are are just relatively minor, and and the issues were more about the broader and and and, and maybe it's because they're asking for a special exception instead of a variance and on sky plane, and I'm not sure why that's the case. I mean, if it's a variance, I think it it would it would absolutely be a no-brainer because some of the other issues wouldn't be talked about. But 
that, that's just what I, I'm having a struggle with and what we talked about. So, you know, it, it doesn't feel completely unreasonable, but at the same time, I just, I think we would be at the same outcome. I don't, I, I couldn't get a line of, uh, my mind around a, a line of argument or, or concern that would impact the specific variance they're, they're requesting. So I, I, I don't know. I think it's a special exception in the zoning code because you don't need to prove a hardship and you only need to meet the two conditions. Um, our director of codes can tell us better, speak more uh, f better about it than I can. But. Well, that's right. So a special exception by law is a use that is permitted by right, assuming that you prove to the board satisfactorily that you meet the conditions, both the special and the general conditions. Okay, for what it's worth, I think that uh, we serve to ensure that our citizens have due process. I think that was met in this case. I think the owner of the property had sufficient notice, and I regret that there was not a different kind of communication, but given that we have statements from Mr. Withers, uh, who we know to be a man of integrity, same thing with Mr. White, I would make a motion, if y'all want to entertain it, that we grant the special exception with the condition that Mr. White meet with the uh, appropriate parties, uh, as he has assured us that he would do, and we go forward. And that any design is MDHA approved, which I think it has yes, to be. Yes, it has yes. to be. Okay, right. so motion has been made. Is there a second? I will second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any final discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Mr. Chairman, should it please the board, we'll re return to our normally scheduled order of cases, which will take us back to 2018-229, involving the property at 905 Mansfield Street in Council District Number 5, the other side of East Nashville. Council Member Scott Davis was unable to stay for the duration of the meeting, as is the case for so many, but did wish to have staff express his support for the appeal, filed by Jeannie Rowe, an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit and um, denial of the permit based upon prior operation before obtaining the legally required required permit. The appellant will come forward, be prepared to introduce yourself by name and address. After we hear from staff, you'll have the opportunity to make your presentation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 229? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation involving the property shown here on the zoning map, here on the aerial map, and then the face of the property from the assessor's website. Mr. Osborne has this case for staff, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Osborne, tell us about this property, what you know, any non-permit violations, and how'd you hear about it? So what I know about this one is it roughly started operating back in August of 2017. A permit application was generated in October of 2017, um, and it looks like the appeal was filed on April 9th of 2018. Uh, roughly 26 reviews, no complaints, we didn't know about it. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, thank you. Please state your name, address for the record, and why we're here. Good afternoon. My name is Corley Roberts, and I'm here uh, on account of uh, Jeannie Rowe, um, who lives at 905 uh, Mansfield um, Street in Nashville. Um, as was just stated, she, um, she rented uh, an air, she tried out an Airbnb during the eclipse uh, in August of 2017 to see how it would work, and then she started the process of applying for a permit in September, uh, and then filed it on October 6th, um, where she had thought she passed um, all the the process of the permit to find out um, in on April 9th uh, while updating her Airbnb page that she had not completed it. Uh, with the exception of submitting a video um, for the fire marshal. Um, after she realized her oversight, she uh, went right down to codes um, and sent the video in and completed, um, uh, continued to complete the process. Um, the reason uh, for her oversight um, is uh, part of a, a medical condition illness that she was diagnosed with in February of 2017. Uh, that has uh, Jeannie in and out of the, um, the doctors and on various uh, trials and medication. And unfortunately, at times, she does uh, lapse in memory and some functional disability. 
um, throughout okay. this. However, she... Okay, she, and we have a letter from, I guess, her doctor. Yes, you have a packet there. Stating this, basically. You also have a letter of uh, support recommendation from her neighbor um, in that packet as well. When she was uh, operating at Airbnb, she received uh, five-star reviews and really added to the neighborhood. And uh, doing this is a, um, is a way that she can feel productive and part of the community uh, and have that social interaction in the presence of her medical mm -hmm. condition. And we also know, as John Michael pointed out, their councilman for this district, Scott Davis, District 5, if he were here, as he always says, he is for his constituents. And if you come here, he's going to be here for you 100%. So we could assume that if he could stay, he would be selling, um, saying good things about you and why we should approve it. So continue. Um, I actually did speak with Scott earlier, and he did, uh, I think, talk with the gentleman there and express his support uh, for Jeannie to be able to resume her uh, rental on Airbnb. Um, she has, uh, as soon as she had found out April 9th, she took down her site and mm -hmm. uh, didn't continue to rent at so all. So she had completed every part of the application process, but the final fire marshal yes. kind of part. Yes. I Please identify yourself for the record, press the button so we could all hear you. I'm Jeannie Rowe. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, um, mm -hmm. I had the, the fire marshal come right after I applied for mm -hmm. the permit um, in October, mm -hmm. and one detector was not working, so she said if I just videoed her, if I just videoed the detector, mm -hmm and sent it to her, then I was clear with everything. Right. So my house is um, is a new house. Okay. So the builder fixed it. I just forgot to send her the video. Okay, so and everything else had been done but that. So on October 9th, I, I realized that I had not done it. So I sent her the video and she said that I had passed, but she's the one that told me, but it looks like you didn't you know, you're, you're past your time. The 90 days. You have and 90 I days to get everything done. I just completely okay. forgot. So that day yep. I went down there. Gotcha. So she's the one that told me. Okay. Questions from board members? Sorry. What was the last day that, what was the last day that the house was rented? That day. Well, actually it was a couple, di di couple April of days. April 9th? Well, I, I took it down that day. So the, the people that left a few days before that. Um, she said April 9th? Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Kind of close the public hearing discussion. So I'll start. We have a letter from a medical doctor, and I think that's the first here. And basically talking about a particular condition related to what she had said. So to me, that that and that she took it down immediately and was attempting to actually apply, um, this is one of our lesser cases. So, um, if we want a motion, I move that the zoning administrator did not err on case 229, um, and that the applicant shall be eligible for a, to apply for a permit two months after April 9th. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes. So you will be eligible to apply for a permit, Thank basically. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. So apply, We're, we don't give permits, okay. codes gives permits, so you have Thank to still you. follow. <laughs> yes. Thank you. John Michael. The next case, Mr. Chairman, is 2018-231. Gina Mandelo is the appellant, known to the property at 3114 Kinross Avenue, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial. Um, it's an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit. Uh, prior operation before obtaining the permit was the issue. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 231? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Hello, my name is Gina Mandello. I live at 3114 Kinross Avenue in Nashville. And um, do, yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Osborne, let's um, hear about this property. How'd you hear about it? Any non-codes, non-permit violations? 
So a letter was sent on October 27th of 2017. Um, okay, Mr. Osborne, you're the enforcer. You could speak a little louder than that. Yes, so we sent a letter through host compliance on October 27th, 2017. Um, listing was removed right around Christmas time, approximately 37 reviews. It was reposted as a monthly rental in mid-April. Um, looks like they filed their appeal about that same time. Um, one thing that I've come across is it looks like the calendar has a couple, like a week blocked off in June and a week blocked off in July, so not sure how that's... Is the June that happen to be this week? Um, that one doesn't appear to be eligible. Uh, the first time that you can select a date was June 15th. And July? When is July? Does that happen to be the week of the 4th? Uh, July 10th to 15th. Oh, okay. Well, okay, let's go. Any questions for Mr. Osmond? Okay. So um, let's address what he just. For, so it says it looks like apparently you could still rent. Uh, it's it's blocked for personal personal guests. I, I'm not renting it. I, I was told I can only put 30 days or longer. Okay. So you have friends. Are they paying you? No. No, they're friends. They're okay. people coming in for holidays and stuff gotcha. like that. So how do we end up here? How you didn't have a permit? Why not? <laughs> okay. Well. I, when I decided to do this, um, I asked a friend of mine who I now know doesn't know what he's talking about. I said, what do I have to do? And he's like, well, you know, you don't have to get a permit if it's only one room. You only have to do it if it's the whole house. And I'm like, okay, great. And I didn't think much more about it. Um, when I went to the Airbnb site, they don't really ask you about permits like... I would think there would be like, please insert your permit number here, and if you don't, we can't grant you this. I mean, Consult nothing. Consult your city <laughs> laws. Hmm? Consult your city laws. They don't do that. Yeah, and I didn't, and, I, and I'll admit to not doing that. I took someone else's word for it, and my intention was to only have one room, and I, I had, you know, I, I paid my taxes on it. I, I talked to my accountant. So you went through all, you paid your taxes and did all that? Yeah. I, I paid the tax and everything. I just, I was, I was under the false impression. So sadly. what did you say to this friend of yours once you found out or got a letter from Mr. Osborne over there? Well, I said, I said, why, why did you tell me that? He goes, well, that's what I thought, you know. And it's like, <laughs> great, you know. And I'm, like I said, I'm not someone who doesn't comply with laws. I'm not someone who does things inefficiently. I made a mistake in that regard that I took someone's word for something who I thought knew this kind of thing. And, you know, I in, um, I do travel for a living and have a property in Florida, so I spend a lot of time there. When I got the notification, I immediately just said, all right, we'll shut it down. And it um, took a while for me to get through the process of coming here, but just because of my work schedule. But, you know, I do, I have, I have people visiting me that are friends. I, I have a, a big international, you know, friendship ring of people who come and visit. And um, fortunately, you know, I haven't, I haven't had to, you know, really need the space, but now I would really like to. I've had some financial setbacks and I'd really like to have the space back again. And I, you know, I will promise to comply with everything. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who doesn't. And I really regret the, the okay. ignorance that I had in the beginning. I seriously do. Sure, okay. Questions for the applicant? Yeah. Anything else to add? No. So thanks. We're going to close public hearing discussion. Want to get started? Typical case. Seemed like she stopped. Um, ads came down in December. Is that right? And it's been a while. Is that? What, Mr. Osborne, when did the ads come down? Is it sometime in December? I believe it is around uh, December 23rd. Okay. And you don't have evidence of renting after that until the, they advertise this monthly? Over 30 days. Yeah. Let me double check. No, sir. All right. Okay. Well, it, and based on based on time since last rental, then to me, I think that it's, it, even if it's in the lower to mid range, then it's Make time served. So I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err, and that the applicant did rent prior to obtaining a legal permit, uh, based on the time from the last 
known rental, the, which has been more than five months, the applicant is eligible uh, to apply for a permit immediately. Okay, motion's, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. You're eligible to apply. Please follow all our laws. Absolutely. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-233 involving the property at 1927A Castleman oh, Drive yes, in course. Council District Number 25. Zarni Duet Kramer is the appellant and owner of that property. It challenges uh, an item A case. Sorry? Oh, yes. Uh, if we can take that one next, please. Yes. Um, the appellant um, operated before obtaining the legally required short-term rental permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 233? There is. As a result, both party, both sides will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentations. You'll hear from Mr. Osborne first, then we'll hear from the appellant. Mr. Osborne, how'd you hear about this case? Give us any information that we need and uh, how many times did they rent? Looks like we uh, found out about this one through host compliance. We sent a letter on April 3rd. Um, looks like the advertisement was removed around April 12th. 12 reviews. Uh, to my knowledge, there weren't uh, any complaints on this one. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay. Please identify yourself for the record, your name, address, and why you rented without a permit. Good afternoon, my name is Zarni DeVitt Kramer and I'm at 1927 A Castleman Drive. And uh, I, um, <clears throat> we uh, opened this listing a couple months back in November to help us uh, pay off our, our mountain of student loan debt that <laughs> we currently have and we have some space in the house so we just wanted to use some extra income and this is my home, yeah, we, we reside in there and we plan on having kids there, living there for as long as we can, basically, and so. Do you, stay, do you stay in your home when you have guests? Yes, yeah. So we have two rooms. Um, we try to not operate them at the same time. It just gets to be a bit full, but. Um, so we, uh, when I was making the listing, I, you know, I have to be honest, I was also ignorant. I wasn't aware that we needed a permit for a owner-occupied rental. And I did a lot of research, obviously not in the right area, and I'm regretful about this because I'm not trying to be unlawful. We want to do it the right way, and we want to fix it as soon as we can. So um, we've, uh, we haven't had any complaints. We've kept it really quiet, and the neighbors weren't aware that we were running Airbnb until the notifications went out. We haven't had any noise disturbances or parking problems. We keep it, we pretty much have parents of Lipscomb students, so it's a pretty peaceful, quiet little operation, but I apologize. It's a, it's a very <laughs> irresponsible, it's easy to find too, unfortunately. I can't even lie and say, oh, it's hard to find because it, it is easy to find, but it was just an oversight. Okay. Um, any questions from the board before we hear from the opposition? We do have three letters of opposition in the packet, board members. Um, anything else to add before we hear from the opposition? No. Okay, let's hear from the opposition. Please go back in the audience. Please identify yourself by name and address for the record. Do I need to see this? Oh, sure. Okay, so the position reads, we strongly oppose short-term rental permits be allowed in our residential neighborhood and request that you would deny the appeal of permit 1927A Castleman Drive. And it appears to be signed by about 22, 23 people. Okay, please start. Uh, my name is Don Thielman. I reside at 4311 Lone Oak Road. Uh, I'm here representing, it's actually 28 households. Those are individual households in the immediate vicinity, the uh, uh, radius that, that you all use, uh, that strongly oppose the short-term rental that had been operating illegally and request that you deny the appeal for uh, permit, okay. please. So as you know, or you may not know, we, we hear lots of people in opposition of short-term rentals just in general globally, but we are here to determine whether this particular case should get a permit or not. So do you have any, um, it, any direction of why you oppose this particular person getting a permit? Uh, I guess the, the strength of our argument would be about 90% of the residents in that area, as you read the, uh, the language on there, strongly oppose it. And I would like to think that that, that carries some weight 
a lot of weight in, uh, as far as your determination. Okay. Uh, any questions for the opposition? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. This is a rebuttal time. So 28 people in your neighborhood signed a petition saying they don't want you to have a permit, too. You care to respond? Um, I understand that Green Hills is a very treasured neighborhood. That's why we moved there. It's quiet, and there are people that have been there for years, and I certainly respect their opinion and empathize with the fact that there's a ton of construction. There's a lot of change happening in the neighborhood now, and I can imagine if I had lived there as long as some of them have, I would also not like all the changes, including a lot of the short-term rentals that are moving in. Um, as far as our part, like I said, we've done a good job to keep it quiet. We get singles, couples, you know, people that aren't there to party. They're there for either to visit their kids or to travel for work. And so we can do our best to just make sure that the neighborhood doesn't even know that we have guests. Before we did Airbnb, we had more visitors that were family than we had guests. So we can just vow to keep it clean on our end and make sure that the neighborhood is never disturbed. Okay, I want to read part of one of the opposition letters from the lawyer, Amanda Gentry. She says, being born and raised in Nashville, I consider my history here with great pride. On top of the rules being broken, another thing that bothers me is they're trying to use the house as a source of income when they are not even living in the neighborhood. If you want to make a living in Nashville, live here. Be a part of the community that you are earning from. Give back to your community, don't just take from it. Do you not live in this house when you rent it out? No, I absolutely do, and I, I have proof of residence. It's our only residence. I'm a full-time songwriter here. I have to live here in town. To but be when you family. rent out the house, are you in the house yes. when there are people absolutely. from wherever are coming? Absolutely. We're not comfortable having people in our house without us knowing what they're doing. Okay. Any questions for the board? Anything else to add? No, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Close public hearing. Discussion. Am I allowed to make another comment? No. It was, that was... You know, you had rebuttal. I mean, you had opposition and then um, rebuttal. So that's it. Discussion. Well, I think once again, it's a situation where the neighborhood is opposed to this type of land use, but the council has approved it, uh, and it's it's here to stay. So really, what's before us is determining whether the zoning administrator erred, and if not, uh, are we willing to give this person an opportunity to? reapply for her short-term rental permit. In that context, I think it's similar to ones we have heard. She did what she was supposed to do at the time she received the notification, uh, and I would move that she be able to reapply four months after the date she applied, which was April 11th. Okay, motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Eligible in four months from, was it April? April. Yep. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, at the board's request, we're moving case 2018-247 to the top of the docket. If you will forgive my frankness, because the appellant's due date will not allow her to be here at our next board meeting, and therefore we cannot let this board meeting end, even in the absence of quorum, until we've heard that case. Case 2018-247 is another short-term rental case involving Jessica Medley, the appellant and owner of the property at 4542 South Trace Boulevard, shown here on the zoning map, here on the aerial map, and here at the face of the property in Council District Number 11. Uh, the permit it was uh, denied upon application based upon prior operation. Mr. Osborne has this case, and in just a moment, he'll be able to address the board with regard to the case at 4542 South Trace Boulevard. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 247? Seeing, I think, none in the, op in the audience, there will be five minutes allotted to the appellant after Mr. Osborne's case. Okay, Mr. Osborne, tell us how you heard about this case, how many rentals, and any other information we need to know. So I found out about it through host compliance. We sent a letter on April 2nd of 2018. Looks like it was removed around April 18th uh, or, or before then, a couple days. Uh, appeal was filed uh, 417, and there were 11 reviews. I did have some email correspondence instructing uh, instructing her how to, how to proceed with the appeal. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? <laughs> Okay, uh, please identify yourself for the record, um, name and address, and baby name. 
<laughs> my name is news? Jessica Medley, and my address is 4542 South Trace Boulevard, Old Hickory. And we have not picked a name yet. We have a top three, but we're, oh, we're I waiting we were going to get a first for the Metro National <laughs> Network. <laughs> evening. So tell us how you ended up in this predicament. Well, first, I want to say sorry. If I had known about <laughs> needing a permit, we I wouldn't be here. Um, so I apologize for taking your time on that. And it is my fault. I should have looked once I started. We kind of got a little ahead of ourselves. We got excited about renting it out, making some extra money, having another baby coming. And so it was just kind of an oversight of not really even thinking about it. So we didn't look it up and my fault on that. Um, we did go ahead once we received the letter, took down the site, canceled all future reservations, and have paid the hotel tax. We went through the appeals process, put the sign out, did the letters. Um, I've had zero issues with any of my tenants. Majority of the people coming to stay are actually families and love the fact that we have a crib. They've loved that. It's been kind of nice. So it's just kind of when we're, if we go visit family, we rent it out, or if we're out of town for work. So it's just been, like I said, mainly families. All of my neighbors have been <coughs> super satisfied. Nobody's had any issues. So, yes. Okay, and board members, we have uh, one letter of support and two letters of opposition in the packet. Any questions for the applicant? So you got the letter and were you surprised? I mean, what? I was, because I didn't know that we were supposed to have a permit. Um, and like I said, we should have looked, looked it up ahead of time to see that we were actually supposed to have one and it just didn't, I didn't think anything about it. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? No? Thank you. We're going to close public hearing. Discussion. Uh, I'll put this in the same category. Uh, I would make a motion that she be allowed to apply four months from April 17, 2018, which is when she came down to address this situation. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? And I should say the zoning administrator did not err, but I would find she should be allowed to reapply. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Also. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes. So eligible four months from April. So. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Happy baby. John Michael, I think we're getting close on time. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, we'll go back to our normal part of our docket, 2018-236. Sean O'Malley is the appellant on that case and owner of the property at 113 Fern Avenue in Council District Number 2. It's an item A case, short-term rental case, operated prior to obtaining the permit. Mr. Osborne has the case and will make the presentation to the board. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 236? Seeing none in the obvious, the appellant will have uh, five minutes to make his desired presentation after the board hears from Mr. Osborne. Okay, you know the drill, just go, Ms. Charles. Uh, we sent a letter through host compliance on April 2nd, 2018. Um, looks like the appeal was filed on April 12th. Uh, we don't have any complaints on that. Um, it looks like it was removed April 18th. It looks like there are several advertisements for it that uh, kind of got strung along being removed, but they were all down as of May 3rd. Okay. Um, please state your name and your address and why you're here. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Sean O'Malley and uh, I live at 113 Fern Avenue uh, in District 2. Uh, it is my primary residence. Um, and, uh, Let's just cut to the chase. Why didn't you think you needed a permit? Uh, so I, I, I knew I needed a permit um, and uh, I began the process, uh, met with uh, Mr. David Fabreau, um and uh, brought all the application paperwork um, and at that time he notified me that I needed to send notifications to my neighbors. Uh, letting them know of the intention to uh, rent the house. Um, I sent all the notices certified mail um, and through no fault but my own, didn't realize that uh, I needed to follow up with uh, the fire uh, code uh, and have that inspection uh, done as well. Um, so like I said, there, to no one's fault but myself, um, I, I didn't realize that uh, that was the final step. Um, and uh, 
I then received a uh, notice of uh, non-compliance on April 1st, which uh, I was unaware of. I immediately removed the listings. I, I, he mentioned that uh, there were a few listings that um, I guess were still not uh, removed. I was unaware of those. Um, my girlfriend and I uh, manage it, and um, we have only uh, booked through Airbnb and um, had set up a couple other uh, platforms, but had zero rentals on those, um, and I guess just forgot to take those down. Um, uh, in meeting with Mr. Fabreau, um the following day, I found out uh, about the appeal process. Uh, and at that time, he mentioned I um, completed everything except dot the I and cross the T. Um, and uh, finally, I spoke with uh, uh, Councilman Hastings and uh, asked for his support. Um, in closing, I would just like to uh, add this is uh, my primary residence. I uh, take great pride in, in the house uh, and in uh, my neighbor's homes. Um, and I'd like to uh, close by reading a uh, letter uh, from one of my neighbors. Uh, and it says, BAZ board, or BZA board, I am writing this letter in full support of Sean O'Malley's ability to use his home as a short-term rental. Mr. O'Malley is one of the pioneers who purchased property in the Katy Hill area, built his dream home, and is, and is a valuable asset to our community. Mr. O'Malley has taken great pride in his home and presence in the community. As I live directly across the street from Mr. O'Malley, there has never been any concern that any neighbor neighbors have had uh, with his use of a short-term rental. Uh, feel assured by granting him this permit, he will be a great steward of the program. Matthew Strader, 110 Fern Avenue. Okay, thank you. Anything else to add? Any questions for the applicant? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion. So here's a case where you did everything but the fire marshal, which yeah. some would argue is one of the most important parts of the application process. What do we think? Doesn't seem um, unlike other ones that we've heard. Um, like you said, fire marshal's important though. Um, and so I would move that the zoning administrator did not err and that we allow the applicant to apply again for a permit um, six months from the date of application. Um, the date of application was uh, April 12th, so six months after that time, after that date. The motion's been made. Is there a second? Okay. I don't think the motion fails. No second. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make that the zoning administrator uh, did not err and that the applicant rented prior and uh, in the spirit of the most recent cases which were deemed to be minor, that the applicant is eligible four months after the application date. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. So you'll be eligible four months after it's April 12th, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-237. Carrie Hopkins is the appellant and owner of the property located at 4704 uh, Richmar Court in the Creefall area, Council of District Number 26. This is a short-term rental case and an item A appeal based upon denial of a short-term rental permit based upon the appellant's prior operation preceding obtaining the permit. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 237? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after staff hears from Mr. Osborne. So we found out about this one through host compliance, sent a letter, letter on April 3rd of 2018. Um, looks like she appealed on April 12th and at that time took the advertisement down. There are eight reviews from May of 17 to March of 18. Okay, any other non-permitted violations or complaints? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. 
Um, get us started, name, address, and why you're here. Uh, Carrie Hopkins, 4704 Richmar Court. Um, if I pass today, our child will be named David, just for, <laughs> for the record. Okay. Um, That's the first two. We were under the impression that a, a rental permit was needed for a, a full-time rental property. Um, this is our home, and we rent it periodically. So as soon as we did receive the letter on April, we opened it on April 10th, we immediately took our listing down. Um, we had four upcoming reservations that we did cancel. We paid our taxes on those two March stays that we had had, um, and of course went through the entire appeal process as well. Uh, all of our adjacent neighbors have come to us in support. Um, we haven't heard anything in the negative as of um, thus far. So, I mean, we're, we're very diligent about who we want in our home. Again, it is our home, and we want to respect that and our neighbors and our cul-de-sac of Creve Hall. So what we're asking is that we can um, rectify this and go ahead and apply as soon as possible. Okay. So you um, live in the house, you don't leave when someone we comes do, we in? We do leave, yeah. You do leave, okay. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions of the applicant? Okay, thanks. Close the public hearing. Discussion. Uh, I make a motion that the presenting administrator did not err and she should be allowed to apply uh, four months from the date of application, which was April 12, 2018. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly second. Um, any discussion? Well, I don't think we want to put that she's going to name her child David. Oh, that's <laughs> not in the order. I Although that was it's a, a sweet great gesture name. for all three of the it Davids. On the it's on the record. I figured I could get it as in three out of the Yeah, three Davids. Yeah. That was so good. We have three Davids on the board, right? Okay. Any other discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? You're eligible four months from April 12th. Good luck. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2018-238, involving the property of 613 Iron Gate Court, out in the Bellevue community, district number 35. Richard Sandler is the appellant and owner of the property, shown here on the zoning map and here on the aerial map. It's an item A case involving short-term rental, failure to obtain the permit before operation. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 238? Seeing none, you hear from Mr. Osborne on the case first for on behalf of staff uh, for the 613 Iron Gate Court case, and we'll hear from the appellant who will have five minutes to make his desired presentation. Mr. Osborne. Looks like we found out about this one on April 3rd and sent a letter through host compliance. Um, there are 47 reviews from April of 2015 through March of 2018. Um, had some email correspondence with Mr. Sandler on April 11th. Um, the advertisement's still online, however, there's no change in it since he received the notice and there... You say the, you say the advertisement's still online, can you book? The dates are all available. Okay. Uh, there hasn't been any change in it, there's no new stays since the appeal. Okay. Anything else? Any non-permit um, violations? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Identify yourself for the record, your address, and why we're here. I am Gary Goldberg. I live at 301 Madison Boulevard, Madison, Tennessee. I'm here instead of Richard Sandler. He's out of town. Okay. I asked if I could come in instead, and I was told that was okay. Okay. So do you have a statement to read, or what do you hear? Well, it's not a statement. It's just what I was sent. Uh, I spoke with him. Uh, just recently, just a few minutes ago, okay. and I said, let's be very clear as why you didn't. I'm listening to cases, and he said, it's very simple. I just didn't know. I filled out everything with Airbnb and thought that was enough, and I never knew until I was notified, and as soon as I did, I stopped renting. There is a sign in the front yard. You know, a red saying, sign, yeah. A red sign since, uh, you know, the whole time. Okay, so here's a question, which you may not be able to answer. It sounds like the listing is still up. I know he's not trying to, I am the maintenance guy, the supervisor, I do a lot of work on this house, I know he hasn't rented it, has no intentions of renting it, and he was just hoping the thing was going to go well, he, just like, he just didn't realize you're supposed to take that listing, it's just an oversight, I'm sure. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Anything else? Nope. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Well, I'll say in the past, um, you know, that I think prior applicants have taken down the advertisement. This applicant has not taken down the advertisement. Um, so that's more of a, I don't know what our scale was, moderate, so, something severe. So 
Go ahead. You're going to say something. So the advertisements were taken down, but I guess Mr. Osborne said there was no proof of it being printed. But the advertisement was not taken down. No, it, it hasn't been, you know, yes, the advertisement's still up, but there's no proof of it being rented. Although, as we know, by the code, the violation is the posting, not the rental. So, motions, anyone? I will. Um, I will move that the zoning administrator did not err and that we assess a six-month penalty from the date of application, which was April 12, 2018. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes. John Michael. The next case to be heard is 2018-240. 241 is kind of the A and B of the same property, so I'm gonna present these cases together, Mr. Chairman, and the board will vote separately on case 240 and 241. The subject property is 1808 A and B, Warfield Drive, in Council District Number 25, not too far from one of the preeminent educational institutions in all the South, Lipscomb University. Ah. Jeffrey Hart is the appellant, Tim Reynolds the owner of the property. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements at this development, shown here with the HPR lines already drawn in. Mr. Hart, please come forward. Now. The site plan uh, submitted demonstrates proposed layout okay, of those wait, properties. Let's t time out, John Michael. Is our applicant here? Is Mr. Hart or Mr. Reynolds present for cases 240 and 241? Is there anybody present in support of? Seeing none, I move that the board consider a motion to defer these to the next available date so since moved. the appellant is not present. Yep. Next available date. Very well. Fine. The next case yep. to be presented to the board is 2018 242. The appellant is Hosan Bar Barwari. He is the appellant on behalf of Nashville Homes LLC. The subject property is located at 7 Garden Street in Council District Number 17, just south of downtown off First Avenue South. This is a request for a sidewalk requirement. As you may recall, Mr. Chairman, it was previously recommended for consent agenda, but there was opposition present. Okay. The aerial photograph here shows the subject property in a residential development. The site plan submitted demonstrates the proposal layout for the construction there. For my recent site visit, the demoed lot ready for construction, the existing sidewalk in place uh, up and down Garden Street in those sides. Um, there is opposition present, therefore Mr. Barwari will have 10 minutes if needed to make his presentation to the board. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. So opposition John Barwari, 7 Garden Street. Oh, John, okay. Yes. James Green, 1266 Second Avenue South. Okay, so tell us what you're doing and what you're asking for. Well, he's the opposition, I'm the homeowner. Oh, well, the opposition is supposed <laughs> to be. I'm the opposition, yeah. Uh, you're supposed to sit back there while he gets to talk. Oh. Okay. okay. The floor um, is yours. I uh, requested a variance. There's already an existing sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And planning, uh, as they recommended, I pay uh, the in lieu fee. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, we're gonna come back for a rebuttal. We're gonna hear from the opposition now, come forward. So please state your name again and your address and why you're opposed to this particular case. The name is James Green, mm -hmm. 1266 Second Avenue South. Okay, so why are you here to oppose this case? Uh, it says that he doesn't need uh, sidewalks or to pay the sidewalk fees. I have to have one, and I have to pay the fees. Yes. This particular well, so property. Well, on this, sir, on this one, he what he said, he said he would, he's going to keep the sidewalk that's there, and he has and going to gonna pay into the fund. So he's, it'll he will keep keep the sidewalk that exists there. So, did you have a, a problem with anything um, other? Uh, what I read right here, it said that uh, the appellant. <coughs> Requested there's a sidewalk requirements. Should this be approved, it would allow the uh, appellant to build a single family house without building sidewalks or paying into the sidewalk fund. Yes. Right, but what he what he's agreed to do is to keep the existing sidewalk and to pay into the fund. So that's what that's what he's agreed to do, and that's what we would vote. And he's on. paying thousands of dollars. So he's gonna contribute whatever, 170 something dollars a foot. Um, so does, that change, does that change your mind? He's paying now, to if the he's going to keep the existing sidewalk, there's nothing wrong with that, but to say it here. Yeah, no, he's gonna, build a yeah. that's been updated no. since that docket was originally published. He's, he's a gonna, very reasonable point. He's gonna keep the making. sidewalk and pay into the fund, okay? 
this uh, yeah that's that's uh, old don't said that it was not he was not going to yeah, do yeah that's it. not the case we're gonna make sure okay thank huh? you for being here he's gonna okay. keep the sidewalk and pay into the fund okay oh okay yes thank you thank you all good absolutely come forward I don't want him to leave a problem in my neighborhood no 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 that's a good neighborhood okay please come forward again Okay, so you're still willing to pay into the in loop? Yeah, it was on the consent form, and I spent four or five hours. I know, yep, yep, because if, if you're going to about to get what yeah. you want, just let's, yeah. you know, we can't give and, you. And another we thing can't is, give you four hours back. Is, we don't get four hours of our life back there, either. But let me, so. let me state something else. <laughs> no, you're I, allowed to pay an in lieu fee if there's no sidewalk, but when there's an existing sidewalk, you have to go through this process to pay the in lieu fee. That's actually a factually incorrect statement. You're only allowed to pay into the sidewalk fund in certain zone districts or outside the UZO. This is a close interior property, so close but no cigar. Um, you're still getting what you want at the end of this. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's close public hearing discussion. I mean, I, it was on the consent agenda. I'll move that we approve the variance, uh, provided that the applicant pay into the in lieu fund uh, based on the recommendation of council and planning. Okay. Motion's been made. I'll second it. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-243 involving the property at 408 Woodfern Court, Council District Number 33. This is an item A case involving a short-term rental permit and the denial of the permit based on prior operation. Aerial photograph shown here gives you an idea of the neighborhood, face of the property from the assessor's website. Mr. Osborne will make his presentation of the case. We'll ask is there any opposition present for case number 243. Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the presentation to the board after Mr. Osborne presents. Let's get started, Mr. Osborne. So a letter was sent by host compliance on April 3rd, 2018. Looks like the advertisement is taken down around April 12th. The appeal is April 13th. There are 23 stays from September of 2017 to March of 2018. Um, no other complaints to my knowledge. Okay, let's get going. Say your name, your address, and why you're here. Yes, hello, my name is Kimberly Dolan and I live at 408 Woodfern Court in Antioch, Tennessee, 37013. Thank you for your time today and listening to my request for the short-term rental <coughs> permit appeal. I was unaware that a permit was required in Antioch, Tennessee in order to operate an Airbnb. I moved here from Santa Cruz, California where Airbnb permits are not required, so I assumed it was the same everywhere else. I have always reported my Airbnb income tax on all my tax returns. In early April 2018, I received the notice that I owed occupancy taxes on my Airbnb. At this time, I went on to the metro.gov of Nashville and also learned that I needed a permit. I quickly paid all my taxes and went to file all my paperwork for a permit. Just a couple days before I went in to file all the necessary paperwork for the permit, I received another letter stating I was in violation of the short-term rental code by not having a permit. I went to the office to apply for the permit and was told that I could not have one for a year because I was in violation of the code. I was confused and in shock as nowhere in the letter does it state I can't have a permit for a year. I didn't even know I needed one. I removed my listing as of April 9th. I am a small business owner in Antioch, Tennessee, and I also have a cat sanctuary and do cat rescue. My Airbnb is unique in the fact that people stay with rescue cats. The profits from this Airbnb go directly to the care and rescue and support of all the cats in our community. At the present moment, there are 10 cats in my home and I've had up to 20. No cat is ever turned away and many have found their forever home here and others have been nursed back to health and found forever wonderful second chance homes. This would not be possible without the continued revenue that I receive from my Airbnb guests. All of my reviews are five stars and guests from all over the world have stayed in my home relaxing with cats. Antioch being a suburb of Nashville often gets a bad rap or or view from others' neighboring communities. 
The recent tragedies of the Waffle House shooting, as well as the church shooting, were in my neighborhood, where my house is. This is not a reflection of our community. This is not who we are as people. When you stay in my home, you get the opportunity to truly see what Antioch community is really like. Warm, friendly, inviting, moving forward, onward, and upward. I have a guest book in my room where guests can write something they choose before they leave. I would like to share a couple of them with you. I've also included copies and photos of some of my rescues if you would like to see them. Kim, thank you so much for your hospitality. You made us feel right at home. We love what you are doing for these sweet animals and knowing, knowing we could help them in some way makes us happy. When you think of us, please hug those sweet babies a little tighter. The guest bed is amazing. We wish you all the luck and happiness in the world. We hope to see you again in the future. Okay. Kevin and Fantasia. Okay, is there... Um and you have those copies, so we'll, you could give those to us. Yes. And anything else to add? That's it. Okay. I would request to be able to get my permit as soon mm -hmm. as possible okay. so I can continue my rescue. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Any questions of the applicant? Okay. Just give us those, those letters. Okay. <laughs> We're going to close the public hearing and discussion. <coughs> Thank you for uh, staying and speaking to Thanks. us. It's been a long day. Sorry. I can see that you truly care about yeah. what you do, too. Um, Lots of letters. Yeah. Um, I would say this is not any different than some of the other ones we heard today. Um, does anyone else have anything? <coughs> Your microphone's on. I don't know. No, David. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> did you have something to say? I did not, I'm sure. Mr. Taylor does. We're tired. <laughs> We're all very okay. tired. Let's give us a motion. I will move that. Um, let's see. The zoning administrator did not err, and that we um, allow the applicant to apply for a permit. I'm going to say three months after the date of application, which was April 13th. Okay. I second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. You're eligible three months Thank after you. April. Okay, John Michael. 2018-244 yeah. involves a property at 568 Valleywood Drive in Council District Number 27. Benjamin Meek is the appellant and owner of the property. Um, coming forward at this time, it's a short-term rental case, item A, before the permit. Mr. Osborne will make the presentation on behalf of staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 244? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after the staff or after the board hears from Mr. Osborne. So we found out about this one on April 3rd, sent out a tax letter, or short-term rental and tax letter on April 3rd through host compliance. It looks like the advertisement was removed around April 12th, 13 reviews from February of 18 to April of 18. Okay, any questions for Mr. Osborne? Nope. Please get started, name and address, why you're here. Benjamin Meek at uh, 568 Valleywood Drive. Um, uh, came in to, uh, to uh, discuss this we understood that we were in compliance with the um, with the, the permitting uh, regime. And regime. And so let me let me explain why. <laughs> Sorry, is that is That's that the like wrong word? North no. Korea, not no, no, metro no, 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 government. No, I don't mean it like that. Yeah, okay. the, the permitting uh, the permitting process. Yes. So um, I, I had originally come in and applied in December the eighth and brought all of my documentation in at that time. And what was missing? And presented it to the examiner. The examiner looked at it all, found that it was all in order, and returned it to me. And you still had to get the fire marshal? No, the fire the fire marshal stuff was 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 already um, was I believe already taken care of. When he looked at the property, he said he looked at the piece that we wanted to rent, mm -hmm. which is a detached accessory dwelling unit according mm -hmm. to the codes. Um, Sorry, my mic went off. Um, according to the to the codes, that it was a, a detached accessory dwelling unit and needed to um, and and was marked as storage space. This was complete surprise to us because we just purchased the home about four or five months before that, and we knew that there were people already living in it. So it, it had the electrical, the water, everything. It was all was already set up. But he said you're going to have to actually pull a building permit in order to move forward with this. So. 
So the, the short-term rental stuff is all in order, but you need to go and get, uh, have the have the building examiner come and come and actually actually so look at it. Did you have a short-term rental permit? Where you get when were you given a permit? No, no, no. So I so I did so I I didn't have I didn't have the permit. I met with the examiner. He looked at all the documents and saw that they were in order. And then the next step was he he looked at this and said you actually can't rent this because it's marked as storage space. So now you need to go and pull a permit. And he presented me with this with this document indicating what I needed to get done in order to make that happen. I wrongly understood this to be my checklist. This was in, when in totally fact- Totally separate from the short-term exa rental. Exactly, yes. That so I, what was not checked off on the short-term rental part? Your $50 check? I, I, th I believe that that would be the only thing that was that was not checked off. I even had the check with me at the time. Okay. So basically, you did you did you just thought you said you'd already you thought you'd already submitted it to codes, and then they right. said well, you still got to do this. You went and did that, and you thought you. I went right more. exactly. I went and did all that stuff in January. They 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 came back and said you're all set to go, and I understood that wrongly to be my green light to be able to to do the listing. So, so that's my, that's the explanation. Kim Young, codes inspector, said no. Okay. So, I, I, I promise I didn't mean the word regime as a uh, so pejorative. When did, when did you, so, when did you, so you stopped running as soon as you got the letter. Told yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't lay out the timeline. I'll just do that really quick. We yes, were notified. We received the notice on April the 8th. We deactivated the same day. We had about 25 bookings in the pipeline. We canceled them all by the following day. Okay. And, and have been striving strenuously with the building codes and other things to make sure that we were, we had a use and occupancy letter. I have now the use and occupancy letter. And this is the only hurdle remaining for me to go back and okay. actually Good. get the... Any questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, I think this is an administ. This to me, this is a, a make a motion. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll I'll move the the zoning administrator. I mean, I would make a motion and second it myself, but I'm not a dictator, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, we'll talk about that at our meeting. No. <laughs> the. Uh, yeah, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err and that uh, based on the unique circumstances of this case, um, that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit immediately. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Wonderful. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank and you. since it's 540, it immediately really means tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, John Michael, let's see what we can get done here. Case number 2018-249 is the next case to be presented to the board. General Rowley is the appellant and owner of the property of 5617 Highland Way in Council District Number 4. The request is an item A appeal involving the denial of a short-term rental permit based upon the uh, property owners having operated the short-term rentals without having the legally required permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 249? There are a number. As a result, Mr. Osborne will make the desired presentation. The appellant will have 10 minutes to make their desired presentation, saving some time back for rebuttal, if you wish. Then we'll hear from the opponents thereafter. Okay, uh, Mr. Osborne. Let's go. We sent a letter through OS Compliance on April 3rd, 2018. Looks like the address removed around April 12th. Uh, appeal was filed April 18th. 34 reviews from October 2017 to April of 2018. Okay. Any other non-permitted violations? Not to my knowledge. And everything came down? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Name, address, why you're here. Uh, Jenna Raleigh, 5617 Highland Way. I apologize. I'll be out of town on the 21st, and I didn't know there was opposition, so thank you for hearing my case. Uh, we just filled out our Airbnb listing um, and followed what Airbnb told us to do. Um, there was not an, a question for a permit. There wasn't a place to put in your permit number. Um, so, so why didn't you know that there was laws related to this? I mean, we've been filing our taxes with it, but as far as laws go, we are owner-occupied. We live in the home. We assumed. So you were paying the hospitality tax? We were filing them under our just in regular income tax. But you know there's also hotel Yeah, we motel. do, and we have paid all of them current. Okay. And so what else? Continue. As soon as we were notified, we took the listing down. We did everything to file for the appeal, and we're just asking to be able to uh, relist our property and apply for a permit. Okay. Well, apply for a permit, then relist our property. Something about y'all opening up a Airbnb, I mean, a bed and breakfast or something? Is that any? No. It's just a normal Airbnb, like. So, yeah, in our packet board members, we have three letters of opposition, two of support, including Robert Swope, the councilman for District 4. Okay. So. 
We're going to hear from the opposition. Go back. Opposition, please come forward. Divide your time. State your name, address, why you're in opposition. Who wants to get us started? Let's go. I'm Kathleen Zaccaro. I live at 5704 Shetland Court. Okay. And why are you against this? We have, have a letter from you, actually. Yes. And a petition. Yes. Uh, I've lived, we built that house over 40 years ago, and we've seen a lot of changes in the neighborhood since the sewers were installed. We were in the country when the house was built, and now we're part of the city. Uh, we are being long-term residents. We're, we don't consider ourselves living in a motel zone, and we really oppose a short-term rental. Okay. Uh, I'm Carol Pickett. I live at 5621 Highland Way, which is right next uh, next door, actually. Uh, I'm very concerned about Airbnb. I don't uh, know that much about it, but I believe that anyone can uh, go ahead and reserve a place that they're not going to know who is coming in, that um, it, I'm afraid it's going to bring down uh, my um, the value of my house, uh, plus Ms. Raleigh brought around a petition that she wanted people to sign. My son, who has no clue what's going on, is not the owner of the house, went ahead and signed it. So I'm kind of wondering if the other people on, on Ms. Raleigh's pe petition actually are taxpayers and owners at the home. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yes, I'm Julie Walski. I live at 5929 Abbott Drive. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Nashville, but I took uh, 15 years to find the appropriate neighborhood to move to because so many areas that I was interested in started changing and changing for the worst as far as safety goes. And when years, a few years ago, when I drove into the Highlands, I looked at the lovely homes and I thought, said to myself, this is who I am. And I felt safe. I felt safe for the first time, probably in any given area. And I was concerned when I saw the sign and I was, I got the information about this, about what also could happen in that neighborhood. Um, so much has been happening anyway, but um, we're, we're just very concerned. Is I have a question to ask you all. The Metro Council is letting any residential area allow Airbnb? John, John Michael, you could I'd be glad to provide a copy of the law. It's a little hard to answer in terms of the six ordinances that have been passed and the state statute that's been passed. Um, it's, it's a more complex answer than a yes, no on that. I'd be glad to consult with you. So it's not necessarily wish. every residential neighborhood. Is that correct? I'll be glad to consult with you after this if it all helps. Right. So okay. here's a question I'll ask the three of you all. You've generally talked about your opposition to Airbnbs in general. Is there anybody, is there anyone that wants to speak specifically about this particular piece of property and why they shouldn't have an Airbnb outside of you don't like Airbnbs in general? Well, for one thing, it's, that's a commercial enterprise and we are zoned residential. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like that coming right next door to me. Yes, and as John Michael kind of alluded to, the Metro Council has made it legal, even in this neighborhood, to have uh, short-term rentals in here if you comply with the law. So, um, any other questions from the board members? Okay, no. Thank you, let's hear from the applicant again. It's rebuttal time, so you get to respond to what you just heard. Stay on. Okay, well, first of all, thank you all for being here. I know you've been here a long time to state your case. So, um, but we have been operating since October um, on knowing that we needed a permit and to our knowledge haven't caused any disruptions in the neighborhood and plan to continue operating that way. Um, you should have a letter in your packets from our immediate next door neighbors for 
who brought up right to us, who are in strong support of us, say they don't even know we're ever having guests um, unless they see a vehicle in the drive, and we never have more than two guests at a time, and we're always home when we have guests. So um, we love the neighborhood. We feel the same way about the Highlands as they do. Uh, we are newer in the neighborhood, but we've done drastic improvements to our home. We plan to stay there for a long time, and uh, this is just some supplemental income um, okay. for us. Thanks. Any questions for the applicant? Does your um, posting um, list the required or the maximum number of app, um, not applicants, maximum number of guests? Is that in your listing? Yes. Okay. Uh, no more than two unrelated guests can say. Um, and max. Okay. We, yes. I see it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's not a party house. It's no. I mean, we like I said, we've done mass improvements to it. We want to keep it nice. You know, for us, eventually, when it's not a short-term rental. Okay, thank you. Going to close the public hearing discussion. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I just, I mean, a shout out to the opposition in the sense that I know um, you, you've come and stayed an awful long time to state your case, and that um, it clearly shows your passion for it and your passion for the neighborhood. And it's one of the frustrations of our board, and that uh, it, this is one of the few places that people get to come and voice their. Uh, opinion about Airbnb, and yet uh, the decision that we're tasked with uh, has nothing to do with whether or not uh, this home can have an Airbnb uh, that was decided by the Metro Council. And so our decision is basically they operated uh, without a permit, like many of the cases you've heard before, and what's the right penalty for that. And, um, and, and it's, our decision is not meant to you know, be disrespectful of, of folks or uh, position on, on Airbnb, but to, to follow the rules that were given. And um, to me, this case is one where um, they did what they were supposed to do, and uh, after they were notified, and it, uh, it just kind of falls to me in that, that area where um, it would be appropriate to make the motion, which I will, that the zoning administrator did not err, and that the applicant be eligible for a, to apply for a permit uh, three months after the application date, which I think was April 18th. 18th. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Thank you for your time. John Michael. Mr. Thank Chairman, the next case is 2018-251 from we Council a, District Number 25. We Pardon have a me? zoning case? You have an actual zoning case involving actual zoning law and not short-term rentals in this one. Chuck Pitts is the appellant, Holly Lovell, the owner of the property at 903 Winston Place, just off Woodmont in the Green Hills area. The request is for variances from minimum separation requirements and rear setback requirements in the R10 Zoning District, the zoning map shown here for Winston Place, just before you kind of dip down into Oak Hill, just across the line there in order to convert a detached garage into a second single family residence for a family member. The aerial photograph here shows, although it's somewhat obscured by the shadows from a nearby tree, the secondary structure on the property that is proposed for conversion to that residential use. The site plan submitted shows a proposed function of those structures on the lot. From my recent site visit, the view of the house from the street, up and down the street on the left-hand side and across the street in the lower right-hand corner. Of note, Mr. Chairman, just uh, Late this morning, before we came over for the board meeting, we did receive correspondence from the district council member, Russ Pulley, regarding his recommendations on cases from the district, in particular on this one, and I think I've got this right just in brief. This uh, council member is actually re requesting a deferral on this case in order that he and the neighbors might have an opportunity to meet with the appellants to uh, review the particulars of their plan. Apparently, those discussions have not taken place. Of note, the uh, appellants are not required to have a meeting with their council member or the neighbors, but it has been the request of the council member, given that there is a um, zoning, um, I believe zoning bill that is being considered for the area now. As a result, that's the request from the district council member. So with apologies for that rather long overview on my part, the appellant is okay. present uh, so for case number 251. Let's, let's talk about Councilman Pulley's request. What do you think about it? Well, I'm Chuck Pates. I live at 903 Winston Place. I emailed the councilman um, to discuss this. I've spoke with all of my neighbors surrounding behind. Nobody has a problem with this. While you look at this picture, you see the face of my garage. That garage is moving out 10 feet. Um, that's the only change that would ever be noticed by anyone in my neighborhood. I'm not going to a second story. Um, and but this what's wrong with deferring it and talking to the councilperson? Um, 
So this is to move my in-laws into this property. They are elderly. Mm -hmm. This is on a slab. It's a timing issue to try to get them into this property. So uh, until this is approved, I can't get a permit to build. Okay. Um, proceed. So you don't want to defer it? Um, I re requested it not be deferred. I've spoke with all of the neighbors. I had a neighbor call me last night who was directly behind me. Um, he did not receive a letter. He said that the Melrose Post Office does not like to deliver mail to them. He called me personally. He asked if I was going up to a second story because then I would be looking into his house, which his house actually looks into mine. I said no. Um, I received a, a postcard from one of the um, 600 radius residents. She said she did not disapprove what I was doing, that she thought it was commendable that I was moving my in-laws into my house. It's cost prohibitive to move them into my house, but into my garage, it is not. So um, in my neighborhood, there are HPRs going all around. This is not an HPR. This is a single residence, just with a detached second dwelling. Um, all utilities are still under um, my primary residence. So I request it not be deferred. Um, I reached so out to the councilman. He did not reach back to me. He reached out to John Michael and said he wanted to. This morning. Uh, yes. I, I reached out to him as soon as I filed for the applicant. How? Um, via email. Okay. So what is your hardship? Um, my hardship is, is that I can't move them into my house. That's not a hardship. We're talking about a hardship relates to the property, the topography, the way it's laid out. Why do you need this based on the property? Uh, based on talking with my architect, this was the zoning. This was what we were going for. Um, if it was not a hardship, then that's an error on my architect's part who was here earlier. Yes, when you come in front of the Board of Zoning Appeals and ask for a variance, you have to state the hardship because, as you know, this board, the law says this, and you're asking to do this. And if you're going to get to do this, you have to have a reason, and moving your in-laws in is not a reason for this board. Okay. I mean, we, we made the application and put that on the application, so they accepted that hardship that we were moving in family members. There, it's not their point to judge whether okay. your hardship is going to be compelling okay. or not. I understand. Well, I mean, you know, you have an existing building and, and the fact that you have an existing foundation and that it's in a existing other architectural pieces on the property, you know, it looks like you have a pool and, and just the massing of your house makes it very difficult to move the existing building. I understand that, but, you know, I, 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 I do wish we had a little more evidence on, I mean, yeah, some more documentation, but then once again, the deferral, we, we will put that back on the table. Do you want to defer this so you can talk to your architect yes. and you can talk to your council? Okay. You will be first on the agenda okay. next on time. On the 21st. If okay. that's any so consolation. Is that a motion to defer? Um, uh, yeah, I'll move. Yep. Is the 21st okay with you? Yes. You can make that happen. And I'll second it. And, okay. Those in favor of the deferral will say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. First. Good okay. Luck. Thanks. Thanks. Is John Michael not here? Well, we will. The next person, please come forward. Five minute break. Okay. John Michael, we're taking our five minute recess. Three minute recess. <laughs> John's cracking the whip. Mm. Eighteen oh two Eighth Avenue South, Council District Number Seventeen, just north of Wedgwood and south of downtown. Tony Elder is the appellant. Um, Duina Norman and Pia Stratton are the owners of the property located at eighteen oh two Eighth Avenue South. The request is for a special exception with regard to the operation of uh, a business called Dogtopia and also a variance from minimum separation requirements in the CS zoning district in order to use the property for the kennel. The Photograph here shows the proposed layout for the back portion of the property. You'll see 8th Avenue South there at the bottom and the cross street on the left. 
from my recent site visit. This is a property that stood for many, many years along 8th Avenue South. It was an antiques gallery, the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, the view up and down 8th Avenue South in this photograph. Uh, from the neighboring property, I took a photograph in the back, so you have some sense of the layout, the relative proximity of the residential structures to the north. And with that, a reminder, this is both a request for a special exception and a request for a variance from those minimum separation requirements. Um, because there's opposition present, both sides will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentations. Ms. Elder's present, if you'll just introduce yourself by name and address, and then address the board. First of all, thank you for uh, bearing with us and uh, not leaving exiting stage left before <laughs> we get started here for me. Um, I appreciate uh, both uh, the opposition being here and uh, being willing to uh, withstand a lot of uh, special requests as well. Um, respectfully, I would, uh, first of all, my name is Joni Elder. I live at, uh, temporarily at 391 Dandridge Drive, Franklin, Tennessee. And before we get started, how many people are in opposition? Raise your hands. Okay. Um, you had a special meeting with the council person in the community. How'd it go? I I, uh, I actually reached out to the council person, uh, uh, Colby Sledge, um, because this is the second property I have tried to uh, do in his district. But um, did you have a neighborhood meeting? We we did not because I, re I because I, John sir, Michael. Well, let me let me let me no, say it. I asked him if that doesn't was doesn't matter. Oh, okay, well. John Michael. Council members are often not familiar with the exact provisions of the Board of Zoning Appeals Rules of Procedure, and out of fairness to them, there's no reason they would be, just because there are so many boards they have to keep up with. However, um, for special exception cases under the board rules, namely um, for special exception cases solely, a neighborhood meeting is in fact required before a case can be heard by the board. That's something that would be actually publicly noticed to all properties within 600 feet, the same way that the BZA case itself would be noticed with, to all neighboring property owners within 600 feet. And the board does not hear cases until that neighborhood meeting has taken place. Mr. Can Chairman. Can I talk about my hardship issue? I've been looking for 20 You can in your hearing. I've been looking for 20 Which you're not allowed to have today. Yes, John Michael, next case. Just for clarification, once the neighborhood meeting is completed, we can get it on the docket. Next case to be heard is item number 2018-253. That involves a property at 5408 Kentucky Avenue. Jeff Estep is the appellant on behalf of Bradley and Neela Johnson, the owners of the property. Uh, the request is for a variance from side setback requirements in the R6 zoning district. Mr. Chairman, of note, the council member, Mary Carolyn Roberts, here in council district number 20, is, I think the correct phrase is 100% in support of this variance. The aerial here, and from my recent site visit here. The, um, the minimus side setback in incursions or setback incursions are the bump outs that you can see in the dead center of this photograph. We're hearing, uh, of course, cases 253 and 254 together as they are the adjacent properties shown here at 58, 5408 and 5406. From the property on the left, you can slightly see toward the rear of the structure that slight incursion into the setback. On the other side, it's not as much. However, in the center, again, you see another one. So both of these houses on what here would be the left side have that little bump out, and that's what's at issue. The council member stands in support. I believe there are still members of the Neighborhood Association present who also intend to speak in, not in opposition at least, and maybe in overt support. And this is the uh, work of the zoning staff and the codes department to try to find equitable solutions for these challenging problems. Is there anyone here in opposition to cases number 253 or 254? Again, Mr. Chairman, you've now seen the photographs and heard the presentation relevant to both of these cases. Um, the testimony you hear should be relevant to both of the cases as well. And then we would ask the board to take two separate motions on those cases. Okay. Good. I'm Jeff Eastep. I reside at uh, 3616 Westbrook Avenue here in Nashville. I'm the builder for these two homes. They were built three years ago and they've been occupied for the last three years. It was brought to my attention back in January um, by Byron Hall um, that these two homes were potentially in violation of set side setback issues. Um, after reviewing with him and Mr. Herbert, it was determined that they, these two homes did have a violation and the violation was um, the bump outs had windows installed in, and you can see there's one small window, I believe that's 5408 there. Um, so, you know, here I am th three years later after the fact, um, you know, at the time when I built the homes, I, I had no idea that they were in violation. I probably built a hundred plus homes in the neighborhood with probably 
not 15 bump outs. Unfortunately, the bump outs that I have built were fireplaces, which did not have windows, and those were allowed, they are allowed to be you know, encroached on the setback. So about four years ago, before these homes were even built, I had a conversation with um, the uh, codes examiner, um, or the uh, codes inspector for the neighborhood, asking him about bump outs in particular. Um, and his words to me were, as long as it doesn't have a foundation underneath it, Okay. I don't have a problem with it. So you're here today to ask for these um, special exceptions for these two properties. I, I am, and I'm continuing, you know, Let's to communicate with the homeowners of the two. I want to hear from the other two. I'm Kristen Giordano. Um, my husband, Jacob McAuliffe, and I own 5406 Kentucky Avenue, and we are obviously in favor of a variance for this. Um, just to speak on behalf of Jeff, he has been in communication with us since the moment those emails have mm -hmm. come out to rectify the situation. Okay. Next. My name's Timothy Brown. I live at 5303A Kentucky Avenue in the Nations. Um, and as Bill Herbert will attest, um, this was an issue that was discovered and brought to the attention of council as well as codes uh, where a number of houses, I believe 53 are currently the amount, or 57, uh, where there were bump outs that were in violation of the side setback requirements and codes is in the process of having these properties sure. survey. So basically the Nations Association Planning and Zoning Committee and met with Bill Herbert on a number of occasions in community meetings to discuss possible solutions and what they've come up with is in these cases where there's a window mm -hmm. that uh, the window be replaced with fire rated windows okay. and when there isn't that the materials do meet fire code sure. so the only issue is then the side setback so, and that so mostly for the homeowner so, uh, home occupied homeowner occupied that the ideal solution would then be to grant a permanent variance and we would be in support of that general solution as these cases come up, we hope that in the future they'll sure. be put on the consent agenda. Okay, very good. Questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? Thank you. We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. This just sounds like a reasonable solution worked out by all parties involved. Mr. Chairman, I will state that, um, that the applicant here uh, has stepped up, has done everything that is necessary to bring these homes into total building code compliance. We have the support of the council person, no opposition here. So the only thing that remains is the uh, side setback variant. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll move in case uh, 253 that we approve the side setback variance based on 252. The Three. Oh, three. Three. Three, for three, and three. Oh, that's right. Three first. Okay. So 253 that uh, we approve the side setback variance uh, based on the uh, unique circumstances presented in this case. Okay. Uh, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. I'll also limit. move the in case 254 that we approve the side setback requirements because of the uh, unique situation of this case. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Um, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Right. Thank you. John Michael. Case number 2018-256 is for the property at 4806 Kentucky Avenue. Taylor Prince is the appellant. Mark Laramore, the owner of that property. The request is for a variance from street setback requirements in the R6 zoning district to construct two single-family residences. The aerial here shows the prior residence that was in place before demolition. The proposed layout shown on the site plan in both your packet and in this slide presentation. From our recent visit to the site, you see the lot from Kentucky and across the street in the upper left-hand corner. Finally, the view up and down Kentucky in these slides. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 256? There is. As a result, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation, and the opponents will have 10 minutes as well. Hey, Please John, introduce yourself by name and address. Hey, John, I'm yeah. sorry, you may not know this answer, but do, can you go back to the overhead of the, the uh, do you know where, yeah, the, they're wanting uh, 28 and a half feet, 43 is required. Do you know how far back the houses on the others? It looks like if it's an average of all four, it'd be, the others would be around 40 something feet. <laughs> And it's sorry that I don't know the specific answer to that. Okay. I apologize. Okay. Um, my, t my name is Taylor Prince. Um, I'm with LNS Construction, and 
uh, it's for 4806 Kentucky Avenue. And um, what we're needing is a ver uh, to move the houses up so that we can get a um, carport in the back so that we can have parking in the alley, like uh, the carport in, in the alley, and not a parking pad in the front. Right. So. Yeah, I mean with uh, the back, um, there just isn't enough room to have the carport in the back. I mean, it looks this like the lot houses isn't enough. But in other houses to the right, though, all three have garages, and they're not further. I guess they're not as big as ours. I, I don't. I'm not positive. Sorry, I'm not. I'm just like an assistant. I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> Um, do you have anything to add uh, regarding your hardship? I just know that they wanted the uh, carport instead of the parking pad. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I appreciate your dilemma, and I'm not. You know, it's it's not necessarily fair for you to be in the situation you're in, but we didn't put you in that situation. I know. I am so sorry. <laughs> so, you know, I do understand that. Yeah, but you're asking about the setbacks. There's a, a survey that shows it, but I don't know if you can. Does it? I don't know if you can make out that. It's uh, the average of the houses on the side. This is what they're showing. Yeah. Oh, but it does. But it does. It does look like you're going to be significantly in front of the houses, the other houses That's on the street. That's what they want to move it to. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's hear from the opposition. Okay. Okay. State your name again. Address. Why you're opposed. Right. Timothy Brown, 53038 Kentucky Avenue, um, on the Planning and Zoning Committee of the Nation's Neighborhood Association. And although the builder did not come before us, as we invite them to do to ask what they're looking for, um, members of the committee did go look at the site. And our opposition is based upon the fact that the other houses on the street all seem to be back at the what appears to be a, a close to 43 foot. And this would stick out significantly forward. Um, John Michael, there was a map picture. Um, if you'll see there where that house is, but you go up one block to the right, um, those houses actually do stick out further, but the road comes, or the, the road is much narrower there. So the width of the road on this section of the block is, is limiting the factor, but if they bring out from it, it will be much closer to the front of the block. That was the nature of our opposition. Thank okay. you. Thank Any you. Questions? Please come back forward. Anything else to add? No. Um, Questions of the applicant? Okay. So a closed public hearing. Discussion? Uh, I don't see a hardship. Yeah, I don't, I agree. I don't see a hardship either. And it will visually disrupt the, the rhythm of the block. I'll move we have the experience report. Okay, motion's been made properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, that's motions to, uh, the request is denied. John Michael. Thank you. Next case for the board is 2018-259, an item A appeal involving short-term rental permit denial, denial based upon prior operation. Frank Platt is the appellant and owner of the property at 111 Colony Court in Council District Number 25. We received correspondence from the council member late this morning indicating that if the property is in fact now in compliance with regard to short-term rental, i.e. there is no listing, there is no rental, that he in fact would support reinstatement at the BZA's discretion. With that, we'll hear from Mr. Osborne, and then is there anyone present to oppose case number 259? Seeing none among our dwindling numbers, the uh, appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after Mr. Osborne speaks. Okay, Mr. Osborne, go. So we found out about this one through host compliance and notice on April 3rd. On uh, April 12th, I received an email from, uh, from Frank and instructed him how to proceed, which he was already on the right path to do. Looks like his appeal due to some issues in getting in front of the examiner wasn't filed until April 18th. 
Um, it looks like that's when the ad came down, 11 reviews from July 2017 to November of 2017. Okay, any questions for Mr. Osborne? Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, thank you. State your name, address. Uh, yes, sir, it's Frank Platt, 111 Colony Court, Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, so how'd you end up here? Well, um, I think I decided to do an Airbnb and just tested it out, and about three or four months into it, realized that I had to have permits to do that, so mm -hmm. I took it off the market. Um, wasn't aware that I was in any violation until I actually went down to apply for the permits and was told that I was uh, not eligible for a year because I had been in violation. Uh, I haven't rented it since, and I'm here to... How many times did you rent it? Uh, I may have had five or six rentals. I think I had $2,200 total. It was okay. not a lot. I live in the house, one room, kind of augments my uh, fixed income. Okay. Question? When was the last time you rented? Pardon? When was the last time you rented? Uh, November. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? No, sir. Thank you. Close the public hearing. Discussion. I note that um, Councilman Pilley uh, recommends reinstatement. So right. I'm just and the last your date of rental was in November. So, I'll, wants? I'll say it's unusual that someone um, stops renting themselves and goes down and tries to get a permit. We don't hear that a lot nowadays. Um, so I would move to um, that the zoning administrator did not err and that the applicant be allowed to apply for a permit on Monday. Okay. Motion's been Call made. Is second. There? Second. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Eligible on Monday. Good luck. All right. Thank you. And by the way, thanks for being here. Yeah. <laughs> John case number 2018-260 is our next case involving the property at 1304 Little Hamilton Avenue, shown here on the zoning map here for the face of the property and here on the aerial map. Dan Maslov is the appellant and owner of that property. It's an item A appeal involving short-term rental prior operation before getting the permit. We'll hear from Mr. Osborne first and then from the appellant. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 260? Seeing none for this property in Council District number 17, you'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation after Mr. Osborne speaks. Looks like we sent a letter on April 2nd uh, through host compliance. The ad was removed around April 7th. Uh, five reviews from February of 18 to March of 18. Uh, we did receive an additional complaint on May 21st, but have not had the chance to look into it, saying that they have been operating without a permit while waiting on appeal. Uh, as far as I know, the advertisement's down. Okay. State your name and address and uh, why you're here. Dan Victor Maslov, 1304 Little Hamilton. Um, so originally, uh, me and my mom purchased this uh, property in uh, October, November of last year. Um, my mom, she lives in Sacramento, California. She had her significant other owns a property out there, Airbnbs it, had no issues with any kind of licenses. I have a sister who started Airbnb in 2015 or 2016 in East Nashville. She had no issues with licenses. So when we bought this property, we had no no knowledge of any kind of prop, like licenses. Furthermore, the property we bought was a duplex. We specifically wanted a duplex so that way we could have some kind of supplemental income on top of everything to offset the cost of the house. Um, being it already being a, a, a um, being already a duplex, I had assumed that it was there was no necessary additional coding or zoning that I would need because it was already a duplex and it was already being rented out to someone else by the or, um, previous owner. Okay, questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Um, taking it down, I've talked to all of my neighbors. Yeah, let's um, talk about taking it down. Did you, when did you take it, when you got a letter from Mr. Osborne? Yep, I, took, I got the letter and I immediately took it down. I had no idea that there were, like I said, I was unaware that there was any laws. I, I know ignorance is not a good defense and it's not a defense, but as I said, I, I've had experience with other family members having dealt with Airbnb and it's just, it's not been an issue. So I had no idea that there were new laws being passed. I'm, okay. uh, I have my head in the sand on purpose with the news on, uh, we, generally these days with uh, a lot of the stuff going around. So you got it. Okay. Close pub carrying discussion. Well, 
Well, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err in this case, and that this applicant will be eligible to apply three months from April 7th. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes. So you'll be eligible Thank you three very months much, from folks. April 7th. Thank you very much, folks. John Michael. Case number 2018-263 involves the property at 8497 Lewis Road in Council District number 35, shown here, shown here on the aerial, and shown here at the face of the property from the assessor's website. Larissa Lentil is the appellant and owner of that property. This is an item A appeal involving short-term rentals operation prior to obtaining the legally required permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 263? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after the staff hears from Mr. Osborne with regard to case number 263. So this one had a permit in February uh, 28, 20, 2017. However, that permit expired a year later when it wasn't renewed. Uh, <coughs> looks like a letter was sent out. I received an email from Ms. Lentil asking why the she got a letter about it April 10th, told her the permit was expired, explained her she'll have to come in and appeal. She wants to try and obtain another permit. Um, as, as far as I know, it's down. It looks like she filed her appeal on April 20th. There are three reviews after it was expired and 20 while it was permitted. Okay, get us started. You figured out how to get a permit and you didn't figure out how to keep it. So what happened? Um, Larissa Lintal, 8528 Lewis Road. I accidentally let my permit expire and it was a huge oversight and I'm trying to get it back. Um, and in my mind, it was good to 2019 and it was, I just messed up. So you thought it was two years instead of one? Yes. Okay. I sent a packet, uh, I emailed a packet of information, but I Yes, we have it in the petitions and all that, so thank you. And I got another letter from somebody who dropped it off. Okay, that's good. Uh, questions of the applicant? So you have nine acres worth of Airbnb? It's, yeah, it's pretty protected. Wow, yeah. okay. Um, very good. So we will close. You didn't rent your home after you were told. On the after April, I did honor guests that were already booked. How many? Um, I sent in taxes for April. No, how many guests did you have after you got the letter from Mr. Osborne? I don't know. There were several, and I... So you didn't cancel everyone? You just... I felt like I was between a rock and a hard place because I told these people they could stay. And... So I honored them. I didn't. I didn't choose to. I felt like it was my fault, and they. I didn't gotcha. want to punish them. Okay. So. We're going to close public hearing discussion. You know. Um, to what day was the letter? The application was February. Was it April? April 11th, April. So this is nine acres out kind of on the border outreaches of the county, $86 a night. Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, I, I may understand, I, I know there's, we've had these before, folks not renewing their permit, that means they did everything right on the front end, I appreciate that. Um, they, um, and I 100% I understand why people would honor uh, a commitment, and yet that is a little bit of a no-no to us because you, it's like, well, you know, you you were told not to, and yet you're you wanting to be hospitable and you're wanting to honor something that you've done with them. So we've tended to to, to not view that as favorably. Uh, that said, I think had, had that not happened, I would say, you know, eligible almost immediately. And so to me, I, I'm willing to make a motion that um, that we find that the zoning administrator did not err and that the applicant eligible to be to reapply three months after the date of application. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? 
Awesome, okay, motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? You're eligible to reapply three months after April 15th, so the middle of July you can reapply okay. for your permit. Okay. okay, good luck. John Thank Michael. You. Good luck. The next case is 2018-266, a zoning case from Council District Number 21. Robert Hernandez is the appellant and over the property at 1512 Dr. D.B. Todd Jr. Boulevard. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in the RS5 zoning district for construction of a single family residence. Um, the photographs of the property taken by staff submitted here show the sidewalk that exists at the location in its current condition. The request, of course, is from a variance from the updated requirements, and you have planning's recommendation in your packet with regard to um, their take, which is, of course, our staff recommendation for disapproval. This is uh, not presently eligible for the in lieu fund, uh, at least from the, permitting, from the staff perspective. However, of course, board, as always, has the ability to grant that. Um, is there any opposition for case number 266? Seeing none, the appellant will have uh, five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Just introduce yourself by name and address. Robert Hernandez, 427 Wandering Trail. Uh, I would like to mention that I am not the property owner. Russ Fitch uh, is the property owner. Uh, I, along with Ben Kelly, K1 Contractors, are developing and building the property. Uh, I'm not sure why it appears that, well, it reads that way, so. Um, yeah, well, I did want, uh, so is that okay then? Yes, that's yeah. okay, so I apologize. No. I fall on our part. Not no. his problem at all. No worries. Uh, requesting a variance on the sidewalk ordinance due to the unique characteristics of the parcel, in particular along with the two neighboring parcels. Um, some of the information that we brought were the consistency of the sidewalks up and down D.B. Todd Boulevard. You have a one mile stretch of uninterrupted sidewalk that runs along the street. Um, additionally, if you look at the setbacks on a lot of the parcels. Okay. So let's get cut to the chase. So you don't want to pay into the fund? Uh, we would, well, first off, we don't want to build the sidewalk as the sidewalk per the ordinance would run into the parking pad that we have approved on our site plan. Okay, we understand that part. And we would prefer not to pay into the fund. What we had proposed doing to keep the street looking consistent was to fill in the curb. There is a ramp that is on DB Todd Boulevard. You can see it on one of the photos that we submitted. Fill in, what do you mean fill in the curb? Just make it. Um, can I bring this up? Sure. Yeah, there's a ramp that okay. is set into But as the we can see by this pictures and planning's recommendation, that sidewalk, and this is what planning says, that basically the sidewalk is in poor condition. And I think that's pretty accurate. Correct. What we're proposing to do, if you look at the upper photo up there, mm -hmm. that's the curb that I'm proposing that we build, and then along with updating the sidewalk in front of the Does home. Does that mean rebuilding the entire sidewalk? Uh, yes. Essentially, but what we're no, trying no, to avoid doing is going four feet into... We don't operate in the essentially here. I understand either that. yes or no. I'd be looking for direction from you all. What we're trying to avoid doing is building into the front of the lot because of the dimensions. We understand. We don't. All right. So, 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 well, I mean, it, rather, than, rather than build what the Metro standard is, you would be willing to pay into the fund, is that right or no? We would prefer not to pay into the fund. But you, um, if you didn't pay into the fund, um, and you were given the choice between building to the metro standard and completely rebuilding the existing sidewalk, which would you prefer? Can you define building, rebuilding the are taking you out, Taking out the existing sidewalk, uh, not necessarily the curb, but replacing uh, the existing sidewalk and the curb cut that you're calling a ramp, I mean the, the ramp, I mean what, what you're calling the ramp, basically completely uh, Building Build a new curb. sidewalk in the same footprint. That's what we would prefer to do, yes. We, you know, there's a potential problem there in that if Metro comes back and builds a sidewalk on that street, mm -hmm. they're going to be into your parking pad. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a problem with the easement that Metro will want at the end of the day. The property owners have already signed the... Uh, dedication for the five foot right away. Um, it would be unlikely, I would think, that Metro will come through and build a sidewalk there. If you look at the two neighboring parcels, 
Uh, you have 14 and 15, 15 foot setbacks on the two buildings, 15 to the one on the north, 14 to the one on the south. Uh, the building on the south is currently on a renovation, so I would imagine that nobody's. Is that, is that telephone pole that we keep seeing, is that on, on your, is that pole right there on your property? It is in front of the property, yes, in the sidewalk, but the five foot strip has already been dedicated to Metro. But I mean, but that, that tell I mean that telephone pole is I mean I'm, that doesn't seem passable so that that's why planning is asking for the, the minimum two foot grass strip and well minimum two foot grass strip so that the pole isn't in the sidewalk and this is an area that is right down the street from Robert Churchwell Magnet School and Fisk University so it's a potentially heavy pedestrian area. Do you have any more comments about the hardship? If I may interrupt, just in fairness to Mr. Hernandez, do you have a copy of the Planning Department's written recommendation? Typically people don't know to ask those. If you don't have one, I've got a copy I can give you. Not okay. on, no. So, so as I understand it, the, the planning department is, is not proposing that they pay, but they're saying they should work with Public Works to have a alternative plan with a two-foot grass strip and six-foot sidewalk, but, and no pay. Yeah, I mean, if he builds that, then he's sort of making everybody happy. I guess you want to a really poorly, I mean, it's, it's a sidewalk in just rough condition. Yeah. Either way, I think he's going to have to put in a whole new sidewalk, and he might, and yeah. with that pole there, I think this is a pretty good, I mean. So, any last questions for the applicant? So, do you, do you understand what planning is recommending? Um, reading it right now. Okay. I guess it's tough for me without having the ability to measure where that pole is. It well, looks like it's well, what? two feet off of the... Yep. I mean, planning is saying that, that uh, don't pay into the fund and build a two-foot grass strip with a six-foot sidewalk. Which is fine if I'm not moving. I mean, it's difficult to determine what the cost like, is that two-foot green space going to be enough to leave that pole there. Well, I, mean, I think it's safe to presume that that's exactly the point of the recommendation, having come from both planning and public works in that instance, they wouldn't have intentionally recommended something that kind of gums up the works in that case, regard. Then well, I and think frankly, that that's, if that's what, that's what they recommended, and so if the pole comes a little bit in the sidewalk, then you still have enough for wheelchair or right. access to that kind of thing. So that, that is their recommendation. So. If that's, yeah, it, I just want to make sure I'm not putting myself in a position where I'm accepting something that I'm moving a pole too because... No, you're not going to have to move the pole. That, that's, I think that's the whole purpose of this. And that's why they say work with public works. So yeah, if you get out there and measure and the, the back of the telephone pole is 26 inches, you know, public works will go, you know, just move, you know, make, make the sidewalk 5 foot 10 at that location. It, it sounds like they've included the idea that if we're off a few inches, it still works for ADA and everybody's happy. And Mr. Chairman, a suggestion from staff that may be helpful in this instance, uh, the appellant seems to at least be potentially interested in that outcome in terms of the recommendation from planning. It might be appropriate to defer to the next meeting and then allow this to be placed on the consent agenda if in fact it is a term based on the recommendation from planning that the appellant wishes to go with. That way they can just not have to sit through a 17 hour board meeting, but instead be approved in the first 15 minutes of our meeting. How if that's that? appealing we'll to the appellant. On the 21st. How, how, how does that sound? Uh, Sounds good to me. Okay, yeah. so we're going to defer it to the next meeting, and hopefully, it'll all get worked out on consent. Get out there and measure okay. it. Okay, John Michael, sure that good. Thank you. Yep. Next case. Yep. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, the next one that is set to be heard by the board is 2018-273, involving the property at 2639 Nolensville Pike. Joshua Cotton is the appellant on behalf of the corporate entity that owns the property. The aerial here shows you this is a property uh, that's Mike, been used. Oh, is, it, is that you? Oh. Joshua Cotton, oh, coming on in, great. Um, this is a property, of course, that's been a church for decades on Nolensville Pike. The site plan submitted shows a proposed operation of the property, but the request before the board today is for a request, request for a variance from sidewalk requirements. From my recent site visit, you see the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, then the view up and down Nolensville Pike at the existing location with what appears to be a two to three foot planter strip and maybe, what, about a five or six foot sidewalk, give or take, not positive. Then of note, this is a corner property. This is called Central Avenue that cuts down on the underside of the church uh, running, I guess that's generally westbound coming off of um, Nolensville Pike. Um, the planning department has made their recommendation with regard to this project specifically, uh, approval with conditions, the condition being a contribution for the in lieu construction on the Nolensville Pike frontage. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 273? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Uh, I'm actually Chris Jackson. Uh, Josh Cotton is on vacation this week. Um, and uh, I'm here on behalf of the owner of uh, 2639 Nolensville Pike. Um, we are, uh, the applicant, you know, is just wanting to, uh, to not complete the required sidewalk improvements uh, per code, uh, given the current configuration of the streetscape uh, and the existing sidewalk. Okay, questions of the applicant? Are you that you are willing to contribute to the end of the, of the Nolensville Pike frontage? Uh, my understanding was that uh, that if this was approved, uh, we would not uh, have to. Um, we would be able but, to make but, the interior. But that would I'm be sorry. one of the conditions of our approval that you have to pay into the fund. You're asking to not do that. Correct. But we're just talking on the Nolensville Road. We're, what, what planning is proposing and what we think will we'll get approved <laughs> is that you leave the sidewalk as it is on Nolensville Road, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, and you pay an in lieu fee for that, that frontage. And then, uh, what's the other street? Uh, Central. 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 Mm -hmm that you, you build the sidewalk on Central. Yes, we're already improving Central. So, they're already what? They're improving Central. You are improving? Yes, correct. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty hard for us not to, well, it's pretty hard for us to let you get by without paying the in lieu fee on the, on the Nolans of Road frontage. I mean, it's, it's really no hardship. I th yeah, I, I didn't realize they were completely redoing the sidewalk on Central, though. The, I mean, that's a major, imp I mean, I get the recommendation, but also think that they do have at least an argument for thinking about. Well, I'll, I'll go along with what you guys decide. I just didn't know that there were two Central Avenues in Nashville. That's got to count for something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a motion, Mr. Taylor? Oh, no, we haven't closed yet. Okay. Um, any questions for the applicant yet? Any questions? Anything else to add? I would like to add. Uh, okay. As I said, we are updating uh, Central Avenue. We're bringing the building up to ADA compliance. Um, you know, I, with with the current condition of the sidewalk, the current uh, we have a grass strip. Um, there is uh, landscaping there. You know, we just uh, we're hoping that it was uh, still in uh, good enough condition to to leave. It's not the best sidewalk that we've seen in the old neighborhood of Flat Rock, as they used to call it. But it board might, members. It might actually be cheaper to build the new sidewalk on Nolensville than to pay the in lieu fee. 
I mean, if you look next to the water meter, it looks like, I'm not sure if that's gravel or dirt or just deterioration of the sidewalk. No, but y'all, I mean, you got manholes and other public works things in that sidewalk too that may make it hard to add two feet to the grass strip. So are we closing the public hearing? Anything else to add? Um, if there is anything, uh, I guess, closer to the, the road that needs to be um, updated, renovated, there, there are also um, three uh, inlets uh, on the on Nolensville Road, which would probably, you know, definitely add to the cost and the, um, you know, just ups the scope. And I have I have pictures of that as well. If you'd like to see that. Do you want me to bring it up? Okay, so anything else? Any other questions of the applicant? What's the business gonna be? Uh, the only thing that we know, it's gonna be a mixed use venue. It was formerly a church? Yes. Okay. okay. So we will um, close the public hearing discussion. I think given all the, uh, to me it seems reasonable, but I'm, I may be the odd one out on that one. Yeah. With the, with the catch basin, it, I don't know, it might, it might be a better deal to pay the in fee. I don't know. I mean, it's. It's a strange case because the, there's really not a site, there's no really restriction. I mean, there's a lot of sidewalk there. And so really what we'd be doing, I guess, is, I know it's not the simple, we're adding grass, but. Yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of where, I mean, I mean, if you look at the aerial view, yeah, it'd be nice, but you know, a good half of that Nolensville Road frontage is already paved because it was entrance to the church, you know, which means you'd be cutting part of that out and increasing the grass strip, which would be nice, but you're also disrupting the rhythm. You're adding, you know, significantly improving the sidewalk situation on Central, which is, I think, really great for the neighborhood. And so, it, it, to me, I think it, the Knowlesville Pike piece might be eligible for a variance, and it's whether or not you want the in loop fee, and, you know, I don't know. I, well, I was just going to say that, like, I, I would say, let's make the motion. If someone made the motion to, you know, uh, grant the variance on the side, uh, since, well, they're going to improve it, but allow them to pay the in lieu fee on Nolta Road, and they can assess it, and if it makes more sense to build okay. to the new stuff, they do make, that. Make that variant. Make I, that. I so move okay. that. That what? Say it again. Ah, oh, David. I use so much energy. But I understand the motion to be a motion that we approve payment into the fund on Nolansville and approve a variance on Central. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. wait. There's how is there a variance on Central if he's going to build it? <coughs> no variance necessary. He'll be building that one. I misunderstood the motion. I now understand the motion yeah. to be money paid in on Nolansville and he's going to build it on Central. Is that correct, Mr. Harper? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's your motion. Did you second it? Okay. Just any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Good luck. Thank you. The next case is 2018-276, Wahidi Constructions, the appellant, Ahmad Wahidi, is the owner of the property at 712A Woodmere Drive in Council District Number 17, not too far from uh, the Murfreesboro Pike, or the Murfreesboro Pike section that cuts in with um, Bradley Parkway. The aerial here shows you the neighborhood. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout. The variance request here is for a sidewalk variance in the RS-15 zoning district. Face the property shown here, up the street, down the street. By way of recap, face of the property, up the sidewalk less street, down the sidewalk less street. Uh, the parties are present, represented by Dale and Associates in this instance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 276? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourself by name and address. 
Thank you, John Michael. My name is Michael Garrigan, Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, we're asking for a variance on this corner lot for, for both streets on the sidewalks. It's hard to tell from the limits of the pictures, but along Bullwood, there's a heavy tree line and heavy underbrush, and then along Woodmere, there's uh, also a mature tree line that's just off the pictures. The trees themselves wouldn't be, wouldn't be damaged physically in two dimensions by the sidewalk, but the trees are uh, at an age that we would be concerned their roots would. Uh, there's also a slight slope coming up off of Woodmere in the front. I'm rushing through this as quick as I can because I'm hungry too. Um, but I just passed around a petition of the neighborhood. There's 31 signatures. The neighbors do not want the sidewalk. Uh, they think it's going to interrupt the rhythm of the neighborhood and the streets. It'd be the only sidewalk. So when they say, they say against, they're against the sidewalk. Against the, against the construction against the of the sidewalk. All right. Yes, sir. I was wondering why you passed around 30 right. people saying yeah. they were against the variance. I thought, well, it's, it, it's against the opposition the left that you were making their case. No, okay. um, so I think there's a, a, a pretty solid uh, hardship case for that. And then as far as the in lieu fees pay, because it is a corner lot um, and it is a deep lot, that that number came out to $76,000, which is just astronomical for the construction of these two small homes. He'd be forced to build the sidewalk if in lieu of paying that just simply out of just financial economics. So that's all I've got. Thank you all. Questions of the applicant? Okay. Anything else to add? Let's close the public hearing discussion. Well, in the past when things have been astronomical, we've um, allowed just payment on one side of the property. So I would propose that. Okay. I well, don't know what side. Well, but Mr. Taylor. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was looking to see what we did with uh, Council Lady Boardman's case because this is Council Lady Mina, I Mina Johnson. Oh, is that one not come up yet? Not yet. Oh, good grief! That was the precedent on this one. Um, yeah, I just remember on other occasions. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I, 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 I agree with you, but it also is a, it's also almost, a, it, it's almost a, a element of scale too, because you know, on, you know, on the urban neighborhoods that do have sidewalks that we've given variances to, like in uh, East Nashville, where it is a corner lot, and we've given the variance on one side just to make it like their neighbors. I think that was, to me, that was where my logic was on that to say, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but. You know, you cut, you know, seventy thousand into thirty-five, and it's still wow. This just seems like it's against the spirit. Of but you know what? We're not the, the legislative rule. body. The no. Metro Council, as I always pointed out, passed the sidewalk bill unanimously. If there's a fix, dear Metro Council, corner lots. If that's what you deem as not the spirit of the original bill, they can vote and amend their bill. But if not. Does anyone know if Councilmember Freeman has weighed in on this? John Michael. We don't have any letters, so the assumption no, is no. He was here today. Yes. So uh, seems like a week ago, but he was here. We're getting corner lots every meeting. Bless you. Um, I, I would add that my client has spoken to Mr. Freeman on the phone, correct? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, my name is Ahmad Wahidi. I live on 712, uh, actually 713 uh, with me to drive. I did uh, spoke to um, Mr. Freeman, uh, but uh, you know, I, told, uh, I, mean, I told him about not doing the sidewalk at all, um, but he, he was okay with it. So. so he was in support of you not yes. doing? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I just got that text just a second ago. Oh, so the text says, I am a hard no. So that was not the, this was from Councilman Freeman. So he, so he's watching. Hello, Councilperson. Thank you for watching. <laughs> and thank you for also letting us know what you feel on this case when it's uh, relative. Ah, but then he agrees with this side of the room. Half into is fine. Okay, so that's that's helpful. So Councilman Freeman, if 
as a legislature, if, you know, if you want to fix the bill for these corner lots, that's up to you all. So okay. uh, we're going to close the public hearing. I thought it was closed, actually. Okay. Well, I'll move that we, um, gosh, that we allow the applicant to pay in the in lieu fund for one side. But I don't know what side. We'll let them do We'll let them pick the the, the shortest, <laughs> shortest side. Well, I would be I would feel com comfortable if we okay. actually stated the size. They look side, about the so same. Do you know which so side I'm going to say shortest. Woodmere. They both say 60 foot right. Yeah, I'm going to say Woodmere. Okay. Metro that's the address. Metro GIS shows 180 and 179.4. Okay. How about Woodmere? <laughs> We're going to go with okay. Wood, Woodmere. Sounds okay. good. Okay. So m motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Thank you, Councilman Freeman. Okay. John Michael. Case number 2018-277, the case for Randolph Wright II, the appellant and owner of the property at 3428 Old Anderson Road, an item A case involving a short-term rental property, denial of a permit based upon prior operation. Property here shown in the aerial map and here from the face of the property. After we hear from Mr. Osmond, the appellant will have an opportunity to make his case. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 277? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes after Mr. Osmond speaks. We sent a notice through host compliance on April 3rd. The advertisement was removed around April 12th. The appeal was filed April 24th. There are about 94 reviews from December of 2016 to April of 2018. No other complaints. And that, no, 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 not that I'm aware of. Okay. Please start your name, address, while you're here. Uh, my name is Randolph Wright. Press the button. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, no, okay. <laughs> my name is Randolph Wright II. My address is 3428 Old Anderson Road, and I am here because of my owner-occupied short-term rental property. Um, I had a good friend of mine who recommended that I do Airbnb. Um, he does it. Um, so, so let me guess. This good friend of yours did not know the laws of the city of Nashville related to short. He rental. he did not tell me about the permit, and I tell I told him that I'm going through this process. And you know, when I told him about it, he was just like, "Well, I thought you knew." I'm just like, "Well, no, you didn't tell me anything about a permit." But anyways, um, <clears throat> uh, as far as me signing up for Airbnb, I just signed up. I mean, I've been operating for the past 17 months. Um, and I got that notification um, early April. And, you know, when I got that notification, you know, I just followed everything that I was uh, told to do as far as just shutting everything down. I canceled all my reservations, which I was booked for the entire summer. Canceled all of those. Um, I paid all of my back taxes. I've been paying my federal taxes on it. I brought those papers, you know, just to show that, you know, I've just been wanting to do everything correct, and that's what I want to do. That's why I'm here now, just to fix everything and to do everything the right way. Um, just so I can just continue to uh, supplement my income to continue to pay my liabilities and debts. So you first found out about our laws when you got a letter from Mr. Osborne? Yes, sir. Okay. And so then you just shut everything down? Mm-hmm. I mean, based off of what uh, the letters told me as far okay. as canceling all my reservations and... Yep. Um, okay. Yep. Very good. Any questions for the applicant? Mr. Wright, I want to ask you a question that has nothing to do with this. Is this new construction on Old Anderson? It looks like new construction, is it? Um, well, they are doing, uh, they're doing some new construction over there. Um, as far as my property, it's been there since 2001. Because um, when I put up my red sign for the whole zoning, zoning thing or whatever, um, there were some other red signs over there because I believe they're about to do some new construction over there. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Nope. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? Press your button and make a motion. Good. Press my... <laughs> I've lost my mind. Um, you know, I, uh, I'll say the zoning administrator did not err, and the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit two months after the... Uh, last with the edge came down on 412. Okay, motion's been made and is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, 
passes eligible two months from 412. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, John Michael. The next case, 2018-280, involves a property at 6227 Robin Hill Road in Council District Number 23. You've already heard from Council Member Mina Johnson on this subject. Brian Sipples, the appellant on behalf of the Kyries, the owners of the property at that location. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements at this a corner lot in the RS40 Zoning District for construction of a new single-family residence. From our recent site plan on a beautiful Nashville day, a Chamber of Commerce kind of day, Mr. Chairman, you see the view across the street on the upper left-hand corner, interior of the lot in the lower, the view up the two streets, the very sidewalk-less streets. Uh, you already have planning's recommendation in your case file. You've already heard from the council member. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 280? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourselves by name and address. I'm Brian Sipple, 1087 Blue Heron Road, Nashville, Tennessee. I am the uh, builder of the proposed property. Hi, April Corey, uh, 1127 Stonebridge Park Drive. We live in Franklin currently. Um, and thank you very much for staying and having this time with us for us to get here. Thank you. George, George Corey, 6227 Robin Hill, future resident. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, get us started. Why are we here? Yeah, again, thank you for being here again. It's, uh, this is your every two weeks, I, uh, I feel, for you all. But uh, anyways, um, the, uh, as Ms. Johnson was here earlier and spoke on our behalf of this property, uh, there are some couple you know, in the adjacent area, both uh, Brook Hollow and Robin Hill, each uh, roads run approximately two miles in either direction, and there are no sidewalks on any of those streets. And, and certainly while the council has passed the sidewalk ordinance, uh, as Ms. Johnson stated, in her statement earlier, I think it was her understanding, at least in going through the ordinance, uh, and she initially told us we would not need sidewalks on the property, is that it wasn't for properties that weren't connector streets and more urban areas, and that it weren't to be uh, necessarily subject to uh, more residential, you know, larger lots that are in it. Um, we have a large corner lot. We have over 510 feet of road frontage. Additionally, the photographs, I'm going to hand some up to you in a few seconds, if you wouldn't mind. The photographs that you can see from the street view show the ditch and the drainage situation we have out there, but not quite as well as a couple that I have in here that when you can really see the depth um, of the ditch, and we also have grading plans that we submitted with our application, which I'm sure that you all have. Uh, the, the ditch in several areas is um, four to five feet in depth uh, and six foot in width. And it is a collector for both Robin Hill uh, and Brook Hollow. So we take on a lot of storm drainage on that corner that you can see right there where we see that head wall. So we're bringing drainage in from all directions. So ultimately our concern is with hard piping, curb and gutter uh, and sidewalk that even you know properly engineered, we have concerns that we would negatively impact uh, drainage from adjacent properties and that the sidewalks would really be a negative to an area that doesn't have any connector sidewalks and we would definitely uh, create some drainage concerns. We've uh, submitted, uh, you all have a copy of a letter from CESO Engineering. We had a civil engineer come out and visit the site, look at it. They agreed with us on our termination that there are some challenges with potential grading and draining issues for the area based upon sidewalk installation. Um, and again, topography of, of the lot. So we are requesting a variance from both the sidewalk curb and gutter and fee in lieu of. Okay, um, any questions for the applicant? So let's, let's talk about, we just obviously had a corner lot case. Mm -hmm. Council person came here and spoke. She voted for it as well as every other council person did. As I said to Councilman Freeman, they're the legislative body, we're not. Mm -hmm. They passed this law, you're asking us to kind of give you relief from it, but um, when you acquired this lot or wanted to build on this lot, didn't you know that this was part of the deal? At the time, no, we did not. This particular property was on the market for an extended amount of time, and the home that was um, on the property was actually um, in very, very bad shape. Uh, it was actually uh, caving in, black mold on the inside, and had been unoccupied for multiple years. And when we um, when did, did you buy it? 
When do we, we, um, we closed in February of this year. So after we, the side and work ordinance Yes, but passed. we were not aware of that and we, we did not know about it at all because we do currently live in Franklin. Um, we did not know about it and nor were we, in, nor did our realtor mention it to us either. Okay, questions of the applicant? Anything else? Okay. Would you like to see any of the photos of the drainage ditch at yeah, all? Yeah, I didn't want to show that. Okay. We'll show you. Again, I think there, it, there's, you know, there is the fee in lieu of, which is obviously something yes. we're application, but um, there are definitely physical characteristics of this property. Um, that, you know, and, and again, there's a balancing act for us. The in lieu of fee for us is about $90,000. And so there's a real difficulty for us at that term to determine, you know, without the engineering done, which one would actually financially make the most sense. Um, but I think the sidewalk is. So this, with the drainage, which street is this? So that is if you are on, that is, that is. Uh, I can present a few that's other Bro pictures. That's Brook Hollow uh, right there. But the ditch is the same on both sides. Oh, the ditch goes both sides. Yeah, the ditch runs the entire property. Again, we're collecting, we're actually collecting property. We are, we're at a lower elevation on, uh, from both Robin Hill to our wet, to our west, and we are at a lower elevation from Brook Holler to our north. And so in both cases, the water collects so through head walls on these our property. right here, it looks like Robin Hill is less a big ditch than Brook Holler. Brook Holler looks like it's a really... Traditional yeah, it's pretty ditch. fairly substantial, and we did have multiple neighbors here in support. Yeah. John Michael, can you show us the overhead again? Yeah. So, Robin Hill is the uh, horizontal street. Correct. correct. That, is that house demolished? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. That house is demolished. So. So it was demolished before you brought the property? No. We, we, uh, it was not demolished. Uh, the owners received a letter from Metro um, about zoning ordinances because of the dilapidation of the building. So they had just closed on the property, received that they were in violation of uh, zoning ordinances based on the condition of the property. And so in order to be compliant with that, the property was removed. But you weren't going to remodel this property? Anyway. No, we were not. It's, it's inhabitable. bought this as a tear down. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Did I hear you say that there were others here today, but they left because of the late hour? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Thank you. They didn't want to stay with us till 7 p.m. <laughs> kind of friends and neighbors. No, is the property um, actually directly um, beside, behind us uh, were the neighbors that were here. Um, actually, barely, it's uh, closer to Jocelyn Hollow, corner of Jocelyn Hollow and Brook Hollow. Um, it's currently an empty lot, and they were here in support. Okay. Well, and, Any other questions for the applicant? Yes. Okay, anything else to add? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion and board members, you've seen the pictures which show the... So I, I don't have a problem with the hardship, but uh, we're back down to discussing the in lieu fee. Well, the, the, and I think Robin Hill may be the short side of that, but I will say that, you know, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree and I know that I'm not in the majority that with the council lady, but I do think that if there is a difference between this one and the last one, it's that the last one, uh, was buildable, and I think this one is not. Um, but then that's what the fund is for. The Metro Council passed that ordinance, giving you options if it wasn't buildable or you did not want to build, right? Well, I, I, I think that one's based on uh, choice, and this is I don't I, I don't think you could engineer this. To do that, so um, yeah, I mean, and, it, it causes more problems. We, th th this is one of those with the ditch where it causes your neighboring properties much greater damage to actually construct something on this type of site. So that that that's just again, it, I, I I don't it, we've had this conversation before. I don't expect. Um, agreement on it, but that, that is the, the comment I have on it. Well, how does this variance, I mean, I don't see that this giving a var variance here would differ that greatly from many variances we've given for various reasons. And certainly the non-buildable is a reason. That's a obvious reason. But there's a variance and then there's the in lieu. So I think no one uh, disagrees with the variance part given the ditch, but then what do you do about in lieu? And of course we have in our packet a recommendation from planning. Mm -hmm. 
Do we? I read it. Now. Or do we not? Well, I, I read it online, and it. Oh, you read it. But I don't have it in front of me, but it says stormwater has reviewed and says there's not a hardship and pay the in lieu or construct. But Here yeah, we go. Mm -hmm. We did not receive a copy of that. You don't automatically get a copy. You have to ask. I didn't get one either. Well, yeah, we so, got it online so planning in the email. In the email. Said right? Yeah, planning. So here's planning's recommendation. Yeah, well, I don't have a problem. Again, I mean, my vote's going to be with uh, them paying the in lieu fee on the short street mm -hmm. and variance on. Make a, motion. Yeah. Make a motion. I move that we grant the variance uh, uh, given the hardship of the uh, drainage ditch and that the uh, applicant uh, is ordered to pay the in lieu fee on the shorter street, which is Robin, Robin, Robin Hill. Hill. Yeah. Robin Hill, okay. Robin Motion's Hill. been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-281. Bradley Johnson, the appellant and owner of the property at 1101 38th Avenue North. It's requesting an item A appeal with regard to a short-term rental permit at this location operated before obtaining the required permit. Property shown there. Property from the face shown there. Seeing no one left in the audience to oppose Mr. Johnson's case, he'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation after Mr. Osborne addresses the board. Mr. So we sent a notice to host compliance on April 2nd, 2018. Uh, there were 16 reviews from August of 2014 to May of 2018. He filed his appeal on uh, April 24th and the listing was removed June 1st. June 1st? The listing was removed? Yes, sir. And any other non-codes violations? No, sir. When did you send out your letter? Uh, April 2nd. April 2nd. And you said June 1st the listing was removed? Roughly, yes, ma'am. Okay, let's get started. Name, address, and why did it take so long the listing come down? My name is Bradley Johnson. My address is 1101 38th Avenue, North Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, so why you got a letter from Mr. Osborne in April. I did. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm a professional dancer, entertainer. I travel the world. I work overseas a lot more than I work in the United States. And so <clears throat> with that said, um, while I was away during that time, January through April, I had a permanent renter in my house. My house sits literally directly across the street from Tennessee State University. So he was there and his, and his um, lease ended in May. So I had a whole month of the time where I stayed actually at my parents' house. And so um, I didn't check the mail and I didn't get that mail, that letter he's talking about until I would say mid-April. And so when I got that and I saw what it said, I immediately went down, which was on April 24th, to get the short-term rental permit. When I went down there to get that and he told me that, I, that there was a flag and et cetera, um, that day I changed my listing from short-term to long-term. And he said, oh, as long as it's 30 or more days, that's fine, you can keep the listing because it's no longer short term. So I think that's why the date has changed to, um, and I have a statement from Airbnb, a letter that shows that I did have it changed on April 24th to long term, not short term. Have, have you had any short term renters? Absolutely not. Okay. Oh, and, and I have something to say that too. And so why didn't you know about the short-term law? I, and, and I also have another, and it's on my phone, it's an email from my agent. Um, I'm hardly in the country. I don't have ac I don't watch television, and I heard you said this earlier about newspaper. I don't, I don't see these notifications. I even asked the Airbnb about that as well, too. And um, they're just like, yeah, you know, laws are changing in every state, every city, all the time. So, you know, it's just one of those things that you hear about. And we're sorry, because I was really upset that I had to, you know, miss out on opportunities this summer that really do help me in between my jobs for work. Mm -hmm. And so Airbnb definitely does that. And um, as you can see on my resume right here, I have to have it, actually have it. 
this is a lot of work that I do overseas, <laughs> overseas. Um, and my parents are here kind of just as like a witness to know that um, I Hello, do. Hello, Mom and Dad. Mom Thanks and Dad. for being here. <laughs> and um, so it's just um, I didn't hear about it. And as soon as I did hear about it, I marched right down and got denied. And I said, oh, my God, I hope I can get a chance to get it because it really is that when and when I'm doing my work, it's, you know, I'm gone from January to April. Then I'll do another tour again, August to November. Well, in between that, it's has really helped me. So it would be very great if I could be forgiven for not having that. Cause I would okay. Have that. Questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll move that we find the zoning administrator did not err in denying the short-term rental permit uh, based on the circumstances of the case. We will. Uh, let the applicant be eligible to apply for a permit two months after the date that he documented not renting it short term, which was 424. Okay. Two months after April 20th. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. You're eligible two months from April 24th to reapply. I'm eligible to apply for a permit on June 24th. And with that, Make sure you get the permit before you rent. John Michael, <laughs> is there anything else? Is there any other issues in front of the Board of Zoning Appeals? No further issues. Congratulations to our codes director who can't probably get out of here quick enough. Bye, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Look at this on the screen. Is this on channel? I hope this is on the Metro National. This is chicken. All right? Chicken showing how. Oh. Oh. Bye. <laughs>